Angel's Flight by Michael Connolly This is for McCaleb Jane Connolly. 1. The word sounded alien in his mouth, as if spoken by someone else. There was an urgency in his own voice that Bosch didn't recognize. The simple hello he had whispered into the telephone was full of hope, almost desperation. But the voice that came back to him was not the one he needed to hear. Detective Bosch? For a moment, Bosch felt foolish. He wondered if the caller had recognized the faltering of his voice. This is Lieutenant Michael Tulin. Is this Bosch? The name meant nothing to Bosch, and his momentary concern about how he sounded was ripped away as an awful dread entered his mind. This is Bosch. What is it? What's wrong? Hold, please, for Deputy Chief Irving. What is... The caller clicked off, and there was only silence. Bosch now remembered who Tulin was, Irving's adjutant. Bosch stood still and waited. He looked around the kitchen. Only the dim oven light was on. With one hand he held the phone hard against his ear, the other he instinctively brought up to his stomach, where fear and dread were twisting together. He looked at the glowing numbers on the stove clock. It was almost two, five minutes past the last time he had looked at it. This isn't right, he thought as he waited. They don't do this by phone. They come to your door. They tell you this face to face. Finally Irving picked up on the other end of the line. Detective Bosch. Where is she? What happened? Another moment of excruciating silence went by as Bosch waited. His eyes were closed now. Excuse me. Just tell me what happened to her. I mean, is she alive? Detective, I'm not sure what it is you are talking about. I'm calling because I need to muster your team as soon as possible. I need you for a special assignment. Bosch opened his eyes. He looked through the kitchen window into the dark canyon below his house. His eyes followed the slope of the hill down toward the freeway and then up again to the slash of Hollywood lights he could see through the cut of the Coahuenga Pass. He wondered if each light meant someone awake and waiting for someone who wasn't going to come. Bar saw his own reflection in the window. He looked weary. He could make out the deep circles etched beneath his eyes, even in the dark glass. I have an assignment, Detective, Irving repeated impatiently. Are you able to work, or are you... I can work. I just was mixed up there for a moment. Well, I'm sorry if I woke you, but you should be used to it. Yes, it's no problem. Bosch didn't tell him that he hadn't been awakened by the call, that he had been roaming around in his dark house, waiting. Then get it going, detective. We'll have coffee down here at the scene. What scene? We'll talk about it when you get here. I don't want to delay this any further. Call your team. Have them come to Grand Street between 3rd and 4th, the top of Angel's Flight. Do you know where I'm talking about? Bunker Hill? I don't... It will be explained when you get here. Seek me out when you are here. If I am at the bottom, come down to me before you speak with anyone. Well, what about Lieutenant Billet? She should... She will be informed about what is happening. We're wasting time. This is not a request. It is a command. Get your people together and get down here. Am I making myself clear to you? You're clear. Then I will be expecting you. Irving hung up without waiting for a reply. Bosch stood with the phone still at his ear for a few moments, wondering what was going on. Angel's Flight was the short, inclined railroad that carried people up Bunker Hill in downtown, far outside the boundaries of the Hollywood Division homicide table. If Irving had a body down there at Angel's Flight, the investigation would fall under the jurisdiction of Central Division. If Central detectives couldn't handle it because of caseload or personnel problems, or if the case was deemed too important or media-sensitive for them, then it would be bumped to the Bulls, the Robbery Homicide Division. The fact that a deputy chief of police was involved in the case before dawn on a Saturday suggested the latter possibility. The fact that he was calling Bosch and his team in instead of the RHD Bulls was the puzzle. Whatever it was that Irving had working at Angel's Flight didn't make sense. Bosch glanced once more down into the dark canyon, pulled the phone away from his ear and clicked it off. He wished he had a cigarette, but he had made it this far through the night without one. He wouldn't break now. He turned his back and leaned on the counter. He looked down at the phone in his hand, turned it back on, and hit the speed dial button that would connect him with Kismine Ryder's apartment. He would call Jerry Edgar after he talked to her. Bosch felt a sense of relief come over him that he was reluctant to acknowledge. He might not yet know what awaited him at Angel's flight, but it would certainly take his thoughts away from Eleanor Wish. Ryder's alert voice answered after two rings. "'Kiz, it's Harry,' he said. "'We've got work.' 2. 
Bosch agreed to meet his two partners at the Hollywood Division station to pick up cars before they headed downtown to Angel's Flight. On the way down the hill to the station, he had punched in KFWB on his Jeep's radio and picked up a breaking news report on a homicide investigation underway at the site of the historical inclined railroad. The newsman on the scene reported that two bodies had been found inside one of the train cars and that several members of the robbery homicide squad were on the scene. But that was the extent of the reporter's information, as he also noted that the police had placed an unusually wide cordon of yellow tape around the crime scene, prohibiting him from getting a closer look. At the station, Bosch communicated this thin bit of information to Edgar and Ryder while they signed three slickbacks out of the motor pool. So it looks like we're going to be playing sloppy seconds to RHD, Edgar concluded, showing his annoyance at being rousted from sleep to spend probably the whole weekend doing gopher work for the RHD bulls. Yeah, our guts, their glory, and we aren't even on coal this weekend. Why didn't Irving call out Rice's goddamn team if he needed a Hollywood team? Edgar had a point. Team one, Bosch, Edgar, and Ryder, wasn't even up on call rotation this weekend. If Irving had followed proper call-out procedure, he would have called Terry Rice, who headed up Team 3, which was currently on top of the rotation. But Bosch had already figured that Irving wasn't following any procedures. Not if the deputy chief had called him directly before checking with his supervisor, Lieutenant Grace Billets. Well, Jerry, Bosch said, more than used to his partner's whining. You'll get the chance to ask the deputy chief personally in a little while. Yeah, right, I'd do that and I'll find my ass down in Harbor the next ten years. Fuck that. Hey, Harbor Division's an easy gig, Ryder said, just to rag Edgar a bit. She knew Edgar lived in the valley, and that a transfer to Harbor Division would mean a miserable ninety-minute commute each way, the pure definition of freeway therapy, the brass's method of unofficially punishing malcontents and problem cops. They only pull six, seven homicides a year down there. That's nice, but count me the fuck out. Okay, okay, Bosch said. Let's just get going and we'll worry about all of that stuff later. Don't get lost. Bosch took Hollywood Boulevard to the 101 and coasted down the freeway in minimal traffic to downtown. Halfway there, he checked the mirror and saw his partners cruising in the lanes behind him. Even in the dark and with other traffic, he could pick them out. He hated the new detective cars. They were painted black and white and looked exactly like patrol cruisers, with the exception that they did not carry emergency lights across the roof. It had been the former chief's idea to replace unmarked detective cars with the so-called slickbacks. The whole thing had been a scam perpetrated to fulfill his promises to put more cops on the street. By changing unmarked cars into clearly marked cars, he was giving the public the erroneous impression that there were more cops patrolling the streets. He also counted the detectives using slickbacks when he addressed community groups and proudly reported that he had increased the number of cops on the street by hundreds. Meantime, detectives trying to do their jobs drove around like targets. More than once, Bosch and his team had sought to serve an arrest warrant or had attempted to come into a neighborhood quietly in the course of an investigation only to have their presence signaled by their own cars. It was stupid and dangerous but it was the chief's edict, and it was carried out throughout the department's divisional detective bureaus, even after the chief was not asked back for a second five-year term. Bosch, like many of the department's detectives, hoped the new chief would soon order the detective cars back to normal. Meanwhile, he no longer drove the car assigned to him home from work. It had been a nice detective supervisor's perk having a take-home car, but he didn't want the marked car sitting in front of his house. Not in L.A., you never knew what menace that could bring to your door. They got to Grand Street by 2.45. As Bosch pulled to a stop, he saw an unusually large number of police-related vehicles parked along the curb at California Plaza. He noted the crime scene and coroner's vans, several patrol cars, and several more detective sedans. Not the slickbacks, but the unmarked cars still used by the RHD bulls. While he waited for Ryder and Edgar to pull up, he opened his briefcase, took out the cellular phone, and called his home. After five rings, the machine picked up the call, and he heard his own voice telling him to leave a message. He was about to click off, but decided to leave a message. Eleanor, it's me. I've got a call out, but page me or call me on the cell phone when you get in so I know you're okay. Um, okay, that's it. Bye. All right, it's about 2.45 right now, Saturday morning. Bye. Edgar and Ryder had walked up to his door. 
He put the phone away and got out with his briefcase. Edgar, the tallest, held up the yellow crime scene tape, and they crossed under, gave their names and badge numbers to a uniform officer with the crime scene attendance list, and then walked across California Plaza. The plaza was the centerpiece of Bunker Hill, a stone courtyard formed by the conjoining of two marble office towers, a high-rise apartment building, and the Museum of Modern Art. There was a huge fountain and reflecting pool at its center, though the pumps and lights were off at this hour, leaving the water still and black. Past the fountain was the Beaux-Arts revival-styled station and wheelhouse at the top of Angel's Flight. It was next to this small structure that most of the investigators and patrol officers milled about, as if waiting for something. Bosch looked for the gleaming, shaven skull that belonged to Deputy Chief Irvin Irving, but didn't see it. He and his partners stepped into the crowd and moved toward the lone rail car sitting at the top of the tracks. Along the way, he recognized many faces of robbery homicide detectives. There were many he had worked with years earlier when he had been part of the elite squad. A few of them nodded to him or called him by name. Bosch saw Francis Sheehan, his former partner, standing off by himself smoking a cigarette. Bosch broke from his partners and stepped over. Frankie, he said, what's going on? Harry, what are you doing here? Got called out. Irving called us out. Shit. Sorry, partner. I wouldn't wish this one on my enemy. Why, what's going? You better talk to the man first. He's putting the big blanket on this one. Bosch hesitated. Sheehan looked worn down, but Bosch hadn't seen him in months. He had no idea what had put the dark circles under his hound dog eyes, or when they had been cut into his face. For a moment, Bosch remembered the reflection of his own face that he had seen earlier. You okay, Francis? <laughs> Never better. Okay, I'll talk to you. Bosch rejoined Edgar and Ryder, who were standing near the rail car. Edgar nodded slightly to Bosch's left. Hey, Harry, you see that? He said in a low voice. That's Sustain, Jastain, and that bunch over there. What are those pricks doing here? Bosch turned and saw the grouping of men from Internal Affairs. Got no idea, he said. Chastain and Bosch locked eyes for a moment, but Bosch didn't hold it. It wasn't worth the waste of energy to get worked up over just seeing the IAD man. Instead, he focused on trying to put the whole scene together. His curiosity level was at maximum. The number of RHD bulls hanging around, the IAD shines, a deputy chief on the scene. He had to find out what was going on. With Edgar and Ryder behind him, in single file, Bosch worked his way to the rail car. Portable lights had been set up inside, and the car was lit up like somebody's living room. Inside, two crime scene techs were at work. This told Bosch that he was quite late arriving at the scene. The crime scene techs didn't move in until after the coroner's techs had completed their initial procedures, declaring victims dead, photographing the bodies in situ, searching them for wounds, weapons, and identification. Bosch stepped to the rear of the car and looked through the open door. The technicians were at work around two bodies. A woman was sprawled on one of the stepped seats about midway through the car. She was wearing gray leggings and a white thigh-length T-shirt. A large flower of blood had blossomed on her chest where she had been hit dead center with a single bullet. Her head was snapped back against the sill of the window behind her seat. She had dark hair and features, her lineage obviously stretching somewhere south of the border. On the seat next to her body was a plastic bag filled with many items Bosch couldn't see. A folded newspaper protruded from the top of it. On the steps near the rear door to the car was the face-down body of a black man wearing a dark gray suit. From his viewpoint, Bosch could not see the man's face, and only one wound was visible, a through-and-through -through gunshot wound at the center of the victim's right hand. Bosch knew it was what would later be called a defensive wound in the autopsy report. The man had held his hand up in a futile attempt to ward off gunfire. Bosch had seen it often enough over the years, and it always made him think about the desperate actions people take at the end. Putting a hand up to stop a bullet was one of the most desperate. Though the techs were stepping in and out of his line of sight, Bosch could look straight down through the inclined train car and down the track to Hill Street, about 300 feet below. A duplicate train car was down there at the bottom of the hill, and Bosch could see more detectives milling about by the turnstiles and the closed doors of the Grand Central Market across the street. Bosch had ridden the inclined railroad as a kid and had studied how it worked. He still remembered. The two matching cars were counterbalanced. When one went up the side-by-side -side tracks, the other went down. 
and vice versa. They passed each other at the midpoint. He remembered riding on Angel's flight long before Bunker Hill had been reborn as a slick business center of glass and marble towers, classy condominiums and apartments, museums and fountains referred to as water gardens. Back then the hill had been a place of once grand Victorian homes turned into tired-looking rooming houses. Harry and his mother had taken Angel's flight up the hill to look for a place to live. Finally, Detective Bosch. Bosch turned around. Deputy Chief Irving stood in the open door of the little station house. All of you, he said, signaling Bosch and his team inside. They entered a cramped room dominated by the large old cable wheels that once moved the train cars up and down the incline. Bosch remembered reading that when Angel's flight was rehabilitated a few years earlier, after a quarter century of disuse, the cables and wheels had been replaced with an electric system monitored by computer. On one side of the wheel display was just enough room for a small lunch table with two folding chairs. On the other side was the computer for operating the trains, a stool for the operator, and a stack of cardboard boxes, the top one open and showing stacks of pamphlets on the history of Angel's Flight. Standing against the far wall, in the shadow behind the old iron wheels, his arms folded and his craggy, sun-reddened face looking down at the floor, was a man Bosch recognized. Bosch had once worked for Captain John Garwood, commander of the Robbery Homicide Division. He knew by the look on his face that he was very put out about something. Garwood didn't look up at them, and the three detectives said nothing. Irving went to a telephone on the lunch table and picked up the loose handset. As he began talking, he motioned to Bosch to close the door. "'Excuse me, sir,' Irving said. "'It was the team from Hollywood. They are all here, and we are ready to proceed.' He listened for a few moments and said goodbye and hung up the phone. The reverence in his voice and his use of the word, Sir, told Bosch that Irving had been talking to the chief of police. There was one more curiosity about the case. All right, then, Irving said, turning around and facing the three detectives. I'm sorry to roust you people, especially out of rotation. However, I have spoken with Lieutenant Billets, and as of now you have been cut free of the Hollywood rotation until we get this handled. What exactly is this that we are handling? Bosch asked. A delicate situation. The homicides of two citizens. Bosch wished he would get to the point. Chief, I see enough RHD people around here to investigate the Bobby Kennedy case all over again, he said, glancing at Garwood. And that's not to mention the IAD shines hovering around the edges. What exactly are we doing here? What do you want? Simple, Irving said. I am turning the investigation over to you. It is your case now, Detective Bosch. The robbery homicide detectives will be withdrawing as soon as you people are brought up to speed. As you can see, you are coming in late. That's unfortunate, but I think you will be able to overcome it. I know what you can do. Bosch stared at him blankly for a long moment, then glanced at Garwood again. The captain had not moved and continued to stare at the floor. Bosch asked the only question that could bring understanding to this strange situation. That man and woman on the train car. Who are they? Irving nodded. Were is probably the more correct word, were. The woman's name was Catalina Perez. Who exactly she was and what she was doing on Angel's flight we do not know yet. It probably does not matter. It appears that she was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But that will be for you to officially determine. Anyway, the man in there, he is different. That was Howard Elias. The lawyer? Irving nodded. Bosch heard Edgar draw in a breath and hold it. This is for real. Unfortunately. Bosch looked past Irving and through the ticket window. He could see into the train car. The techs were still at work, getting ready to shut off the lights so they could laser the inside of the car to look for fingerprints. His eyes fell to the hand with the bullet wound through it. Howard Elias. Bosch thought about all the suspects there would be many of them standing around outside at that very moment, watching. Shit, Edgar said. Don't suppose we could take a pass on this one, could we, Chief? Watch your language, Detective, Irving snapped, the muscles of his jaw bulging as he grew angry. That is not acceptable here. Look, Chief, all I'm saying is if you're looking for somebody to play department Uncle Tom, it ain't going to be... That has nothing to do with this, Irving said, cutting him off. Whether you like it or not, you have been assigned to this case. I expect each of you to do it professionally and thoroughly. Most of all, I expect results, as does the chief of police. 
Other matters mean nothing, absolutely nothing. After a brief silence, during which Irving's eyes went from Edgar to Ryder and then to Bosch, the deputy chief continued. In this department there is only one race, he said. Not black or white, just the blue race. 3. Howard Elias's notoriety as a civil rights attorney did not come to him because of the clients he served. They could best be described as ne'er-do-wells, if not outright criminals. What had made Elias's face and name so well known to the masses of Los Angeles was his use of the media, his skill at probing the inflamed nerve of racism in the city, and the fact that his law practice was built entirely around one particular expertise, suing the Los Angeles Police Department. For nearly two decades he had made a more than comfortable living filing lawsuit after lawsuit in federal court on behalf of citizens who had collided in some way with the police department. Elias sued patrol officers, detectives, the chief of police, the institution itself. When he filed he used the shotgun approach, naming as defendants anyone remotely connected with the incident at the heart of the matter. After a fleeing burglary suspect was chewed up by a police dog, Elias had sued on the injured man's behalf, naming the dog, its handler, and the line of supervision from the handler up to the chief of police. For good measure, he had sued the handler's academy instructors and the dog's breeder as well. In his late-night television infomercials and frequent impromptu but cleverly orchestrated press conferences on the steps of the U.S. District Courthouse, Elias always cast himself as a watchdog, a lone voice crying out against the abuses of a fascist and racist paramilitary organization known as the LAPD. To his critics, and they ran from the rank and file of the LAPD to the offices of the city and district attorneys, Elias was a racist himself, a loose cannon who helped widen the fractures in an already divided city. To these detractors, he was the scum of the legal system, a courtroom magician who could reach into the deck at any place and still pull out the race card. Most often, Elias's clients were black or brown. His skills as a public speaker and his selective use of facts while employing those skills often turned his clients into community heroes, emblematic victims of a police department out of control. Many in the city's south neighborhoods credited Elias with single-handedly keeping the LAPD from behaving as an occupying army. Howard Elias was one of the few people in the city who could be absolutely hated and fervently celebrated in different quarters at the same time. Few who revered Elias understood that his entire practice was built around one simple piece of the law. He filed lawsuits only in federal court and under provisions of the U.S. Civil Rights Codes that allowed him to bill the city of Los Angeles for his fees in any case in which he was victorious in court. The Rodney King beating, the Christopher Commission report excoriating the department in the wake of the King trial and subsequent civil unrest, and the racially divisive O.J. Simpson case created a shadow that stretched over every case Elias filed and so it was not particularly difficult for the lawyer to win cases against the department, convincing juries to award at least token damages to plaintiffs. Those juries never realized that such verdicts opened the door for Elias to build the city and its taxpayers, themselves included, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees. In the dog bite lawsuit, which became Elias's signature case, the jury found that the rights of the plaintiff had been violated, but since that plaintiff was a burglar with a long track record of prior arrests and convictions, the jury awarded him only one dollar in damages. Their intent was clear, to send a message to the police department rather than to make a criminal wealthy. But that didn't matter to Elias. A win was a win. Under the federal guidelines, he then submitted a bill to the city for $340,000 in legal fees. The city screamed and audited it, but still ended up paying more than half. In effect, the jury, and the many before and since, believed they were delivering a rebuke to the LAPD, but they were also paying for Elias's half-hour late-night infomercials on Channel 9, his Porsche and his Italian courtroom suits, his opulent home up in Baldwin Hills. Elias, of course, was not alone. There were dozens of attorneys in the city who specialized in police and civil rights cases, 
and mined the same federal provision allowing them to extract fees far in excess of the damages awarded their clients. Not all were cynical and motivated by money. Lawsuits by Elias and others had brought about positive change in the department. Even their enemies, the cops, could not begrudge them that. Civil rights cases brought about the end of the department-approved use of the chokehold while subduing suspects, after an inordinately high number of minority deaths. Lawsuits had also improved conditions and protections in local jails. Other cases opened and streamlined means for citizens to file complaints against abusive police officers. But Elias stood head and shoulders above them all. He had media charm and the speaking skills of an actor. He also seemed to lack any criteria when it came to choosing his clients. He represented drug dealers who claimed to have been abused by their interrogators, burglars who stole from the poor but objected to being beaten by the police who chased them down, robbers who shot their victims but then cried foul when they in turn were shot by police. Elias's favorite line, used as a tagline on his commercials and whenever cameras were pointed at his face, was to say that abuse of power was abuse of power, regardless of whether the victim was a criminal. He was always quick to look into the camera and declare that if such abuse were tolerated when it was aimed at the guilty, it wouldn't be long before the innocent were targeted. Elias was a sole practitioner. In the last decade, he had sued the department more than a hundred times and won jury verdicts in more than half of the cases. His was a name that could freeze a cop's brain when he heard it. In the department, you knew that if Elias sued you, it would not be a small case that would be cleaned up and swept away. Elias didn't settle cases out of court. Nothing in the civil rights codes gave an incentive to settle cases. No, you would be dragged through a public spectacle if Elias aimed a lawsuit at you. There would be press releases, press conferences, newspaper headlines, television stories. You'd be lucky to come out of it in one piece, let alone with your badge. Angel to some, devil to others, Howard Elias was now dead, shot to death on the Angel's Flight Railroad. Bosch knew as he looked through the small room's window and watched the orange glow of the laser beam move about the darkened train car that he was in the calm before the storm. In just two days, what might have been Elias's biggest case was due to begin. The lawsuit against the LAPD that had become known in the media as the Black Warrior case was set for jury selection in U.S. District Court on Monday morning. A coincidence, or as a wide swath of the public would undoubtedly believe the lack of coincidence, between Elias's murder and the start of the trial would make the investigation of the attorney's death an easy seven on the media's Richter scale. Minority groups would howl with rage and rightful suspicion. The whites in the West Side would whisper about their fears of another riot, and the eyes of the nation would be on Los Angeles and its police department once more. Bosch at that moment agreed with Edgar, though for different reasons than his black partners. He wished they could take a pass on this one. Chief, he said, turning his focus back to Irving, when it gets out, who? I mean, when the media finds out it was Elias, we're going to... That is not your concern, Irving said. Your concern is the investigation. The chief and I will deal with the media. Not a word comes from anyone on the investigation, not a word. Forget the media, Ryder said. What about South Central? People are going to... That will be handled, Irving said, interrupting. The department will institute the public disorder readiness plan beginning with the next watch. All personnel shift to 12 and 12s until we see how the city reacts. Nobody who saw 1992 wants to see that again. But again, that is not your concern. You have one concern here. You didn't let me finish. Ryder said. I wasn't going to say they would riot. I actually have faith in the people there. I don't think there will be trouble. What I was going to say was that they will be angry about this and suspicious. If you think you can ignore that or contain it by putting more cops on the... Detective Ryder, Irving said, interrupting again, that is not your concern. The investigation is your concern. Barsh saw that Irving's interruptions and words telling a black woman not to be concerned about her own community, had incensed Ryder. It was on her face, and Bosch had seen the look before. He decided to speak before she said something out of line. We're going to need more people. With just the three of us, we'll be running down alibis full-time for weeks, maybe a month. A case like this, we need to move fast, not only because of the case, but because of the people. We're going to need more than just three of us. That, too, has been taken care of, 
Irving said. You will have all the help you need, but it won't come from robbery homicide. It's a conflict of interest because of the Michael Harris matter. Before speaking, Bosch noted how Irving refused to call it the Black Warrior case, instead using the plaintiff's name. Why us? What? I understand why RHD is out, but where are the Central Division teams? We're off our beat and out of rotation here. Why us? Irving exhaled audibly. The entire Central Division Homicide Squad is in Academy training this week and next. Sensitivity training and then the FBI workshop on new crime scene techniques. Robbery Homicide was covering their calls. They took this one. Once it was determined who that was with the bullets in his head, I was contacted, and in subsequent discussions with the Chief of Police, it was determined that we would reach out to you. You are a good team, one of our best. You have cleared your last four, including that hard-boiled eggs job. Yes, I was briefed on it. Plus, the main thing is, none of you were ever sued by Elias. He pointed with his thumb over his shoulder in the direction of the crime scene in the train car. As he did this, he glanced at Garwood, but the captain was still looking down at the floor. No conflict of interest, Irving said. Correct? The three detectives nodded. Bosch had been sued often enough in his twenty-five years with the department, but somehow he had always avoided tangling with Elias. Still, he didn't believe Irving's explanation was complete. He knew that Edgar had already alluded to a reason for their choice, probably a reason more important than the fact that none of them had been sued by Elias. Bosch's two partners were black. That might come in handy for Irving at some point. Bosch knew Irving's desire that the department have only one face and one race, blue, would go out the window when he needed a black face for the cameras. I don't want my people paraded in front of the media, Chief, Bosch said. If we're on the case, we're on the case to work it, not for a show. Irving stared at him with angry eyes. What did you call me? Bosch was momentarily taken aback. I called you Chief. Oh, good, because I was wondering if there was some confusion here over the line of command in this room. Is there, Detective? Bosch looked away and out the window again. He could feel his face turning red, and it upset him to give himself away. No, he said. Good, Irving said, without a trace of tension. Then I'm going to leave you with Captain Garwood. He will bring you up to speed on what has been accomplished so far. When he is done, we will talk about how we are going to set this case up. He turned to the door, but Bosch stopped him. Uh, one more thing, Chief. Irving turned back to him. Bosch had recovered his composure now. He looked calmly at the Deputy Chief. You know we're going to be looking hard at cops on this. Lots of them. We'll have to go through all of the lawyers' cases, not just the Black Warrior thing. So I just need to know up front. We all need to. Do you and the police chief want the chips to fall where they fall, or... He didn't finish, and Irving said nothing. I want to protect my people, Bosch said. This kind of case, we just need to be clear about everything, up front. Bosch was taking a gamble saying it in front of Garwood and the others. It would likely anger Irving again. But Bosch took the shot because he wanted Irving to answer him in front of Garwood. The captain was a powerful man in the department. Bosch wanted him to know that his team would be following the directives of the highest command, just in case the chips fell close to some of Garwood's people. Irving looked at him for a long moment before finally speaking. Your insolence is noted, Detective Bosch. Yes, sir. But what's the answer? Let them fall, Detective. Two people are dead that should not be dead. It does not matter who they were. They should not be dead. Do your best work, use all your skills, and let the chips fall. Bosch nodded once. Irving turned and glanced quickly at Garwood before leaving the room. 4. Harry, you have a smoke? Sorry, Cap, I'm trying to quit. Me too. I guess all that really means is that you borrow them rather than buy them. Garwood stepped away from the corner and blew out his breath. With his foot, he moved a stack of boxes away from the wall and sat down on them. He looked old and tired to Bosch, but then he had looked that way twelve years before when Bosch had gone to work for him. Garwood didn't raise any particular feelings in Bosch. He had been the aloof sort of supervisor, didn't socialize with the squad after hours, didn't spend much time out of his office and in the bullpen. At the time, Bosch thought maybe that was good. It didn't engender a lot of loyalty from Garwood's people, but it didn't create any enmity either. 
Maybe that was how Garwood had lasted in the spot for so long. Well, it looks like we really got our tit in the ringer this time, Garwood said. He then looked at Ryder and added, Excuse the saying, Detective. Bosch's pager sounded, and he quickly pulled it off his belt, disengaged the beep, and looked at the number. It was not his own number, as he had hoped it would be. He recognized it as the home number of Lieutenant Grace Billets. She probably wanted to know what was going on. If Irving had been as circumspect with her as he had been with Bosch on the phone, then she knew next to nothing. Important? Garwood asked. I'll take care of it later. You want to talk in here, or should we go out to the train? Let me tell you what we have first. Then it's your scene to do with what you want. Garwood reached into the pocket of his coat, took out a soft pack of Marlboros, and began opening it. I thought you asked me for a smoke, Bosch said. I did. This is my emergency pack. I'm not supposed to open it. It made little sense to Bosch. He watched as Garwood lit a cigarette and then offered the pack to Bosch. Harry shook his head. He put his hands in his pockets to make sure he wouldn't take one. Ah, this going to bother you? Garwood asked, holding up the cigarette, a taunting smile on his face. Let me, Cap. <clears throat> My lungs are probably already shot, but these guys... Ryder and Edgar waved it off. They appeared as impatient as Bosch did in getting to the story. Okay, then, Garwood finally said. This is what we know. Last run of the night. A man named Elwood... Elwood... Uh, hold on a sec. He pulled a small pad from the same pocket he had replaced the cigarette package in and looked at some writing on the top page. Eldridge, yeah, Eldridge. Eldridge Pete. He was running the thing by himself. It only takes one person to run the whole operation. It's all computer... He was about to close her down for the night. On Friday nights, the last ride is at eleven. It was eleven. Before sending the top car down for the last ride, he goes out, gets on it, closes and locks the door. Then he comes back in here, puts the command on the computer, and sends it down. He referred to the pad again. These things have names. The one he sent down is called Sinai, and the one he brought up was Olivet. He says they're named after mountains in the Bible. It looked to him when Olivet got up here that the car was empty, so he goes out to lock it up, because then he has to send them one more time, and the computer stops them side by side in the middle of the track for overnight. Then he's done and out of here. Bosch looked at Ryder and made a signal as if writing on his palm. She nodded and took her own pad and a pen out of the bulky purse she carried. She started taking notes. Only Elwood, I mean Eldridge... He comes out to lock up the car, and he finds the two bodies on board. He backs away, comes in here, and calls the police. With me? So far, what next? Bosch was already thinking of the questions he would have to ask Garwood, and then probably Pete. So we're covering for Central Dix, and the call eventually comes to me. I send out four guys, and they set up the scene. They didn't check the bodies for ID? Not right away, but there was no ID anyway. They were going by the book. They talked to this Eldridge Pete, and they went down the steps and did a search for casings, and other than that held tight until the coroner's people arrived and did their thing. Guy's wallet and watch are missing, his briefcase, too, if he was carrying one. But they got an ID off a letter the stiff had in his pocket, addressed to Howard Elias. Once they found that, my guys took a real good look at the stiff and could tell it was Elias. They then, of course, called me, and I called Irving, and he called the chief, and then it was decided to call you. He had said the last part as if he had been part of the decision process. Bosch glanced out the window. There was still a large number of detectives milling about. I'd say those first guys made more than just a call to you, Captain, Bosch said. Garwood turned to look out the window as if it had never occurred to him that it was unusual to see as many as fifteen detectives at a murder scene. I suppose, he said. Okay, what else, Bosch said. What else did they do before they figured out who it was and that they weren't long for the case? Well, like I said, they talked to this fellow, Eldridge Pete, and they searched the areas outside the cars, top and bottom. They, did they find any of the brass? No, our shooter was careful. He picked up all the casings. We do know that he was using a nine, though. How? The second victim, the woman, 
The shot was through and through. The slug hit a steel window bracket behind her, flattened, and fell on the floor. It's too mashed for comparison, but you can still tell it was a nine. Hoffman said if he was guessing, he'd say it was a federal. You'll have to hope for a better lead from the autopsies as far as ballistics go, if you ever get that far. Perfect, Bosch thought. Nine was a cop's caliber. And stopping to pick up the shells, that was a smooth move. You didn't usually see that. The way they see it, Garwood continued, Elias got it just after he stepped onto the train down there. The guy comes up and shoots him in the ass first. The ass, Edgar said. That's right, the first shot is in the ass. See, Elias is just stepping on, so he's a couple steps up from the sidewalk level. The shooter comes up from behind and holds the gun out. It's at ass level. He sticks the muzzle in there and fires off the first cap. Then what? Bosch asked. Well, we think Elias goes down and sort of turns to see who it is. He raises his hands, but the shooter fires again. The slug goes through one of his hands and hits him in the face right between the eyes. That's probably your cause of death shot right there. Elias drops back down. He's face down now. The shooter steps into the car and puts one more in the back of his head, point blank. He then looks up and sees the woman, maybe for the first time. He hits her from about five feet, one in the chest, through and through, and she's gone. No witness. The shooter gets the wallet and watch off Elias, picks up his shells, and is gone. A few minutes later, Pete brings the car up and finds the bodies. You now know what I know. Bosch and his partners were quiet a long moment. The scenario Garwood had woven didn't sit right with Bosch, but he didn't know enough about the crime scene yet to challenge him on it. The robbery looked legit? Bosch finally asked. It did to me. I know the people down south aren't going to want to hear that, but there it is. Ryder and Edgar were silent stones. What about the woman? Bosch asked. Was she robbed? Doesn't look like it. I kind of think the shooter didn't want to come on to the train. Anyway, the lawyer was the one in the thousand-dollar suit. He'd be the target. What about Pete? Did he hear the shots, a scream, anything? He says no. He says the generator for the electric is right below the floor here. Sounds like an elevator running all day long, so he wears earplugs. He never heard anything. Bosch stepped around the cable wheels and looked at the train operator's station. For the first time, he saw that mounted above the cash register was a small video display box with a split screen showing four camera views of Angel's flight, from a camera in each of the train cars and from above each terminus. On one corner of the screen, he could see a long shot of the inside of Olivet. The crime scene techs were still working with the bodies. Garwood came around the other side of the cable wheels. No luck there, he said. The cameras are live only, no tape. There so the operator can check to make sure everyone is aboard and seated before starting the train. Did he? He didn't. Look, Garwood said, knowing Bosch's questions. He just checked through the window, thought the car was empty, and brought it up so he could lock it up. Where is he? At Parker, our offices. I guess you'll have to come over and talk to him for yourself. I'll keep somebody with him until you make it by. Any other witnesses? Not a one. Eleven o'clock at night down here, the place is pretty dead. The Grand Central Market closes up at seven. There's nothing else down there except some office buildings. A couple of my guys were getting ready to go into those apartments next door here to knock on doors, but then they got the ID and sort of backed away. Bosch paced around in a small area of the room and thought. Very little had been done so far, and the discovery of the murders was already four hours old. This bothered him, even though he understood the reason behind the delay. Why was Elias on Angel's flight? he asked Garwood. They figure that out before backing away? Well, he must have wanted to go up the hill, don't you think? Come on, Captain, if you know, why not save us the time? We don't know, Harry. We ran a DMV check. He lives out in Baldwin Hills. That's a long way from Bunker Hill. I don't know why he was coming up here. What about where he was coming from? That's a little easier. Elias's office is just over on 3rd in the Bradbury building. He was probably coming from there, but where he was going... Okay, then what about the woman? She's a blank. My guys hadn't even started with her when we were told to pull back. 
Garwood dropped his cigarette to the floor and crushed it with his heel. Vosh took it as a signal that the briefing was about over. He decided to see if he could get a rise out of him. You pissed off, Captain? About what? About being pulled off? About your people being on the suspect list? A small smile played on Garwood's thin lips. No, I'm not angry. I see the Chief's point. Are your people going to cooperate with us on this? After some hesitation, Garwood nodded. Of course. The quicker they cooperate, the quicker you will clear them. And you'll tell them that? That's exactly what I'll tell them. We appreciate that, Captain. Tell me, which one of your people do you think could have done this? The lips curled into a full smile now. Bosch studied Garwood's cigarette-yellowed teeth, and for a moment was glad he was trying to quit. You're a clever guy, Harry. I remember that. He said nothing else. Thanks, Captain. But do you have an answer to the question? Garwood moved to the door and opened it. Before leaving, he turned and looked back at them, his eyes traveling from Edgar to Ryder to Bosch. It wasn't one of mine, detectives. I guarantee it. You'll be wasting your time if you look there too long. Thanks for the advice, Bosch said. Garwood stepped out, closing the door behind him. Jeez, Ryder said. It's like Captain Boris Kyloff or something. Does that guy only come out at night? Bosch smiled and nodded. Mr. Personality, he said. So, what do you think so far? I think we're at ground zero, Ryder said. Those guys didn't do jack before getting the hook. Yeah, well, robbery homicide, what do you want? Edgar said. They aren't known for tap dancing. They back the tortoise over the hair any day of the week. But if you ask me, we're fucked. You and me, kids, we can't win on this one. <laughs> Blue race my ass. Bosch stepped toward the door. Let's go out and take a look, he said, cutting off discussion of Edgar's concerns. He knew they were valid, but for the moment they only served to clutter their mission. Maybe we'll get a few ideas before Irving wants to talk again. 5. The number of detectives outside the station had finally begun to decrease. Bosch watched as Garwood and a group of his men crossed the plaza toward their cars. He then saw Irving standing to the side of the train car talking to Chastain and three detectives. Bosch didn't know them, but assumed they were IAD. The deputy chief was animated in his discussion, but kept his voice so low that Bosch couldn't hear what he was saying. Bosch wasn't sure exactly what the IAD presence was all about, but he was getting an increasingly bad feeling about it. He saw Frankie Sheehan hanging back behind Garwood and his group. He was about to leave, but was hesitating. Bosch nodded at him. I see what you mean now, Frankie, he said. Yeah, Harry, some days you eat the bear. Right. You taking off? Yeah, the cap told us all to get out of here. Bosch stepped over and kept his voice low. Any ideas I could borrow? Sheehan looked at the train car as if considering for the first time who might have killed the two people inside it. None other than the obvious, and I think that will be a waste of time. But then again, you have to waste it, right? Cover all the bases. Yeah. Anybody you think I should start with? Yeah, me. He smiled broadly. I hated the douchebag. Know what I'm going to do? I'm going to now try and find an all-night liquor store and buy the best Irish whiskey they got. I'm going to have a little celebration, Hieronymus, because Howard Elias was a motherfucker. Bosch nodded. With cops, the word motherfucker was rarely used. It was heard a lot by them, but not used. With most cops, it was reserved as being the worst thing you could say about someone. When it was said, it meant one thing, that the person had crossed the righteous, that the person had no respect for the keepers of the law, and therefore the rules and bounds of society. Cop killers were always motherfuckers, no questions asked. Defense lawyers got the call most of the time, and Howard Elias was on the motherfucker list too, right at the top. Sheehan gave a little salute and headed off across the plaza. Bosch turned his attention toward the interior of the train while he put on rubber gloves. The lights were back on and the techs were finished with the laser. Bosch knew one of them, Hoffman. He was working with a trainee Bosch had heard about but not met. She was an attractive Asian woman with a large bust. He had overheard other detectives in the squad room discussing her attributes and questioning their authenticity. Gary, is it cool to come in? 
Bosch asked, leaning in through the door. Hoffman looked up from the tackle box in which he kept his tools. He was organizing things and was about to close it. It's cool, we're wrapping up. This one yours, Harry? It is now. Got anything good for me? Gonna make my day? Bosch stepped into the car, followed by Edgar and Ryder. Since the car was on an incline, the floor was actually a series of steps down to the other door. The seats also were on graduated levels on either side of the center aisle. Bosch looked at the slatted bench seats and suddenly remembered how hard they had been on his skinny behind as a boy. Afraid not, Hoffman said. It's pretty clean. Bosch nodded and moved down a few more steps to the first body. He studied Catalina Perez the way someone might study a sculpture in a museum. There was no feeling for the object in front of him as human. He was studying details, gaining impressions. His eyes fell to the blood stain and the small tear the bullet had made in the T-shirt. The bullet had hit the woman dead center. Bosch thought about this and envisioned the gunman in the doorway of the train twelve feet away. Hell of a shot, huh? It was the tech Bosch didn't know. He looked at her and nodded. He had been thinking the same thing, that the shooter was someone with some expertise in firearms. Hi, I don't think we've met. I'm Sally Tam. She put out her hand and Bosch shook it. It felt weird. They were both wearing rubber gloves. He told her his name. Oh, she said. Somebody was just talking about you, about the hard-boiled eggs case. It was just luck. Bosch knew he was getting a longer ride out of that case than he deserved. It was all because a Times reporter had heard about it and written a story that exaggerated Bosch's skills to the point where he seemed like a distant relative of Sherlock Holmes. Bosch pointed past Tam and said he needed to get by to take a look at the other body. She stepped to the side and leaned back, and he slid by, careful not to allow himself to rub against her. He heard her introducing herself to Ryder and Edgar. He dropped into a crouch so he could study the body of Howard Elias. Is this still as is? he asked Hoffman, who was squatting next to his tackle box near the feet of the dead man. Pretty much. We turned him to get into his pockets, but then put him back. There's some Polaroids over in that seat behind you if you want to double check. Coroner's people took those before anybody touched him. Bosch turned and saw the photos. Hoffman had been right. The body was in the same position in which it had been found. He turned back to the body and used both hands to turn the head so that he could study the wounds. Garwood's interpretation had been correct, Bosch decided. The entry wound at the back of the head was a contact wound. Though partially obscured by blood that had matted the hair, there were still powder burns and stippling visible in a circular pattern around the wound. The face shot, however, was clean. This did not refer to the blood. There was a good amount of that. But there were no powder burns on the skin. The bullet to the face had come from a distance. Bosch picked up the arm and turned the hand so he could study the entry wound in the palm. The arm moved easily. Rigor mortis had not yet begun. The cool evening air was delaying this process. There was no discharge burn on the palm. Bosch did some computing. No powder burns on the palm meant the firearm was at least three to four feet away from the hand when the bullet was discharged. If Elias had his arm extended with his palm out, then that added another three feet. Edgar and Ryder had made their way to the second body. Bosch could feel their presence behind him. Six to seven feet away, through the hand and still right between the eyes, he said. This guy can shoot. Better remember that when we take him down. Neither of them answered. Bosch hoped they picked up on the confidence in his last line as well as the warning. He was about to place the dead man's hand down on the floor when he noticed the long scratch mark on the wrist and running along the side of the palm. He guessed the wound had occurred when Elias's watch had been pulled off. He studied the wound closely. There was no blood in the track. It was a clean, white laceration along the surface of the dark skin, yet it seemed deep enough to have drawn blood. He thought about this for a moment. There were no shots to the heart, only to the head. The blood displacement from the wounds indicated the heart had continued to pump for at least several seconds after Elias had gone down. It would seem that the shooter would have yanked the watch off of Elias's wrist very quickly after the shooting. There was obviously no reason to hang around, yet the scratch on the hand had not bled. It was as if it had occurred well after the heart had stopped pumping. What do you think about the lead anima? Hoffman asked, interrupting Bosch's thoughts. As Hoffman got out of the way, Bosch stood and gingerly stepped around the body until he was down by the feet. He crouched again and looked at the third bullet wound. Blood had soaked the seat of the pants. 
Still, he could see the tear and tight burn pattern where the bullet went through the cloth and into Howard Elias's anus. The weapon had been pressed in deep at the point where the seams of the pants were joined and then fired. It was a vindictive shot. More than a coup de grace, it showed anger and hatred. It contradicted the cool skill of the other shots. It also told Bosch that Garwood had been wrong about the shooting sequence. Whether the captain had been intentionally wrong, he didn't know. He stood up and back to the rear door of the car so that he was in the spot where the shooter had probably stood. He surveyed the carnage in front of him once more and nodded to no one in particular, just trying to commit it all to memory. Edgar and Ryder were still between the bodies and making their own observations. Bosch turned around and looked down the tracks to the turnstile station below. The detectives he had seen before were gone. Now a lone cruiser sat down there and two patrol officers guarded the lower crime scene. Bosch had seen enough. He made his way past the bodies and carefully around Sally Tam again and up onto the platform. His partners followed, Edgar moving by Tam more closely than he had to. Bosch stepped away from the train car so they could huddle together privately. What do you think? he said. I think they're real, Edgar said, looking back toward Tam. They got that natural slope to them. What do you think, kids? Funny, Ryder said, not taking the bait. Can we talk about the case, please? Bosch admired how Ryder took Edgar's frequent comments and sexual innuendo without more than a sarcastic remark or complaint fired back at him. Such comments could get Edgar in serious trouble, but only if Ryder made a formal complaint. The fact that she didn't indicated either she was intimidated or she could handle it. She also knew that if she went formal, she'd get what cops called a canine jacket, a reference to the city jail ward where snitches were housed. Bosch had once asked her in a private moment if she wanted him to talk to Edgar. As her supervisor, he was legally responsible for resolving the problem, but he knew that if he talked to Edgar, then Edgar would know he had gotten to her. Ryder knew this as well. She had thought about all of this for a few moments and told Bosch to let things alone. She said she wasn't intimidated, just annoyed on occasion. She could handle it. You go first, Kiz, Bosch said, also ignoring Edgar's comment, even though he privately disagreed with his conclusion about Tam. Anything catch your eye in there? Same as everybody else, I guess. Looks like the victims were not together. The woman either got on ahead of Elias or was about to get off. I think it's pretty clear Elias was the primary target and she was just an also-ran. The shot up the ass tells me that. Also, like you said in there, this guy was a hell of a shot. We're looking for someone who spent some time at the range. Bosch nodded. Anything else? No, it's a pretty clean scene. Nothing much to work with. Jerry? Nada. What about you? Same. But I think Garwood was telling us a story. His sequence was for shit. How? Ryder said. The shot up the pipe was the last one, not the first. Elias was already down. It's a contact wound, and the entry is in the underside where all the seams of the pants come together. It would be hard to get a muzzle up there if Elias was standing, even if he was up a step from the shooter. I think he was already down when the shooter popped that cap. That changes things, Ryder said. Makes the last one a fuck you shot. The shooter was angry at Elias. So he knew him, Edgar said. Bosch nodded. And you think Garwood knew this and was just trying to steer us wrong by planting the suggestion? Ryder asked. Or do you think he just missed it? What I know about Garwood is that he is not a stupid man, Bosch said. He and fifteen of his men were about to be pulled into federal court on Monday by Elias and dragged right through the shit. He knows any one of those boys might possibly be capable of this. He was protecting them. That's what I think. Well, that's bullshit. Protecting a killer cop? He should be... Maybe protecting a killer cop. We don't know. He didn't know. I think it was probably a just-in-case move. Doesn't matter. If that's what he was doing, he shouldn't have a badge. Bosch didn't say anything to that, and Ryder wasn't placated. She shook her head in disgust. Like most cops in the department, she was tired of fuck-ups and cover-ups, of the few tainting the many. What about the scratch on the hand? Edgar and Ryder looked at him with arched eyebrows. What about it? Edgar said. Probably happened when the shooter pulled off the watch. One of those with the expanding band, like a Rolex. <laughs> Knowing a lass, it was probably a Rolex. Makes a nice motive. Yeah, if it was a Rolex, Bosch said. He turned and looked out across the city. He doubted Elias wore a Rolex. 
For all of his flamboyance, Elias was the kind of lawyer who also knew the nuances of his profession. He knew that a lawyer wearing a Rolex might turn jurors off. He wouldn't wear one. He would have a nice and expensive watch, but not one that advertised itself like a Rolex. What, Harry? Ryder said. What about the scratch? Bosch looked back at them. Well, whether it was a Rolex or a high-priced watch or not, there's no blood in the scratch. Meaning? There's a lot of blood in there. The bullet wounds bled out, but there was no blood in the scratch, meaning I don't think the shooter took the watch. That scratch was made after the heart stopped. I'd say long after, which means it was made after the shooter left the scene. Ryder and Edgar considered this. Maybe, Edgar finally said. But that vascular system shit is hard to nail down. Even the coroner isn't going to be definitive on that. Yeah, Bosch said, nodding. Sir, so call it uh, gut instinct. We can't take it to court, but I know the shooter didn't take the watch. Or probably the wallet, for that matter. So what are you saying? Edgar asked. Somebody else came along and took it? Something like that. You think it was the guy who ran the train, the one who called it in? Bosch looked at Edgar but didn't answer him. He hiked his shoulders. You think it was one of the RHD guys, Ryder whispered. Another just-in-case move. Send us down the robbery path just in case it was one of their own. Bosch looked at her a moment, thinking about how to respond and how thin the ice was where they now stood. Detective Bosch? He turned. It was Sally Tam. We're clear, and the coroner's people want to bag him and tag him if that's okay. Fine. Hey, listen, I forgot to ask. Did you get anything with the laser? We got a lot, but probably nothing that will help. A lot of people ride that car. We probably got passengers, not the shooter. Well, you'll run them anyway, right? Sure, we'll put everything through APHIS and DOJ. We'll let you know. Bosch nodded his thanks. Also, um, did you collect any keys from the guy? We did. They're in one of the brown bags. You want them? Yeah, we're probably going to need them. Be right back. She smiled and went back to the train car. She seemed too cheerful to be at a crime scene. Bosch knew that would wear off after a while. See what I mean? Edgar said. They gotta be real. Jerry, Bosch said. Edgar raised his hands in surrender. I'm a trained observer just filing a report. Well, you better keep it to yourself, Bosch whispered, unless you want to file it with the chief. Edgar turned just in time to see Irving come up to them. Well, initial conclusions, detectives? Bosch looked at Edgar. Uh, Jerry, <clears throat> what were you just saying you observed? Uh, well, uh, at the moment we're still kind of thinking about all we saw in there. Nothing that doesn't really jibe with what Captain Garwood told us, Bosch said quickly, before Ryder could say anything that would reveal their true conclusions, at least preliminarily. What next, then? We got plenty to do. I want to talk to the train operator again, and we've got to canvas that residential building for wits. We've got next a kin notification, and we've got to get into Elias's office. When does that help you promised us going to show up, Chief? Right now. Irving raised an arm and beckoned Chastain and the three others he stood with. Bosch had known that was probably what they were doing at the scene, but seeing Irving waving them over still put a tight feeling in his chest. Irving was well aware of the animosity between IAD and the rank and file, and the enmity that existed between Bosch and Chastain in particular. To put them together on the case, told Bosch that Irving wasn't as interested in finding out who killed Howard Elias and Catalina Perez as he had outwardly expressed. This was the deputy chief's way of appearing to be conscientious, but actually working to cripple the investigation. Are you sure you want to do this, chief? Bosch asked in an urgent whisper as the IAD men approached. You know, Chastain and I don't. Yes, it is how I want to do it, Irving said, cutting Bosch off without looking at him. Detective Chastain headed up the internal review of the Michael Harris complaint. I think he is an appropriate addition to this investigation. What I'm saying is that Chastain and I have a history, Chief. I don't think it's going to work out with... I do not care if you two do not like each other. Find a way to work together. I want to go back inside now. Irving led the entourage back into the station house. It was close quarters. No one said anything by way of a greeting to one another. Once inside, they all looked expectantly at Irving. Okay, we are going to set some ground rules here, the deputy chief began. 
Detective Bosch is in charge of this investigation. The six of you report to him. He reports to me. I do not want any confusion about that. Detective Bosch runs this case. Now, I have arranged for you to set up an office in the conference room next to my office on the sixth floor at Parker Center. There will be added phones and a computer terminal in there by Monday morning. You men from IAD, I want you to be primarily used in the areas of interviewing police officers, running down alibis, that part of the investigation. Detective Bosch and his team will handle the traditional elements of homicide investigation. The autopsy, witness interviews, that whole part of it. Any questions so far? The room went stone silent. Bosch was quietly seething. It was the first time he had thought of Irving as a hypocrite. The deputy chief had always been a hard-ass, but ultimately a fair man. This move was different. He was maneuvering to protect the department when the rot they were seeking might be inside it. But what Irving didn't know was that Bosch had accomplished everything in his life by channeling negatives into motivation. He vowed to himself that he would clear the case in spite of Irving's maneuvers, and the chips would fall where they would fall. A word of warning about the media. It will be all over this case. You are not to be distracted or deterred. You are not to talk to the media. All such communications will come through my office or Lieutenant Tom O'Rourke in media relations, understood? The seven detectives nodded. Good. That means I will not have to fear picking the times up off the driveway in the morning. Irving looked at his watch and then back at the group. I can control you people, but not the coroner's people or anyone else who learns about this through official channels in the next few hours. I figure by ten hundred the media will be all over this with full knowledge of the victim's identities, so I want a briefing in the conference room at ten hundred. After I am up to date, I will brief the chief of police, and one of us will address the media with the bare minimum of information we wish to put out. Any problem with that? Chief, that barely gives us six hours, Bosch said. I don't know how much more we'll know by then. We got a lot of legwork to do before we can sit down and start sifting through. That is understood. You are to feel no pressure from the media. I do not care if the press conference is merely to confirm who is dead and nothing else. The media will not be running this case. I want you to run with it full bore, but at ten hundred I want everyone back at my conference room. Questions? There were none. Okay, then I will turn it over to Detective Bosch and leave you people to it. He turned directly to Bosch and handed him a white business card. You have all my numbers there, Lieutenant Tulin's as well. Anything comes up that I should know about, you call me forthwith. I do not care what time it is or where you are at, you call me. Bosch nodded, took the card, and put it in his jacket pocket. Go to it, people. As I said before, let the chips fall where they may. He left the room and Bosch heard Ryder whisper, Yeah, right. Bosch turned and looked at the faces of the new team, coming to Chastain's last. You know what he's doing, don't you? Bosch said. He thinks we can't work together. He thinks we'll be like those fighting fish that you put in the same bowl and they go nuts trying to get at each other. Meantime, the case is never cleared. Well, it's not going to happen. Anything anybody in here has ever done to me or anyone else, forget about it. I let it go. This case is the thing. There are two people in that train that somebody blew away without so much as a second thought. We're going to find that person. That's all I care about now. He held Chastain's eyes until he finally saw a slight nod of agreement. Bosch nodded back. He was sure all the others had seen the exchange. He then took out his notebook and opened it to a fresh page. He handed it to Chastain. Okay, then, he said. I want everybody to write down their names followed by their home and pager numbers. Cell phones, too, if you got them. I'll make a list up and everybody will get copies. I want everybody in communication. That's the trouble with these big gangbangs. If everybody isn't on the same wavelength, something can slip through. We don't want that. Bosch stopped and looked at the others. They were all watching him, paying attention. It seemed that, for the moment, the natural animosities were relaxed, if not forgotten. Okay, he said. This is how we're going to break this down from here on out. Six. One of the men from IAD was a Latino named Raymond Fuentes. Bosch sent him along with Edgar to the address on Catalina Perez's identification cards to notify her next of kin and to handle the questions about her. It was most likely the dead-end part of the investigation. It seemed apparent that Elias was the primary target, and Edgar tried to protest, but Bosch cut him off. 
The explanation he would share privately with Edgar later was that he needed to spread the IAD men out in order to give him better control of things. So Edgar went with Fuentes, and Ryder was sent with a second IAD man, Loomis Baker, to interview Eldridge Pete at Parker Center and then bring him back to the scene. Bosch wanted the train operator at the scene to go over what he had seen and to operate the train as he had before discovering the bodies. That left Bosch, Chastain, and the last IAD man, Joe Della Croce. Bosch dispatched Della Croce to Parker Center as well to draw up a search warrant for Elias' office. He then told Chastain that the two of them would go to Elias' home to make the death notification to his next of kin. After the group split up, Bosch walked to the crime scene van and asked Hoffman for the keys found on the body of Howard Elias. Hoffman looked through the crate he had placed his evidence bags in and came out with a bag containing a ring with more than a dozen keys on it. From the front pants pocket, right side, Hoffman said. Bosch studied the keys for a moment. There seemed to be more than enough keys for the lawyer's home, office, and cars. He noticed that there was a Porsche key on the ring, as well as a Volvo key. He realized that when the investigators finished the current crop of tasks, one assignment he would have to make would be to put someone on locating Elias's car. Anything else in the pockets? Yeah, in the left front he had a quarter. A quarter. Costs a quarter to ride Angel's flight, that's probably what that was for. Bosch nodded. And in the inside coat pocket was a letter. Bosch had forgotten that Garwood had mentioned the letter. Let's see that. Huffman looked through his crate again and came up with a plastic evidence bag. Inside it was an envelope. Bosch took it from the crime scene tech and studied it without removing it. The envelope had been addressed to Elias's office by hand. There was no return address. On the left lower corner, the sender had written, Personal and Confidential. Bosch tried to read the postmark, but the light was bad. He wished he still carried a lighter. It's your neck of the woods, Harry, Hoffman said. Hollywood. Mailed Wednesday. You probably got it Friday. Bosch nodded. He turned the bag over and looked at the back of the envelope. It had been cleanly cut open along the top. Elias or his secretary had opened it, probably at his office, before he had put it into his pocket. There was no way of knowing if the contents had been examined since. Anybody open it? We didn't. I don't know what happened before we got here. I understand that the first detective saw the name on there and then recognized the body, but I don't know if they actually looked at the letter. Bosch was curious about the contents of the envelope, but knew it wasn't the right time or place to open it. I'm going to take this, too. You got it, Harry. Let me just get you to sign it out, and the uh, keys, too. Bosch waited while Hoffman got a chain of evidence form out of his kit. He squatted down and put the envelope and keys into his briefcase. Chastain came over, ready to leave the scene. You want to drive or you want me to? Bosch said as he snapped his case closed. I've got a slick. What have you got? I still have a plain Jane. Runs like dog shit, but at least I don't stand out like dog shit on the street. That's good. You got a bubble? Yes, Bosch. Even IAD guys have to respond to calls now and then. Hoffman held a clipboard and pen out to Bosch, and he signed his initials next to the two pieces of crime scene evidence he was taking with him. Then you drive. They started walking across California Plaza to where the cars were parked. Bosch pulled his pager off his belt and made sure it was running properly. The battery light was still green. He hadn't missed any pages. He looked up at the tall towers surrounding them, wondering if they could possibly interfere with a page from his wife. But then he remembered the page from Lieutenant Billets had come through earlier. He clipped the pager back to his belt and tried to think about something else. Following Chastain's lead, they came to a beat-up maroon LTD that was at least five years old, and about as impressive looking as a pinto. At least, Bosch thought, it isn't painted black and white. It's unlocked, Chastain said. Bosch went to the passenger side door and got in the car. He got his cell phone out of his briefcase and called the Central Dispatch Center. He asked for a Department of Motor Vehicles run on Howard Elias and was given the dead man's home address as well as his age, driving record, and the plate numbers of the Porsche and Volvo registered in his and his wife's names. Elias had been 46. His driving record was clean. Bosch thought that the lawyer was probably the most cautious driver in the city. The last thing Elias probably ever wanted to do was draw the attention of an LAPD patrol cop. It made driving a Porsche seem almost a waste. Baldwin Hills, he said after closing the phone. 
Her name is Millie. Chastain started the engine, then plugged the flashing emergency light, the bubble, into the lighter and put it on the dashboard. He drove the car quickly down the deserted streets toward the 10 freeway. Bosch was silent at first, not sure how to break the ice with Chastain. The two men were natural enemies. Chastain had investigated Bosch on two different occasions. Both times Bosch was grudgingly cleared of any wrongdoing, but only after Chastain was forced to back off. It seemed to Bosch that Chastain had a hard-on for him that felt close to a vendetta. The IAD detective seemed to take no joy in clearing a fellow cop. All he wanted was a scalp. I know what you're doing, Bosch, Chastain said once they got onto the freeway and started west. Bosch looked over at him. For the first time he considered how physically similar they were. Dark hair going gray, full mustache beneath dark brown-black eyes, a lean, almost wiry build, almost mirror images. Yet Bosch had never considered Chastain to be the kind of physical threat that Bosch knew he projected himself. Chastain carried himself differently. Bosch had always carried himself like a man afraid of being cornered, like a man who wouldn't allow himself to be cornered. What? What am I doing? You're thinning us out. That way you have better control. He waited for Bosch to reply, but only got silence. But eventually, if we're going to do this thing right, you are going to have to trust us. After a pause, Bosch said, I know that. Elias lived on Beck Street in Baldwin Hills, a small section of upper-middle-class homes south of the 10 Freeway and near La Cienega Boulevard. It was an area known as the Black Beverly Hills, a neighborhood where affluent blacks moved when they did not wish to have their wealth take them out of their community. As Bosch considered this, he thought if there was anything that he could like about Elias, it was the fact that he didn't take his money and move to Brentwood or Westwood or the real Beverly Hills. He stayed in the community from which he had risen. With little middle-of-the-night traffic and Chastain cruising on the freeway at 90, they got to Beck Street in less than 15 minutes. The house was a large, brick colonial with four white columns holding up a two-story portico. It had the feeling of a southern plantation, and Bosch wondered if it was some kind of statement being made by Elias. Bosch saw no lights from behind any of the windows, and the hanging light in the portico was dark as well. This didn't sit right with him. If this was Elias' home, why wasn't a light left on for him? There was a car in the circular driveway that was neither a Porsche nor a Volvo. It was an old Camaro with fresh paint and chromed wheels. To the right of the house there was a detached two-car garage, but its door was closed. Chastain pulled into the drive and stopped behind the Camaro. Nice car. Chastain said. Tell you what, I wouldn't leave a car like that out overnight, even in a neighborhood like this, too close to the jungle. He turned the car off and reached to open his door. Let's wait a second here, Bosch said. He opened his briefcase, got out the phone, and called dispatch again. He asked for a double check on the address for Elias. They had the right place. He then asked the dispatcher to run the plate on the Camaro. It came back registered to a Martin Luther King Elias, age 18. Bosch thanked the dispatcher and clicked off. We got the right place? Chastain asked. Looks like it. The Camaro must be his son's. But it doesn't look like anyone was expecting Dad to come home tonight. Bosch opened his door and got out, Chastain doing the same. As they approached the door, Bosch saw the dull glow of a bell button. He pushed it and heard the sharp ringing of a chime inside the quiet house. They waited and pushed the bell button two more times before the portico light came on above them, and a woman's sleepy but alarmed voice came through the door. What is it? Mrs. Elias, Bosch said. We're police. We need to talk to you. Police? What for? It's about your husband, ma'am. Can we come in? I need some identification before I open this door. Bosch took out his badge wallet and held it up, but then noticed there was no peephole. Turn around, the woman's voice said. On the column. Bosch and Chastain turned and saw the camera mounted on one of the columns. Bosch walked up to it and held up his badge. You see it? he said loudly. He heard the door open and turned around. A woman in a white robe with a silk scarf wrapped around her head looked out at him. 
You don't have to yell, she said. <clears throat> Sorry. She stood in the one-foot opening of the door, but made no move to invite them in. Howard is not here. What do you want? Uh, can we come in, Mrs. Elias? We want... No, you can't come in my house, my home. No policeman has ever been in here. Howard wouldn't have it. Neither will I. What do you want? Has something happened to Howard? Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm afraid. It would really be better if we... Oh, my God! She shrieked. You killed him! You people finally killed him! Mrs. Elias, Bosch started, wishing he had better prepared himself for the assumption he should have known the woman would make. We need to sit down with you and... Again, he was cut off, but this time it was by an unintelligible animal-like sound from deep in the woman. Its anguish was resonant. The woman bowed her head and leaned into the door jamb. Bosch thought she might fall and made a move to grab her shoulders. The woman recoiled as if he were a monster reaching out to her. No! No, don't you touch me! You, you murderers! Kill us! You killed my Howard! Howard! The last word was a full-throated scream that seemed to echo through the neighborhood. Bosch looked behind him, half expecting to see the street lined with onlookers. He knew he had to contain the woman, get her inside, or at least quiet. She was moving into a full-fledged wail now. Meantime, Chastain just stood there, paralyzed by the scene unfolding before him. Bosch was about to make another attempt to touch the woman when he saw a movement from behind her, and a young man grabbed hold of her from behind. Ma! What? What is it? The woman turned and collapsed against the young man. Martin! Martin, they killed him! Your father! Martin Elias looked up over his mother's head, and his eyes burned right through Bosch. His mouth formed the horrible O oh of shock and pain that Bosch had seen too many times before. He suddenly realized his mistake. He should have made this call with either Edgar or Ryder. Ryder, probably. She would have been a calming influence. Her smooth demeanor and the color of her skin would have done more than Bosch and Chastain combined. Son, Chastain said, coming out of his inertia, we need to settle down a bit here and go inside to talk about this. Don't you call me son. I'm not your goddamn son. Mr. Elias, Bosch said forcefully. Everyone, including Chastain, looked at him. He then continued in a calmer, softer voice. Martin, you need to take care of your mother. We need to tell you both what has happened and to ask you a few questions. The longer we stand here, cursing and yelling, the longer it will be before you can take care of your mother. He waited a moment. The woman turned her face back into her son's chest and began to cry. Martin then stepped back, pulling her with him so that there was room for Bosch and Chastain to enter. For the next fifteen minutes, Bosch and Chastain sat with the mother and son in a nicely furnished living room and detailed what was known of the crime and how the investigation would be handled. Bosch knew that to them it was like a couple of Nazis announcing they would investigate war crimes. But he also knew that it was important to go through the routine, to do his best to assure the victim's family that the investigation would be thorough and aggressive. I know what you said about it being cops, Bosch said in summation. At the moment, we don't know that. It's too early in the investigation to know anything about a motive. We are in a gathering phase at this time, but soon we'll move to the sifting phase, and any cop who might have had even a remote reason to harm your husband will be looked at. I know there will be many in that category. You have my word that they will be looked at very closely. He waited. The mother and son were huddled together on a couch with a cheerful floral pattern. The son kept closing his eyes like a child, hoping to ward off a punishment. He was flagging under the weight of what he had just been told. It was finally hitting home that he would not see his father again. Now we know this is an awful time for you, Bosch said softly. We would like to put off any kind of prolonged questioning so that you have time to yourselves, but there are a few questions that would help us right now. He waited for an objection, but none came. He continued. The main one is that we can't figure out why Mr. Elias was on Angel's flight. We need to find out where he was. He was going to the apartment, Martin said without opening his eyes. What apartment? He kept an apartment near the office so he could just stay over on court days or when he was busy getting ready for trial. He was going to stay there tonight? 
Right, he'd been staying there all week. He had depots, the wife said, with the police. They were coming in after work, so he was staying late at the office. Then he would just go over to the apartment. Bosch was silent, hoping either one of them would add something more about the arrangement, but nothing else was said. Did he call you and tell you he was staying over? he asked. Yes. He always called. When was this? This last time is what I mean. Earlier today. He said he'd be working late and needed to get back into it on Saturday and Sunday. You know, preparing for the trial on Monday. He said he would try to be home on Sunday for supper. So you weren't expecting him to be home here tonight? That's right, Millie Elias said, a note of defiance in her voice, as if she had taken the tone of Bosch's question to mean something else. Bosch nodded as if to reassure her that he was not insinuating anything. He asked the specific address of the apartment and was told it was in a complex called The Place, just across Grand Street from the Museum of Modern Art. Bosch took out his notebook and wrote it down, then kept the notebook out. Now, he said, Mrs. Elias, can you remember more specifically when it was you last spoke to your husband? It was right before six. That is when he calls and tells me. Otherwise, I have to figure out what's for supper and how many I'm cooking for. How about you, Martin? When did you last speak to your father? Martin opened his eyes. I don't know, man. A couple of days ago, at least. But what's this got to do with anything? You know who did it. Somebody with a badge did this thing. Tears finally began to slide down Martin's face. Bosch wished he could be somewhere else. Anywhere else. If it was a cop, Martin, you have my word, we will find him. He won't get away with it. Sure, Martin replied without looking at Bosch. The man gives us his word. But who the hell is the man? The statement made Bosch pause a moment before continuing. A few more questions, he finally said. Did Mr. Elias have an office here at home? No, the son said. He didn't do his work here. Okay. Next question. In recent days or weeks, had he mentioned any specific threat or person who he believed wanted to harm him? Martin shook his head and said, He just always said that it was the cops who would get him some day. It was the cops. Bosch nodded, not in agreement, but in his understanding of Martin's belief. One last question. There was a woman who was killed on Angel's flight. It looks like they were not together. Her name was Catalina Perez. Does that name mean anything to either of you? Bosch's eyes moved from the woman's face to her son's. Both stared blankly and shook their heads. Okay, then. He stood up. We will leave you uh, alone now. But either myself or other detectives will need to speak with you again, probably later on today. Neither the mother nor son reacted. Mrs. Elias, do you have a spare photo of your husband we could borrow? The woman looked up at him, her face showing confusion. Why do you want a picture of Howard? We may need to show people in the course of the investigation. Everybody already knows Howard, what he looks like. Probably, ma'am, but we might need a photo in some cases. Do you... Martin, she said, go get me the albums out of the drawer in the den. Martin left the room, and they waited. Bosch took a business card from his pocket and put it down on the wrought iron and glass coffee table. There's my pager number if you need me, or if there's anything else I can do. Is there a family minister you would like us to call? Millie Elias looked up at him again. Reverend Tuckins over at the AME. Bosch nodded, but immediately wished he hadn't made the offer. Martin came back into the room with a photo album. His mother took it and began to turn through the pages. She began to weep silently again at the sight of so many pictures of her husband. Bosch wished he had put off getting the photo until the follow-up interview. Finally, she came upon a close-up shot of Howard Elias's face. She seemed to know it would be the best photo for the police. She carefully removed it from the plastic sleeve and handed it to Bosch. Will I get that back? Yes, ma'am, I'll see that you do. Bosch nodded and was about to make his way to the door. He was wondering if he could just forget about calling Reverend Tuggins. Where's my husband? the widow suddenly asked. 
Bosch turned back. His body is at the coroner's office, ma'am. I will give them your number and they will call you when it's time for you to make arrangements. What about Reverend Tuggins? You want to use our phone? Uh, no, ma'am. We'll contact Reverend Tuggins from our car. We can see ourselves out now. On the way to the door, Bosch glanced at the collection of framed photographs that hung on the wall in the entrance hallway. They were photos of Howard Elias with every notable black community leader in the city, as well as many other celebrities and national leaders. There he was with Jesse Jackson, with Congresswoman Maxine Waters, with Eddie Murphy. There was a shot of Elias flanked by Mayor Richard Reardon on one side and City Councilman Royal Sparks on the other. Bosch knew that Sparks had used outrage over police misconduct to forge his rise in city politics. He would miss having Elias around to keep the fire fanned, though Bosch also knew that Sparks would now use the lawyer's murder to any advantage he could. Bosch wondered how it was that good and noble causes often seemed to bring slick opportunists to the microphones. There were also family photos. Several depicted Elias and his wife at social functions. There were shots of Elias and his son, one of them on a boat, both holding up a black marlin and smiling. Another photo showed them at a firing range, posing on either side of a paper target with several holes shot through it. The target depicted Daryl Gates, a former police chief whom Elias had sued numerous times. Bosch remembered that the targets, created by a local artist, were popular toward the end of Gates's tumultuous stewardship of the department. Bosch leaned forward to study the photo and see if he could identify the weapons Elias and his son held, but the photo was too small. Chastain pointed to one of the photos, which showed Elias and the chief of police at some formal affair, supposed adversaries smiling at the camera. They look cozy, he whispered. Bosch just nodded and went out through the door. Chastain pulled the car out of the driveway and headed down out of the hills and back to the freeway. They were silent, both absorbing the misery they had just brought to a family and how they had received the blame for it. They always shoot the messenger, Bosch said. I think I'm glad I don't work homicide, Chastain replied. I can deal with cops being pissed at me, but that, that was bullshit. They call it the dirty work, next of kin notification. They ought to call it something, fucking people. We're trying to find out who killed the guy and they're saying it was us. You believe that shit? I didn't take it literally, Chastain. People in that position are entitled to a little slack. They're hurting. They say things, that's all. Yeah, you'll see. Wait until you see that kid on the six o'clock news. I know the type. You won't have much sympathy then. Where are we going anyway? Back to the scene? Go to his apartment first. You know Della Croce's pager number? Not offhand, no. Look at your list. Bosch opened his notebook and looked up the pager number Della Croce had written down. He punched the number into his phone and made the page. What about Tuggins? Chastain asked. You call him, you give him the head start on getting the south end ready to rock and roll. I know, I'm thinking. Bosch had been thinking about that decision since the moment Millie Elias had mentioned the name Preston Tuggins. As with many minority communities, pastors carried as much weight as politicians when it came to shaping that community's response to a social, cultural, or political cause or event. In the case of Preston Tuggins, he carried even more. He headed a group of associated ministers, and together they were a force, a major media-savvy force that could hold the whole community in check or unleash it like an earthquake. Preston Tuggins had to be handled with utmost care. Bosch dug through his pocket and pulled out the card Irving had given him earlier. He was about to call one of the numbers on it when the phone rang in his hand. It was Della Croce. Bosch had given him the address of Elias' apartment at The Place and told him to draw up an additional search warrant. Della Croce cursed because he had already wakened the judge to fax him the office search warrant. He would now have to do it again. Welcome to homicide, Bosch said as he clicked off. What? Chastain said. Nothing, just bullshit. Bosch punched in Irving's number. The deputy chief answered after one ring, giving his full name and rank. It seemed odd to Bosch that Irving seemed fully alert, as if he had not been asleep. Chief, it's Bosch. You said to call if... It's no problem, Detective. What is it? We just made notification to Elias' wife and son. Uh, she wanted me to call her minister. 
I don't see the problem. The minister is Preston Tuggins, and I thought maybe somebody a little further up the ladder might be better making. I understand. It was good thinking. I will have it taken care of. I think perhaps the chief will want to handle that. I was just about to call him anyway. Anything else? Not at this time. Thank you, Detective. Irving hung up. Chastain asked what he said, and Bosch told him. This case, Chastain said. I have a feeling things are going to get hairy. Say that again. Chastain was about to say something else, but Bosch's pager sounded. He checked the number. Again, it wasn't to call from home, but Grace Billitz's second page. He had forgotten the caller earlier. He called now, and the lieutenant answered after one ring. I wondered if you were going to call me back. Sorry, I sort of got tied up, and I forgot. So, what's going on? Irving wouldn't tell me who was dead, just that RHD and Central couldn't handle it. Howard Elias. Oh, shit. H Harry, I I'm sorry it's you. It's okay, we'll make out. Everybody will be watching you, and if it's a cop, it's a no-win situation. Do you get any sense from Irving? Does he want to go at it, balls to the wall? Mixed signals. You can't talk freely? Right. Well, I'm getting mixed signals here, too. Irving told me to take your team off the rotation, but he said it would only be until Friday. Then I'm supposed to talk to Irving about it. Now that I know who is dead, I think the translation of that is that you have till then before he probably ships you back to Hollywood, and you have to take Howard Elias back here with you and work it when you can. Bosch nodded but didn't say anything. It went with the other moves Irving had made. The deputy chief had created a large team to work the case, but it looked as though he was only giving them a week to work it full time. Maybe he hoped that the media glare would drop off to a more manageable level by then, and the case could eventually disappear into the unsolved files. But Bosch thought Irving was kidding himself if he thought that. He and Billets talked for a few minutes more before Billets finally signed off with a warning. Watch yourself, Harry. If a cop did this, one of those RHD guys... What? Just be careful. I will. He closed the phone and looked out the windshield. They were almost to the 110 transition. They would be back at California Plaza soon. Your lieutenant? Chastain asked. Yeah, she just wanted to know what was going on. So what's the deal with her and Ryder? Are they still munching each other's pie on the side? It's none of my business, Chastain, and none of yours. Just asking. They rode in silence for a while. Bosch was annoyed by Chastain's question. He knew it was the IAD detective's way of reminding Bosch that he knew secrets, that he might be out of his element when it came to straight homicide investigation, but he knew secrets about cops and should not be taken lightly. Bosch wished he hadn't made the call to Billets while Chastain was in the car. Chastain seemed to sense his misstep and broke the silence by trying some harmless banter. Tell me about this hard-boiled eggs caper I keep hearing people talk about, he said. Here's nothing, just a case. I missed the story in the paper, I guess. Just a piece of luck, Chastain. Like we could use on this case. Well, tell me. I want to know, especially now that we're partnering up, Bosch. I like stories about luck. Maybe it'll rub off. It was just a routine call out on a suicide. Patrol called us to come out and sign off on it. Started when a mother got worried about her daughter because she hadn't shown up at the airport up in Portland. She was supposed to fly up there for a wedding or something and never showed up. The family was left waiting at the airport. Anyway, the mother called up and asked for a drive-by check of the daughter's apartment, a little place over on Franklin near La Brea. So a blue suit went by, got the manager to let him in, and they found her. She had been dead a couple of days since the morning she was supposed to have flown up to Portland. What did she do? was made to look like she took some pills and then cut her wrist in the bathtub. Patrol said suicide. That's the way it was supposed to look. It was a note. It was torn out of a notebook, and it said things about life not being what she expected and about being lonely all the time and stuff. It was kind of a ramble. Very sad, actually. So, how'd you figure it out? Well, we were... Edgar was with me, writer at court. We were about to close it out. We had looked around the place and found nothing really wrong, except for the note. I couldn't find the notebook that the page had been torn out of. And that didn't sit right. I mean, it didn't mean she didn't kill herself, but it was a loose end, you know. Uh, what is wrong with this picture sort of thing? 
Okay, so you thought somebody was in there and took the notebook? Maybe. I didn't know what to think. I told Edgar to take another look around, and this time we switched and searched through things the other guy had searched the first time. And you found something Edgar had missed. He didn't miss it. It just didn't register with him. It did with me. What was it already? In a refrigerator, there was a shelf for the eggs. You know, like little indentations that you sit the eggs in. Right? Well, I noticed on some of the eggs she had written a date. All the same date. It was the same day she was flying up to Portland. Bosch looked over at Chastain to see if there was a reaction. The IAD man had a confused look on his face. He didn't get it. They were hard-boiled eggs. The ones with dates on them had been hard-boiled. I took one over to the sink and cracked it. It was hard-boiled. Okay. He still didn't get it. The date on the eggs was probably the date she had boiled them, Bosch said. You know, so she could tell the boiled ones from the others and she'd know how old they were. And it just hit me then. You don't boil a bunch of eggs so they're ready for when you want them and then go kill yourself. I mean, what's the point? So it was a hunch. More than that. But you just knew. Homicide. It changed things. We started to look at things differently. We began a homicide investigation. It took a few days, but we got it. Friends told us about some guy who was giving her trouble, harassing her, stalking her because she turned him down on a date. We asked around the apartment, and we started looking at the apartment manager. Shit. I should have guessed it was him. We talked to him, and he fucked up just enough for us to convince a judge to sign a search warrant. In his place, we found the notebook that the supposed suicide note had been torn from. It was like a diary where she wrote down her thoughts and things. This guy found a page where she was talking about life being bad, and he knew he could use it as a suicide note. We found other stuff that was hers. Why'd he keep the stuff? Because people are stupid, that's why, Chastain. You want clever killers? Watch TV. He kept the stuff because he never thought we'd think it wasn't a suicide. And because he was in the notebook. She wrote about him stalking her, about how she was sort of flattered and scared of him at the same time. He probably got off on reading it. He kept it. When's the trial? A couple months. Sounds like a slam dunk. Yeah, we'll see. So is O.J. What'd he do, drug her somehow, then put her in the tub and cut her? He was letting himself in her apartment when she was out. There was stuff in the diary about her thinking someone had been creeping her place. She was a runner, did three miles a day. We think that was when he'd like to go in. She had prescription painkillers in the medicine cabinet. She got hurt playing racquetball a couple years before. We think he took the pills on one of his visits and dissolved them in orange juice. The next time he went in, he poured it into the juice bottle in her fridge. He knew her habits. He knew that after jogging, she liked to sit on the steps out front, drink her juice, and cool down. She may have realized she had been drugged and looked around for help. It was him who came. He took her back inside. He raped her first? Bosch shook his head. He probably tried, but couldn't get it up. They drove in silence for a few moments. You're cool, Bosch, Chastain said. Nothing gets by you. Yeah, I wish. 7. Chastain parked the car in the passenger loading zone in front of the modern high-rise building called The Place. Before they were out of the car, the night doorman came through the glass entrance to either greet them or tell them to move. Bosch got out and explained that Howard Elias had been murdered less than a block away and that they needed to check his apartment to make sure there were no additional victims or someone needing help. The doorman said no problem, but wanted to go along. Bosch told him in a tone that invited no debate to wait in the lobby for other officers who would be arriving. Howard Elias' apartment was on the 20th floor. The elevator moved quickly, but the silence between Bosch and Chastain made the trip seem longer. They found their way to 20E, and Bosch knocked on the door and rang the doorbell on the wall next to it. After getting no response, Bosch stooped and opened his briefcase on the floor, then took the keys out of the evidence bag Hoffman had given him earlier. You think we ought to wait on the warrant? Chastain asked. Bosch looked up at him as he closed the briefcase and snapped the locks. No. That was a line of bullshit you gave the doorman that people maybe needed help. Bosch stood up and started trying keys in the door's two locks. Remember what you said before about me eventually having to trust you? 
This is where I start to trust you, Chastain. I don't have the time to wait on a warrant. I'm going in. A homicide case is like a shark. It's got to keep moving or it drowns. He turned the first lock. You and your fucking fish. First fighting fish, now a shark. Yeah, you keep sticking around, Chastain. You might even learn how to catch something. Just as he said the line, he turned the second lock. He looked at Chastain and winked, then opened the door. They entered a medium-sized living room with expensive leather furnishings, cherry wood bookcases, and windows and a balcony with an expansive southern view across downtown and the Civic Center. The place was neatly kept, except for sections of Friday morning's times spread across the black leather couch and an empty coffee mug on the glass-topped coffee table. Hello? Bosch called out, just to be sure the place was empty. Police! Anyone home? No answer. Bosch put his briefcase down on the dining room table, opened it, and took a pair of latex gloves out of a cardboard box. He asked Chastain if he wanted a pair, but the IAD man declined. I'm not going to be touching anything. They separated and began moving through the apartment on a quick, initial survey. The rest of the place was as neat as the living room. It was a two-bedroom and had a master suite with its own balcony facing west. It was a clear night. Bosch could see all the way to Century City. Past those towers, the lights dropped off in Santa Monica to the sea. Chastain came into the bedroom behind him. No home office, he said. The second bedroom looks like a guest room, maybe for stashing witnesses. Okay. Bosch scanned the contents of the top of the bureau. There were no photos or anything of a strong, personal nature. Same with the small tables on either side of the bed. It looked like a hotel room, and in a way it was, if Elias only used it for overnight stays while readying cases for court. The bed was made, and this stood out to Bosch. Elias was in the middle of preparations for a major trial, working day and night, yet he had stopped to make his bed that morning when supposedly it would just be he returning at the end of the day. No way, Bosch thought. Either he made the bed because there would be someone else in the apartment, or someone else made the bed. Bosch ruled out a maid because a maid would have picked up the strewn newspaper and the empty coffee cup in the living room. No, it was Elias who had made the bed, or someone who was with him. It was gut instinct based on his long years of delving into human habits. But at that moment, Bosch felt reasonably sure that there now was another woman in the mix. He opened the drawer of the bed table where a phone sat and found a personal phone book. He opened it and flipped through the pages. There were many names he recognized. Most were lawyers Bosch had heard about or even knew. He stopped when he came across one name, Carla and Trenkin. She, too, was an attorney specializing in civil rights cases, or had been until a year earlier, when the police commission appointed her inspector general of the Los Angeles Police Department. He noted that Elias had her office and home number listed. The home number was in darker, seemingly more recent, ink. It looked to Bosch as though the home number had been added well after the business number had been recorded in the book. What do you got? Chastain said. Nothing, Bosch answered. Just a bunch of lawyers. He closed the phone book as Chastain stepped over to look. He tossed it back in the drawer and closed it. Better leave it for the warrant, he said. They conducted a casual search of the rest of the apartment for the next twenty minutes, looking in drawers and closets, under beds and couch cushions, but not disturbing anything they found. At one point, Chastain called out from the bathroom off the master bedroom. Got two toothbrushes here. Okay. Bosch was in the living room studying the books on shelves. He saw one he had read years before. Yesterday Will Make You Cry by Chester Himes. He felt Chastain's presence and turned around. Chastain stood in the hallway leading to the bedrooms. He was holding a box of condoms up for Bosch to see. These were hidden in the back of a shelf under the sink. Bosch didn't respond. He just nodded. In the kitchen, there was a wall-mounted telephone with an answering machine. There was a flashing light on it, and the digital display showed there was one message waiting to be played. Bosch pushed the playback button. It was a woman's voice on the message. Hey, it's me. I thought you were going to call me. I hope you didn't fall asleep on me. That was it. After the message, the machine reported that the call had come in at 12.01 a.m. Elias was already dead by then. 
Chastain, who had come into the kitchen from the living room when he heard the voice, just looked at Bosch and hiked his shoulders after the message was played. Bosch played it again. Doesn't sound like the wife to me, Bosch said. Sounds white to me, Chastain said. Bosch thought he was right. He played the message one more time, this time concentrating on the tone of the woman's voice. There was a clear sense of intimacy in the voice. The time of the call and the woman's assumption that Elias would know her voice supported this conclusion as well. Condoms hidden in the bathroom, two toothbrushes, mystery woman on the phone, Chastain said. Sounds like we got a girlfriend in the works. That could make things interesting. Maybe, Barsh said. Somebody made the bed this morning. Any female stuff in the medicine cabinet? Nothing. Chastain went back to the living room. After Bosch was finished in the kitchen, he felt he had seen enough for the time being and slid open the glass door leading from the living room to the balcony. He leaned on the iron railing and checked his watch. It was 4.50. He then pulled the pager off his belt to make sure he hadn't turned it off by mistake. The pager was on, the battery not dead. Eleanor had not tried to reach him. He heard Chastain come out onto the balcony behind him. Bosch spoke without turning to look at him. Did you know him, Chastain? Who, Elias? Yes, yeah, sort of. How? I've worked cases he later went to court on. I got subpoenaed and deposed. Plus the Bradbury. He's got his office there. We've got offices there. I'd see him every now and then. But if you're asking if I played golf with the guy, the answer is no, I didn't know him like that. The guy made a living suing cops. When he got into court, he always seemed to have real good information, inside stuff. Some say better stuff than he should have had access to through legal discovery. Some say he might have had sources inside. I wasn't a snitch for Howard Elias, Bosch, Chastain said, his voice tight. And I don't know anyone in IADU who was. We investigate cops. I investigate cops. Sometimes they deserve it, and sometimes it turns out they don't. You know as well as I do that there has to be somebody to police the police, but snitching to the likes of Howard Elias and his bunch, that's the lowest of the low, Bosch. So fuck you very much for asking. Bosch looked at him now, studying the way the anger was moving into his dark eyes. Just asking, he said. Had to know who I'm dealing with. He looked back out across the city and then down to the plaza below. He saw Kiz Ryder and Loomis Baker crossing toward Angel's flight with a man Bosch assumed was Eldridge Pete, the train operator. All right? You asked, Chastain said. Can we get on with it now? Sure. They were silent during the elevator ride down. It wasn't until they were in the lobby that Bosch spoke. You go on ahead, he said. I'm going to see if there's a can around here. Tell the others I'll be right there. Sure. The doorman had overheard the exchange from his little lobby desk and told Bosch the restroom was around the corner behind the elevators. Bosch headed that way. In the restroom, Bosch put his briefcase on the sink counter and got his phone out. He called his house first. When the machine picked up, he punched in the code to play all new messages. Only his own message played back to him. Eleanor hadn't got it. Shit he said as he hung up. He then called information and got the number for the Hollywood Park poker room. The last time Eleanor had not come home, she had told him she was playing cards there. He called the number and asked for the security office. A man identifying himself as Mr. Jardine answered, and Bosch gave his name and badge number. Jardine asked him to spell his name and give the number again. He was obviously writing it down. Are you in the video room? Sure am. What can I do for you? I'm looking for somebody, and there's a good chance she's at one of your tables right now. I was wondering if you could look at the tubes for me. What's she look like? Bosch described his wife, but could not give any description on clothes because he had not checked the closets at the house. He then waited two minutes while Jardine apparently studied the video screens connected to the surveillance cameras in the poker room. Uh, if she's here, I'm not seeing her, Jardine finally said. We don't have very many women in here this time of night, and she doesn't match the ones we've got. I mean, she could have been in here earlier, maybe one or two o'clock, but uh, not now. Okay, uh, thanks. Hey, you got a number? I'll take a walk around the place. Call you back if I see anything. I'll give you my pager, but if you see her, don't approach her. Just 
Give me a page. Will do. After giving the man his pager number and hanging up, Bosch thought about the card clubs in Gardena and Commerce, but decided not to call. If Eleanor was going to stay local, she would have gone to Hollywood Park. If she didn't go there, she'd go to Vegas, or maybe the Indian place in the desert near Palm Springs. He tried not to think about that and focus his mind back on the case. Bosch next called the district attorney's night switchboard after getting the number out of his phone book. He asked to be connected with the on-call prosecutor and was eventually connected to a sleepy attorney named Janice Langweiser. She happened to be the same prosecutor who had filed charges in the so-called hard-boiled eggs case. She had recently moved over from the city attorney's office and it had been the first time Bosch had worked with her. He had enjoyed her sense of humor and enthusiasm for her job. Uh, don't tell me. You've got a scrambled eggs case this time. Or better yet, the Western Omelet case. Not quite. I hate to pull you out of bed, but we're going to need somebody to come out and give us a little guidance on a search we'll be doing pretty soon. Uh, who's dead and where's the search? Dead is Howard Elias Esquire, and the search is going to be in his office. She whistled into the phone and Bosch had to hold it away from his ear. Whoa! She said, now fully alert. This is going to be, well, something. Tell me the general details. He did, and when he was finished, Langweiser, who lived 30 miles north in Valencia, agreed to meet the search team at the Bradbury in one hour. Until then, take things very carefully, Detective Bosch, and don't go into the office until I am there. Will do. It was a little thing, but he liked her calling him by his title. It was not because she was a good deal younger than he was. It was because so often prosecutors treated him and other cops without respect, as simply tools for them to use whatever way they wanted in prosecuting a case. He was sure Janice Langweiser would be no different as she became more seasoned and cynical, but at least for now she outwardly showed him small nuances of respect. Bosch disconnected and was about to put the phone away when he thought of something else. He called information again and asked for the home listing for Carla and Trenkin. He was connected to a recording that told him the number was unlisted at the customer's request. It was what he had expected to hear. As he crossed Grand Street and California Plaza to Angel's Flight, Bosch again tried not to think of Eleanor and where she might be. But it was hard. It hurt his heart when he thought about her being out there somewhere alone, searching for something he, obviously, couldn't give her. He was beginning to feel his marriage would be doomed if he didn't soon figure out what it was she needed. When they had married a year ago, he had found a feeling of contentment and peace that he had never experienced before. For the first time in his life, he felt there was someone to sacrifice for. Everything, if needed. But he had come to the point where he was acknowledging to himself that it was not the same for her. She was not content or complete. And it made him feel awful and guilty and a small bit relieved all at the same time. Again, he tried to concentrate on other things, on the case. He knew he needed to put Eleanor aside for the time being. He started thinking about the voice on the phone, the condoms hidden in the bathroom cabinet, and the bed that had been neatly made. He thought about how Howard Elias could come to have the unlisted home telephone number of Carla and Trinken in the drawer next to his bed. 8. Ryder was standing next to a tall, black man with graying hair just outside the door to the Angels Flight Station House. They were sharing a smile about something when Bosch walked up. Mr. Pete, this is Harry Bosch, Ryder said. He's in charge of this investigation. Pete shook his hand. Worst thing I ever saw in my life. Worst thing. I'm sorry you had to witness this, sir, but I'm glad you're willing to help us out. Why don't you go in and have a seat inside? We'll be with you in a few minutes. When Pete was inside, Bosch looked at Ryder. He didn't have to speak. Same as Garwood said. He didn't hear anything and he didn't see a lot until the car came up and he went to lock it up for the night. He didn't see anybody hanging around down there as if they were waiting for anyone either. Any chance he's just playing deaf and dumb? My gut says no. I think he's legit. He didn't see it or hear it go down. He touched the bodies? No. You mean the watch and wallet? No, I doubt it was him. Bosch nodded. Mind if I ask him a couple follow-ups? Be my guest. Bosch walked into the little office and Ryder followed. 
Eldridge Pete was sitting at the lunch table, holding the phone to his ear. I gotta go, hon, he said when he saw Bosch. The policeman wants to talk to me. He hung up. My wife, she's wondering when I'm coming home. Bosch nodded. Mr. Pete, did you go into the train after you saw the bodies in there? No, sir. Uh, they looked pretty dead to me. I saw a lot of blood. I thought I should leave it all alone for the authorities. Did you recognize either of those people? <sighs> well, the man I couldn't rightly see, but I thought it might be Mr. Elias just on account of the nice suit and how he looked. Now, the woman, I recognized her, too. I mean, I didn't know her name or nothing, but she got on the train a few minutes before and went on down. You mean she went down first? Yes, sir, she went down. She also a regular like Mr. Elias, except she ride maybe only one time a week, on Fridays, like last night. Mr. Elias, he read more. Why do you think she went down the hill but didn't get off the train? Pete stared at him blankly, as if surprised by such an easy question. Because she got shot. Bosch almost laughed, but kept it to himself. He wasn't being clear enough with the witness. No, I mean, before she was shot. It seems as though she never got up as if she was on the bench and had been waiting to go back up when the shooter arrived behind the other passenger who was getting on. Well, I surely don't know what she was doing. When exactly did she go down? The ride right before. I sent Olivette down and that lady was on it. This was five, six minutes to eleven. I sent Olivette down and I just let her sit down there till eleven. Then I brought her up. You know, last ride... When she came up, those people were dead on there. Pete's apparent describing of the female gender to the train was confusing to Bosch. He tried to make it clear. So you sent Olivette down with the woman on it. Then, five, six minutes later, she is still on the train car when you bring it up. Is that right? Right. And during that five or six minutes that Olivette was sitting down there, you weren't looking down there. No, I was counting the money out of the register. Then, when it was eleven o'clock, I went out and locked up Sinai. Then I brought Olivette on up. That's when I found them. They were dead. But you didn't hear anything from down there. No shots. No, like I told the lady, Miss Kisman, I wear earplugs on account of the noise underneath the station. Also, I was counting the money. It's mostly all quarters. I run them through the machine. He pointed to a stainless steel change counter next to the cash register. It looked like the machine put the quarters into paper rolls containing ten dollars. He then stamped his foot on the wood floor, indicating the machinery below. Bosch nodded that he understood. Tell me about the woman. You said she was a regular? Yeah, once a week, Fridays. Like, maybe she have a little job up here in the apartments cleaning or something. The bus runs down there on Hill Street. I think she caught it down there. And what about Howard Elias? Well, he a regular, too. Two, three times a week, all different times, sometimes late like last night. One time I was locking up and he was down there calling up to me. I made exception. I brought him up on Sinai. I was being nice. At Christmas time he gave me a little envelope. He was a nice man, remembering me like that. Was he always alone when he rode the train? The old man folded his arms and thought about this for a moment. Mostly, I think. You remember him ever being with somebody else? I think one or two times I remember him being with somebody. I can't readily remember who it was. Was it a man or a woman? I don't know. I think it might have been a lady, but I'm not getting a picture, know what I mean? Bosch nodded and thought about things. He looked at Ryder and raised his eyebrows. She shook her head. She had nothing more to ask. Before you go, Mr. Pete, can you uh, <clears throat> turn everything on and let us ride down? Sure. Whatever you and Miss Kismin need. He looked at Ryder and bowed his head with a smile. Thank you, Bosch said. Then let's do it. Pete moved to the computer keyboard and began typing in a command. Immediately the floor began to vibrate, and there was a low-pitched grinding sound. Pete turned to them. Any time, he said above the din. Bosch waved and headed out to the train car. Chastain and Baker, the IAD man who had been paired with Kismin Ryder, were standing at the guardrail looking down the track. We're going down, Bosch called over. You guys coming? 
Without a word, they fell in behind Ryder, and the four detectives stepped onto the train car called Olivet. The bodies had long been removed, and the evidence technicians cleared out, but the spilt blood was still on the wood floor and the bench where Catalina Perez had sat. Bosch moved down the steps, careful to avoid stepping in the maroon pool that had leaked from Howard Elias's body. He took a seat on the right side. The others sat on benches further up the train, away from where the bodies had fallen. Bosch looked up at the station house window and waved. Immediately, the car jerked and began its descent. And immediately, Bosch again recalled riding the train as a kid. The seat was just as uncomfortable as he remembered it. Bosch didn't look at the others as they rode. He kept looking out the lower door and at the track as it went underneath the car. The ride lasted no longer than a minute. At the bottom, he was the first off. He turned and looked back up the tracks. He could see Pete's head silhouetted in the station house window by the overhead light inside. Bosch did not push through the turnstile, as he could see black fingerprint powder on it and didn't want to get it on his suit. The department did not consider the powder a hazard of the job and would not repay a dry-cleaning bill if he got it on himself. He pointed the powder out to the others and climbed over the turnstile. He scanned the ground on the off chance something would catch his eye, but there was nothing unusual. He was confident that the area had already been gone over by the RHD detectives anyway. Bosch had primarily come down to get a first-hand look and feel for the place. To the left of the archway was a concrete staircase for when the train wasn't running, or for those who were afraid to ride the Incline Railroad. The stairs were also popular with weekend fitness enthusiasts who ran up and down them. Bosch had read a story about it a year or so back in the Times. Next to the stairs, a lighted bus stop had been cut into the steep hill. There was a glass, fiberglass sunshade over a double-length bench. The side partitions were used to advertise films. On the one Bosch could see, there was an ad for an Eastwood picture called Bloodwork. The movie was based on a true story about a former FBI agent Bosch was acquainted with. Bosch thought about whether the gunman could have waited in the bus shelter for Elias to walk up to the Angel's Flight turnstile. He decided against it. The shelter was lit by an overhead light. Elias would have had a good view of whoever sat in there as he approached the train. Since Bosch thought it was likely that Elias knew his killer, he didn't think the shooter would have waited out in the open like that. He looked at the other side of the archway where there was a heavily landscaped ten-yard strip between the train entrance and a small office building. Bushes crowded thickly around an acacia tree. Bosch wished he hadn't left his briefcase up in the station house. Anybody bring a flashlight? he asked. Ryder reached into her purse and brought out a small penlight. Bosch took it and headed into the bushes, putting the light on the ground and studying his pathway in. He found no obvious sign that the killer had waited in here. There was trash and other debris scattered in behind the bushes, but none of it appeared to be fresh. It looked like a place where homeless people had stopped to look through trash bags they had picked up from somewhere else. Ryder made her way into the bushes. Find anything? Nothing good. I'm just trying to figure out where this guy would have hidden from Elias. This could have been as good a spot as any. Elias wouldn't see him. He'd come out after Elias walked by, move up behind him at the train car. Maybe he didn't need to hide. Maybe they walked here together. Bosch looked at her and nodded. Maybe. As good as anything I'm coming up with in here. What about the bus bench? Too open, too well lighted. If it was someone Elias had reason to fear, you'd have seen him. What about a disguise? He could have sat in the bus stop in a disguise. Where's that? You've already considered all of this, but you let me go on talking, saying things you already know. He didn't say anything. He handed the flashlight back to Ryder and headed out of the bushes. He looked over at the bus stop once more and felt sure he was right in his thinking. The bus stop hadn't been used. Ryder came up next to him and followed his gaze. Hey, did you know Terry McCaleb over at the Bureau? she asked. Yeah, we worked a case once. Why, you know? Not really, but I've seen him on TV. He doesn't look like Clint Eastwood, if you ask me. <laughs> yeah, not really. Bosch saw Chastain and Baker had crossed the street and were standing in the hollow created by the closed roll-up doors at the entrance of the huge Grand Central Market. They were looking at something on the ground. Bosch and Ryder walked over. Got something? Ryder asked. Maybe, maybe not, Chastain said. He pointed to the dirty, worn tiles at his feet. 
Cigarette butts, Baker said. Five of them, same brand, means somebody was waiting here a while. Could have been a homeless, Ryder said. Maybe, Baker replied. Could have been our shooter. Bosch wasn't that impressed. Any of you smokers? he asked. Why? Baker asked. Because then you'd see what this probably is. What is it you see when you go in the front doors of Parker Center? Chastain and Baker looked puzzled. Cops? Baker tried. Yeah, but cops doing what? Smoking, Ryder said. Right. No smoking in public buildings anymore, so the smokers gather around the front doors. This market is a public facility. He pointed at the cigarette butts crushed on the tiles. It doesn't necessarily mean somebody was waiting there a long time. I think it means somebody in the market came out five times during the day for smokes. Baker nodded, but Chastain refused to acknowledge the deduction. Still could be our guy, he said. Where else did he wait, the bushes over there? He could have. Or like Kiz said, maybe he didn't wait. Maybe he walked right up to the train with Elias. Maybe Elias thought he was with a friend. Bosch reached into his jacket pocket and took out a plastic evidence bag. He handed it to Chastain. Or maybe I'm all wrong and you're all right. Bag him and tag him, Chastain. Make sure they get to the lab. A few minutes later, Bosch was finished with his survey of the lower crime scene. He got on the train, picked up his briefcase where he had left it, and moved up the stairs to one of the benches near the upper door. He sat down heavily, almost dropping onto the hard bench. He was beginning to feel fatigue take over and wished he had gotten some sleep before Irving's call had come. The excitement and adrenaline that accompany a new case caused a false high that always wore off quickly. He wished he could have a smoke and then maybe a quick nap, but only one of the two was possible at the moment and he would have to find an all-night market to get the smokes. Again, he decided against it. For some reason, he felt that his nicotine fast had become part of his vigil for Eleanor. He thought that if he smoked, all would be lost, that he would never hear from her again. What are you thinking, Harry? He looked up. Ryder was in the doorway of the train, coming aboard. Nothing. Everything. We're really just getting started on this. There's a lot to do. No rest for the weary. Say that again. His pager sounded, and he grabbed it off his belt with the urgency of a man who has had one go off in a movie theater. He recognized the number on the display, but couldn't remember where he had seen it before. He took the phone out of his briefcase and punched it in. It was the home of Deputy Chief Irvin Irving. I spoke with the chief. He'll handle Reverend Tuggins. He's not to be your concern. Irving put a sneer into the word reverend. Okay, he isn't. So, where are we? We're still at the scene, just finishing up. We need to canvas the building over here for witnesses, then we'll clear out. Elias kept an apartment downtown. That was where he was headed. We need to search that and his office as soon as the search warrants are signed. What about next of kin on the woman? Perez should be done by now, too. Tell me how it went at the Elias home? Since Irving had not asked before, Bosch assumed he was asking now because the chief of police wanted to know. Bosch quickly went over what had happened, and Irving asked several questions about the reaction of Elias's wife and son. Bosch could tell he asked them from the standpoint of public relations management. He knew that, just as with Preston Tuggins, the way in which Elias's family reacted to his murder would have a direct bearing on how the community reacted. So it does not at this time sound as though we can enlist the widow or the son in helping us contain things, correct? As of now, that's correct. But once they get over the initial shock, maybe. You also might want to talk to the chief about calling the widow personally. I saw his picture on the wall in the house with Elias. If he's talking to Tuggins, maybe he could also talk to the widow about helping us out. Maybe. Irving switched gears and told Bosch that his office's conference room on the sixth floor of Parker Center was ready for the investigators. He said that the room was unlocked at the moment, but in the morning Bosch would be given keys. Once the investigators moved in, the room was to remain locked at all times. He said that he would be in by ten and was looking forward to a more expanded rundown of the investigation at the team meeting. Sure thing, Chief, Bosch said. We should be in from the canvas and the searches by then. Make sure you are. I'll be waiting. Right. Bosch was about to disconnect when he heard Irving's voice. Excuse me, Chief? One other matter. 
I felt because of the identity of one of the victims in this case that it was incumbent upon me to notify the Inspector General. She seemed... How do I put this? She seemed acutely interested in the case when I explained the facts we had at that time. Using the word acutely is probably an understatement. Carla and Trinken. Bosch almost cursed out loud, but held it back. The Inspector General was a new entity in the department, a citizen appointed by the police commission as an autonomous civilian overseer with ultimate authority to investigate or oversee investigations. It was a further politicizing of the department. The Inspector General answered to the police commission, which answered to the city council and the mayor. And there were other reasons Bosch almost cursed as well. Finding in Trinken's name and private number in Elias's phone book bothered him. It opened up a whole set of possibilities and complications. Is she coming out here to the scene? he asked. I don't think so. I waited to call so that I could say the scene was clearing. I saved you that headache. But don't be surprised if you hear directly from her in the daylight. Can she do that? I mean, talk to me without going through you? She's a civilian. Unfortunately, she can do whatever she wants to. That is how the police commission set up the job. So what it means is that this investigation, wherever it goes, it better be seamless, Detective Bosch. If it is not, we will be hearing from Carla and Trinken about it. I understand. Good. Then all we need is an arrest and all will be fine. Sure, Chief. Irving disconnected without acknowledging. Bosch looked up. Chastain and Baker were stepping onto the train. There's only one thing worse than having the IAD tagging along on this, he whispered to Ryder. That's the Inspector General watching over our shoulders. Ryder looked at him. You're kidding. Carla, I'm thinking, is on this? Bosch almost smiled at Ryder's use of the nickname bestowed on Entrinken by an editorialist in the police union's Thin Blue Line newsletter. She was called Carla I'm Thinkin' because of her tendency towards slow and deliberate speech whenever addressing the police commission and criticizing the actions or members of the department. Bosch would have smiled, but the addition of the inspector general to the case was too serious. Nope, he said. Now we get her, too. 9. At the top of the hill they found Edgar and Fuentes had returned from notifying Catalina Perez's family of her death, and Joe de la Croce had returned from Parker Center with completed and signed search warrants. Court-approved searches were not always needed for the home and business of the victim of a homicide, but it made good sense to get warrants in high-profile cases. Such cases attracted high-profile attorneys if they eventually resulted in arrest. These attorneys invariably created their high profiles by being thorough and good at what they did. They exploited mistakes, took the frayed seams and loose ends of cases, and ripped open huge holes, often big enough for their clients to escape through. Bosch was already thinking that far ahead. He knew he had to be very careful. Additionally, he believed a warrant was particularly necessary to search Elias's office. There would be numerous files on police officers and cases pending against the department. These cases would most likely proceed after being taken on by new attorneys, and Bosch needed to balance the preservation of attorney-client privacy with the need to investigate the killing of Howard Elias. The investigators would no doubt need to proceed carefully while handling these files. It was the reason he had called the district attorney's office and asked Janice Langweiser to come to the scene. Bosch approached Edgar first, taking him by the arm and nudging him over to the guardrail overlooking the steep drop-off to Hill Street. They were out of earshot of the others. How'd it go? It went the way they all go. About a million other places I'd rather be than watching the guy get the news. Know what I mean? Yeah, I know. You just tell him, or did you ask him some questions? We asked, but we didn't get very many answers. The guy said his wife was a house cleaner and she had a gig somewhere over here. She took the bus over. He couldn't give an address. Said his wife kept all of that stuff in a little notebook she carried. Bosch thought for a moment. He didn't remember any notebook in the evidence inventory. Balancing his briefcase on the guardrail, he opened it and took out the clipboard on which he had the accumulated paperwork from the crime scene. On top was the yellow copy of the inventory Hoffman had given him before he had left. It listed victim number two's belongings, but there was no notebook. Well, we'll have to check with him again later on. 
We didn't get any notebook. We'll send Fuentes back. The husband didn't speak English. All right, anything else? No, we did the usual checklist. Any enemies, any problems, anybody giving her trouble, anybody stalking her, so on and so forth. Nada. The husband said she wasn't worried about anything. Okay, what about him? He looked legit, like he got hit in the face with the big frying pan called bad luck, you know. Yeah, I know. Hit hard. And there was as much surprise there as anything else. Okay. Bosch looked around to make sure they were not being overheard. He spoke low to Edgar. We're going to split up now and go with the searches. I want you to take the apartment Elias kept over at the place. I was, so that's where he was going. Looks like it. I was just up there with Chastain, did a drive-by. I want you to take your time this time. I also want you to start in his bedroom. Go to the bed and take the phone book out of the top drawer of the table with the phone on it. Bag it and seal it so nobody can look at it until we get everything back to the office. Sure. How come? I'll tell you later. Just get to it before anybody else. Also, take the tape from the phone machine in the kitchen. There's a message we want to keep. Right. Okay, then. Bosch stepped away from the guardrail and approached Della Croce. Any problems with the paper? Not really, except for waking the judge twice. Which judge? John Houghton? He's okay. Well, it didn't sound like he appreciated having to do everything twice. What did he say about the office? Had me add in a line about preserving the sanctity of attorney-client privilege. That's it. Let me see. Delacroce took the search warrants out of the inside pocket of his suit jacket and handed Bosch the one for the office at the Bradbury. Bosch scanned through the stock wording on the first page of the declaration and got to the part Delacroce had talked about. It looked okay to him. The judge was still allowing the search of the office and the files, but was simply saying that any privileged information gleaned from the files must be germane to the murder investigation. What he's saying is that we can't go through the files and turn what we get over to the city attorney's office to help defend those cases, Delacroce said. Nothing goes outside our investigation. I can live with that, Bosch said. He called everybody into a huddle. He noticed Fuentes was smoking and tried not to think about his own desire for a cigarette. Okay, we've got the search warrant, he said. This is how we're going to split it up. Edgar, Fuentes, and Baker, you three take the apartment. I want Edgar on lead. The rest of us will go to the office. You guys in the apartment, I also want you to arrange for interviews of all the doormen in the building. All shifts. We need to find out as much about this guy's routines and personal life as we can. We're thinking there may be a girlfriend somewhere. We need to find out who that was. Also, on the keychain, there is a key to a Porsche and a Volvo. My guess is Elias drove the Porsche, and it's probably in the parking garage at the apartment building. I want you to take a look at that, too. The warrants don't specify a car, Delacroce protested. Nobody told me about a car when I was sent to work up the warrants. Okay, then just find the car, check it out through the windows, and we'll get a search warrant if you see something and think it's necessary. Bosch was looking at Edgar as he said this last part. Edgar almost imperceptibly nodded, meaning that he understood that Bosch was telling him to find the car and to simply open it and search it. If anything of value to the investigation was found, then he would simply back out, get a warrant, and they would act as if they had never been in the car in the first place. It was standard practice. Bosch looked at his watch and wrapped it up. Okay, it's uh, 5.30 now. We should be done with the searches by 8.30 max. Take anything that even looks of interest and we'll sift through it all later. Chief Irving has set up the command post for this investigation in the conference room next to his office at Parker. But before we go back there, I want to meet everybody right back here at 8.30. He pointed up to the tall apartment building overlooking Angel's flight. We'll canvas this building, then. I don't want to wait until later, have people get out for the day before we can get to them. What about the meeting with Deputy Chief Irving? Fuentes asked. That's set for ten. We should make it. If we don't, don't worry about it. I'll take the meeting and you people will proceed. The case comes first. He'll go along with that. Hey, Harry, Edgar said. If we get done before 8.30, all right, if we get breakfast? Yes, it's all right, but I don't want to miss anything. Do not hurry the search just so you can get pancakes. Ryder smiled. Tell you what, Bosch said. I'll make sure we have donuts here at 8.30. If you can, just wait until then. Okay, so let's do it. Bosch took out the key ring they had taken from the body of Howard Elias. 
He removed the keys to the apartment and the Porsche key and gave them to Edgar. He noted that there were still several keys on the ring that were unaccounted for. At least two or three would be to the office, and another two or three for his home in Baldwin Hills. That still left four keys, and Bosch thought about the voice he had heard on the answering machine. Maybe Elias had keys to a lover's home. He put the keys back in his pocket and told Ryder and Della Croce to drive cars down the hill and over to the Bradbury. He said he and Chastain would take the train down and walk over, making a check of the sidewalks Elias would have covered between his office building and the lower Angel's Flight Terminus. As the detectives broke up and headed toward their assignments, Bosch went to the station window and looked in on Eldridge Pete. He was sitting on the chair by the cash register, earplugs in place and his eyes closed. Bosch rapped gently on the window, but the train operator was startled anyway. Mr. Pete, I want you to send us down once more, and then you can close up, lock up, and go home to your wife. Okay, whatever you say. Bosch nodded and turned to head to the train. Then he stopped and looked back at Pete. There's a lot of blood. Do you have someone who's going to clean up the inside of the train before it opens tomorrow? Don't worry, I'll get that. I got a mop and bucket back here in the closet. I called my supervisor before you got here. He said I got to clean all of it up so she's ready to go in the morning. We start at eight Saturdays. Bosch nodded. Okay, Mr. Pete. Sorry you have to do that. I like to keep the cars clean. Also, uh, down at the bottom, they left the fingerprint dust all over the turnstile. It's nasty stuff if you get that on your clothes. I'll get that, too. Bosch nodded. Well, thanks for your help tonight. We appreciate it. Tonight? Hell, it's morning already. Pete smiled. I guess you're right. Good morning, Mr. Pete. Yeah? Not if you asked them two that were on the train. Bosch started away, and then once more came back to the man. One last thing. This is going to be a big story in the papers and on TV. I'm not telling you what to do, but you might want to think about taking your phone off the hook, Mr. Pete, and maybe not answering your door. I got you. Good. I'm going to sleep all day anyway. Bosch nodded to him one last time and got on the train. Chastain was already on one of the benches near the door. Bosch walked past him and again went down the steps to the end where Howard Elias's body had fallen. He was careful again not to step in the pooled and coagulated blood. As soon as he sat down, the train began its descent. Bosch looked out the window and saw the gray light of dawn around the edges of the tall office buildings to the east. He slumped on the bench and yawned deeply, not bothering to raise a hand to cover his mouth. He wished he could turn his body and lie down. The bench was hard, worn wood, but he had no doubts that he would quickly fall into sleep and that he would dream about Eleanor and happiness and places where you did not have to step around the blood. He dropped the thought and brought his hand up and all the way into the pocket of his jacket before he remembered there were no cigarettes to be found there. 10. The Bradbury was the dusty jewel of downtown. Built more than a century before, its beauty was old, but still brighter and more enduring than any of the glass and marble towers that now dwarfed it like a phalanx of brutish guards surrounding a beautiful child. Its ornate lines and glazed tile surfaces had withstood the betrayal of both man and nature. It had survived earthquakes and riots, periods of abandonment and decay, and a city that often didn't bother to safeguard what little culture and roots it had. Bosch believed there wasn't a more beautiful structure in the city, despite the reasons he had been inside it over the years. In addition to holding the offices for the legal practice of Howard Elias and several other attorneys, the Bradbury housed several state and city offices on its five floors. Three large offices on the third floor were leased to the LAPD's Internal Affairs Division and used for holding Board of Rights hearings the disciplinary tribunals police officers charged with misconduct must face. The IAD had leased the space because the rising tide of complaints against officers in the 1990s had resulted in more disciplinary actions and more BORs. Hearings were now happening every day, sometimes two or three running at a time. There was not enough space for this flow of misconduct cases in Parker Center, so the IAD had taken the space in the nearby Bradbury. To Bosch, the IAD was the only blemish on the building's beauty. Twice he had faced Board of Rights hearings in the Bradbury. 
Each time he gave his testimony, listened to witnesses and an IAD investigator, once it had been Chastain, report the facts and findings of the case, and then pace the floor beneath the atrium's huge glass skylight while the three captains privately decided his fate. He had come out okay after both hearings, and in the process had come to love the Bradbury, with its Mexican tile floors, wrought iron filigree, and suspended nail chutes. He had once taken the time to look up its history at the Los Angeles Conservancy offices, and found one of the more intriguing mysteries of Los Angeles. The Bradbury, for all its lasting glory, had been designed by a five-dollar-a-week draftsman. George Wyman had no degree in architecture, and no prior credits as a designer when he drew the plans for the building in 1892. Yet his design would see fruition in a structure that would last more than a century and cause generations of architects to marvel. To add to the mystery, Wyman never again designed a building of any significance, in Los Angeles or anywhere else. It was the kind of mystery Bosch liked. The idea of a man leaving his mark with the one shot he's given appealed to him. Across a whole century, Bosch identified with George Wyman. He believed in the one shot. He didn't know if he'd had his yet. It wasn't the kind of thing you knew and understood until you looked back over your life as an old man. But he had the feeling that it was still out there waiting for him. He had yet to take his one shot. Because of the one-way streets and traffic lights Della Croce and Ryder faced, Bosch and Chastain got to the Bradbury on foot before them. As they approached the heavy glass doors of the entrance, Janice Langweiser got out of a small red sports car that was parked illegally at the curb out front. She was carrying a leather bag on a shoulder strap and a styrofoam cup with the tag of a tea bag hanging over the lip. Hey, I thought we said an hour, she said good-naturedly. Bosch looked at his watch. It was an hour and ten minutes since they had talked. See your lawyer, sue me, he said, smiling. He introduced Chastain and gave Langweiser a more detailed rundown on the investigation. By the time he was finished, Ryder and Della Croce had parked their cars in front of Langweiser's car. Bosch tried the doors to the building, but they were locked. He got out the key ring and hit the right key on the second try. They entered the atrium of the building, and each of them involuntarily looked up. Such was the beauty of the place. Above them, the atrium skylight was filled with the purples and grays of dawn. Classical music played from hidden speakers. Something haunting and sad, but Bosch couldn't place it. Barbara's adagio, Langweiser said. What? Bosch said, still looking up. The music? Oh. A police helicopter streaked across the skylight, heading home to Piper Tech for a change of shift. It broke the spell, and Bosch brought his eyes down. A uniformed security guard was walking toward them. He was a young black man with close-cropped hair and startling green eyes. Can I help you people? The building's closed right now. Police, Bosch said, pulling out his ID wallet and flipping it open. We've got a search warrant here for Suite 505. He nodded to Della Croce, who removed the search warrant from his coat pocket once again and handed it to the guard. That's Mr. Elias's office, the guard said. We know, Della Croce said. What's going on? the guard asked. Why do you have to search his place? We can't tell you that right now, Barsh said. We need you to answer a couple questions, though. When's your shift start? Were you here when Mr. Elias left last night? Yeah, I was here. I work a six-to-six six shift. I watched them leave about eleven last night. Them? Yeah, him and a couple other guys. I locked the door right after they went through. The place was empty after that, except for me. You know who the other guys were? One was Mr. Lass's assistant, or whatchamacallit? Secretary? Clerk? Yeah, clerk, that's it. Like a young student who helped him with the cases. You know his name? Nah, I never asked. Okay, what about the other guy? Who was he? Mm, don't know that one. Had you seen him around here before? Yeah, the last couple nights they left together. And a few times before that, I think I saw him going or coming by himself. Did he have an office here? No, not that I know of. Was he Elias' client? How would I know? A black guy? White guy? Black. What did he look like? Well, I, I didn't really get a good look at him. You said you'd seen him around here before. What did he look like? He was just a normal-looking guy. He... Bosch was growing impatient, but wasn't sure why. 
The guard seemed to be doing the best he could. It was routine in police work to find witnesses unable to describe people they had gotten a good look at. Bosch took the search warrant out of the guard's hand and handed it back to Della Croce. Langweiser asked to see it and began reading it while Bosch continued with the guard. What's your name? Robert Cortland. I'm on the waiting list for the academy. Bosch nodded. Most security guards in this town were waiting for a police job somewhere. The fact that Cortland, a black man, was not already in the academy told Bosch that there was a problem somewhere in his application. The department was going out of its way to attract minorities to the ranks. For Cortland to be waitlisted, there had to be something. Bosch guessed he had probably admitted smoking marijuana or didn't meet the minimum educational requirements, maybe even had a juvenile record. Close your eyes, Robert. What? Just close your eyes and relax. Think of the man you saw. Tell me what he looks like. Cortland did as he was told, and after a moment came up with an improved but still sketchy description. He's about the same height as Mr. Elias, but he had his head shaved. It was slick. He got one of them soul chips, too. Soul chip? You know, like a little beard under his lip? He opened his eyes. That's it. That's it, Bosch said in a friendly, cajoling tone. Robert, how are you going to make it into the cops? We need more than that. How old was this guy? I don't know. Thirty or forty? That's a help. Only ten years difference. Was he thin? Fat? Thin, but with muscles. You know, the guy was built. I think he's describing Michael Harris, Ryder said. Bosch looked at her. Harris was the plaintiff in the Black Warrior case. It fits, Ryder said. The case starts Monday. They were probably working late, getting ready for court. Bosch nodded and was about to dismiss Cortland when Langweiser suddenly spoke while still reading the last page of the search warrant. I think we have a problem with the warrant. Now everyone looked at her. Okay, Robert, Bosch said to Cortland. We'll be all right from here. Thanks for your help. You sure? You want me to go up with you, unlock the door or something? No, we have a key. We'll be all right. Okay, then. I'll be in the security office around behind the stairs if you need anything. Thanks. Cortland started walking back the way he had come, but then stopped and turned around. Oh, you know, all five of you better not take the elevator up at once. That's probably too much weight on that old thing. Thanks, Robert, Bosch said. He waited until the guard had gone around the staircase and was out of sight before turning back to Langweiser. Miss Langweiser, you probably haven't gone out on too many crime scenes before, he said. But here's a tip. Never announce that there is a problem with a search warrant in front of somebody who isn't a cop. Oh, shit, I'm sorry. I didn't... What's wrong with the warrant? Della Croce said, his voice showing he was upset by the apparent challenge to his work. The judge didn't see anything wrong with it. The judge said it was fine. Langweiser looked down at the three-page warrant in her hand and waved it its pages fluttering like a falling pigeon. I just think that with a case like this, we better be damn sure of what we're doing before we go in there and start opening up files. We have to go into the files, Bosch said. That's where most of the suspects will be. I understand that. But these are confidential files relating to lawsuits against the police department. They contain privileged information that only an attorney and his client should have. Don't you see? It could be argued that by opening a single file, you violated the rights of Elias's clients. All we want is to find the man's killer. We don't care about his pending cases. I hope to Christ that the killer's name isn't in those files and that it isn't a cop. But what if it is? And what if in those files Elias kept copies or notes on threats? What if, through his own investigations, he learned something about somebody that could be a motive for his killing? You see, we need to look at the files. All of that is understandable, but if a judge later rules the search was inappropriate, you won't be able to use anything you find up there. You want to run that risk? She turned away from them and looked toward the door. I have to find a phone and make a call about this, she said. I can't let you open that office yet, not in good conscience. Bosch blew out his breath in exasperation. He silently chastised himself for calling in a lawyer too soon. He should have just done what he knew he had to do, and dealt with the consequences later. Here. He opened his briefcase and handed her his cell phone. He listened as she called the DA's office switchboard and asked to be connected to a prosecutor named David Scheiman, 
who Bosch knew was the supervisor of the major crimes unit. After she had Scheiman on the line, she began summarizing the situation, and Bosch continued to listen to make sure she had the details right. We're wasting a lot of time standing around, Harry, Ryder whispered to him. You want Edgar and me to pick up Harris and have a talk with him about last night? Bosch almost nodded his approval, but then hesitated as he considered the possible consequences. Michael Harris was suing 15 members of the Robbery Homicide Division in a highly publicized case set to begin trial on Monday. Harris, a car wash employee with a record of burglary and assault convictions, was seeking $10 million in damages for his claims that members of the RHD had planted evidence against him in the kidnapping and murder of a 12-year-old girl who was a member of a well-known and wealthy family. Harris claimed the detectives had abducted held and tortured him over a three-day period in hopes of drawing a confession from him as well as learning the location of the missing girl. The lawsuit alleged that the detectives, frustrated by Harris's unwillingness to admit his part in the crime or lead them to the missing girl, pulled plastic bags over Harris's head and threatened to suffocate him. He further claimed that one detective pushed a sharp instrument, a Black Warrior No. 2 pencil, into his ear, puncturing the eardrum. But Harris never confessed, and on the fourth day of the interrogation, the girl's body was found decomposing in a vacant lot just one block from his apartment. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. The murder became one more in a long line of crimes that gripped public attention in Los Angeles. The victim was a beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed girl named Stacy Kincaid. She had been spirited from her bed while she slept in her family's large and seemingly safe Brentwood home. It was the kind of crime that sent a chilling message across the city. Nobody is safe. As horrible as it was in itself, the murder of this little girl was exponentially magnified by the media. Initially, this was because of who the victim was and where she came from. She was the stepdaughter of Sam Kincaid, scion of a family that owned more automobile dealerships in Los Angeles County than it was possible to count on two hands. Sam was the son of Jackson Kincaid, the original car czar, who had built the family business from a single Ford dealership his father had passed on to him after World War II. Like Howard Elias after him, Jack Kincaid had seen the merit in local television marketing, and in the 1960s became a fixture of late-night TV advertising. On camera, he showed a folksy charm, exuding honesty and friendship. He seemed as reliable and trustworthy as Johnny Carson, and he was in the living rooms and bedrooms of Los Angeles just as often. If Los Angeles was seen as an autotopia, then Jack Kincaid was certainly seen as its unofficial mayor. Off-camera, the car czar was a calculating businessman who always played both sides of politics and mercilessly drove competitors out of business, or at least away from his dealerships. His dynasty grew rapidly, his car lot spreading across the Southern California landscape. By the 1980s, Jack Kincaid's reign was done, and the moniker of car czar was turned over to his son. But the old man remained a force, though a mostly unseen one, and this was never more clear than when Stacy Kincaid disappeared and old Jack returned to TV, this time to appear on newscasts and put up a million-dollar reward for her safe return. It was another surrealistic episode in Los Angeles' murder lore. The old man everyone had grown up with on TV was back on once again and tearfully begging for his granddaughter's life. It was all for naught. The reward and the old man's tears became moot when the girl was found dead by passers-by in the vacant lot close to Michael Harris's apartment. The case went to trial based solely on evidence consisting of Harris's fingerprints being found in the bedroom from which the girl had been abducted and the proximity of the body's disposal to his apartment. The case held the city wrapped, playing live every day on court TV and local news programs. Harris's attorney, John Penny, a lawyer as skilled as Elias when it came to manipulating juries, mounted a defense that attacked the body's disposal location as coincidental and the fingerprints found on one of the girls' school books as simply being planted by the LAPD. All the power and money the Kincaids had amassed over generations was no match against the tide of anti-police sentiment and the racial underpinnings of the case. Harris was black, 
the Kincaids and the police and prosecutors on the case were white. The case against Harris was tainted beyond repair when Penny elicited what many perceived as a racist comment from Jack Kincaid during testimony about his many dealerships. After Kincaid detailed his many holdings, Penny asked why not one of the dealerships was in South Central Los Angeles. Without hesitation, and before the prosecutor could object to the irrelevant question, Kincaid said he would never place a business in an area where the inhabitants had a propensity to riot. He said he made the decision after the Watts riots of 1965, and it was confirmed after the more recent riots of 1992. The question and answer had little, if anything, to do with the murder of a 12-year-old girl, but proved to be the pivotal point in the trial. In later interviews, jurors said Kincaid's answer was emblematic of the city's deep racial gulf. With that one answer, sympathy swayed from the Kincaid family to Harris. The prosecution was doomed. The jury acquitted Harris in four hours. Penny then turned the case over to his colleague, Howard Elias, for civil proceedings, and Harris took his place next to Rodney King in the pantheon of civil rights victims and heroes in South L.A. Most of them deserved such honored status, but some were the creations of lawyers and the media. Whichever Harris was, he was now seeking his payday, a civil rights trial in which ten million dollars would be just the opening bid. Despite the verdict and all the attached rhetoric, Bosch didn't believe Harris's claims of innocence or police brutality. One of the detectives Harris specifically accused of brutality was Bosch's former partner, Frankie Sheehan, and Bosch knew Sheehan to be a total professional when dealing with suspects and prisoners. So Bosch simply thought of Harris as a liar and murderer who had walked away from his crime. He would have no qualms about rousting him and taking him downtown for questioning about Howard Elias's murder. But Bosch also knew as he stood there with Ryder that if he now brought Harris in, he would run the risk of compounding the alleged wrongs already done to him, at least in the eyes of much of the public and the media. It was a political decision as much as a police decision that he had to make. Let me think about this for a second, he said. He walked off by himself through the atrium. The case was even more perilous than he had realized. Any misstep could result in disaster to the case to the department, to careers. He wondered if Irving had realized all of this when he had chosen Bosch's team for the case. Perhaps, he thought, Irving's compliments were just a front for a real motive, leaving Bosch and his team dangling in the wind. Bosch knew he was now venturing into paranoia. It was unlikely that the deputy chief could have come up with such a plan so quickly, or that he would even care about Bosch's team with so much else at stake. Bosch looked up and saw the sky was much brighter now. It would be a sunny and hot day. Harry? He turned. It was Ryder. She's off. He walked back to the group and Langweiser handed him his phone. You're not going to like this, she said. David Scheiman wants to bring in a special master to look at the files before you do. Special master? Delacroce asked. What the hell is that? It's an attorney, Langweiser said an independent attorney appointed by a judge who will oversee the files. He will be hired to protect the rights of those clients while still giving you people what you need. Hopefully. Shit, Bosch said, his frustration finally getting the better of him. Why don't we just stop the whole thing now and drop the damn case? If the DA's office doesn't care about us clearing it, then we won't care either. Detective Bosch, you know it's not like that. Of course we care, we just want to be safe. The warrant you have is still good for searching the office. Shyman said you can even go through completed case files, which I am sure you need to look at as well. But the special master will have to come in and look at all pending files first. Remember, this person is not an adversary to you. He will give you everything you are entitled to see. And when will that be? Next week? Next month? No. Shyman is going to go to work on that this morning. He'll call Judge Houghton, apprise him of the situation, and see if he has any recommendations for a special master. With any luck, the appointment will be made today, and you'll have what you need from the files this afternoon. Tomorrow, at the very latest. Tomorrow, at the latest, is too late. We need to keep moving on this. Yeah, Chastain chimed in. Don't you know an investigation is like a shark? It's got to keep... All right, Chastain, Bosch said. Look, Langweiser said. I'll make sure Dave understands the urgency of the situation. In the meantime, you'll just have to be patient. 
Now, do you want to keep standing here talking about it, or do you want to go up and do what we can in the office? Bosch looked at her for a long moment, annoyed by her chiding tone. The moment ended when the phone in his hand rang. It was Edgar, and he was whispering. Bosch held a hand over his ear so he could hear. I didn't hear that. What? Listen, I'm in the bedroom. There's no phone book in the bed table. I checked both bed tables. It's not here. What? The phone book. It's not here, man. Bosch looked at Chastain, who was looking back at him. He turned and walked away out of earshot of the others. Now he whispered to Edgar. You sure? Of course I'm sure. I would have found it if it was here. You were first in the bedroom. Right. First one in. It's not here. You're in the bedroom to the right when you come down the hall. Yeah, Harry, I'm in the right place. It's just not here. Shit. What do you want me to do? Nothing. Continue the search. Bosch flipped the phone closed and put it in his pocket. He walked back to the others. He tried to act calm as if the call had only been a minor annoyance. Okay, let's go up and do what we can up there. They moved to the elevator, which was an open, wrought-iron cage with ornate flourishes and polished brass trim. Why don't you take the ladies up first, Bosch said to Della Croce. We'll come up after. That ought to distribute the weight pretty evenly. He took Elias's key ring out of his pocket and handed it to Ryder. The office key should be on there, he said. And never mind about that other thing with Harris for the time being. Let's see what we've got in the office first. Sure, Harry. They got on, and Della Croce pulled the accordion gate closed. The elevator rose with a jerking motion. After it was up one floor and those on it could not see them, Bosch turned to Chastain. The anger and frustration of everything going wrong flooded him then. He dropped his briefcase and with both hands grabbed Chastain by the collar of his jacket. He roughly pushed him against the elevator cage and spoke in a low, dark voice that was full of rage. God damn it, Chastain. I'm only asking this one time. Where's the fucking phone book? Chastain's face flushed crimson, and his eyes grew wide in shock. What? What the fuck are you talking about? He brought his hands up to Bosch's and tried to free himself, but Bosch maintained the pressure, leaning all of his weight into the other man. The phone book in the apartment. I know you took it, and I want it back right the fuck now. Finally, Chastain tore himself loose. His jacket and shirt and tie were wrenched askew. He stepped away from Bosch as if he was scared and adjusted himself. He then pointed a finger at him. Stay away from me. You're fucking nuts. I don't have any phone book. You had it. I saw you put it in the goddamn drawer next to the bed. Bosch took a step toward him. You took it. When I was on the bell, I said stay away. I didn't take it. If it's not there, then somebody came in and took it after we left. Bosch stopped. It was an obvious explanation, but it hadn't even entered his mind. He had automatically thought of Chastain. He looked down at the tiles, embarrassed by how he'd let an old animosity cloud his judgment. He could hear the elevator gate opening on the fifth floor. He raised his eyes, fixed Chastain with a bloodless stare, and pointed at his face. I find out otherwise, Chastain. I promise I'll take you apart. Fuck you! I didn't take the book, but I am going to take your badge for this. Bosch smiled, but not in a way that had any warmth. Go ahead. Write your ticket, Chastain. Any time you can take my badge, you can have it. Eleven. The others were inside Howard Elias's law offices by the time Bosch and Chastain made it up to the fifth floor. The office was essentially three rooms, a reception area with a secretary's desk, a middle room where there was a clerk's desk and two walls of file cabinets, and then the third and largest room, Elias's office. As Bosch and Chastain moved through the offices, the others stood silently and didn't look at them. It was clear that they had heard the commotion in the lobby as they had taken the elevator up. Bosch didn't care about that. He had already put the confrontation with Chastain behind him and was thinking about the search. He was hoping something would be found in the office that would give the investigation a focus, a specific path to follow. He walked through the three rooms, making general observations. In the last room, he noticed that, through the windows behind Elias's large, polished wood desk, he could see the huge face of Anthony Quinn. 
It was part of a mural depicting the actor with arms outstretched on the brick wall of a building across the street from the Bradbury. Ryder came into the office behind him. She looked out the window, too. You know, every time I'm down here and see that, I wonder who that is. You don't know? Cesar Chavez? Anthony Quinn. You know, the actor? He got a non-response from her. <laughs> Before your time, I guess. The mural is called The Pope of Broadway, like he's watching over all the homeless around here. Oh, I see. She didn't sound impressed. How you want to do this? Bosch was still staring at the mural. He liked it, even though he had a hard time seeing Anthony Quinn as a Christ-like figure. But the mural seemed to capture something about the man, a raw, masculine, and emotional power. Bosch stepped closer to the window and looked down. He saw the forms of two homeless people sleeping beneath blankets of newspapers in the parking lot beneath the mural. Anthony Quinn's arms were outstretched over them. Bosch nodded. The mural was one of the little things that made him like downtown so much, just like the Bradbury and Angel's Flight. Little pieces of grace were everywhere, if you looked. He turned around. Chastain and Langweiser had entered the room behind Ryder. I'll work in here. Kiz and Janice, you two take the file room. And what? Chastain said. Me and Dell get the secretary's desk? Yeah. While you're going through it, see if you can come up with her name and the name of the intern or clerk. We'll need to talk to them today. Chastain nodded, but Bosch could see he was annoyed about getting the weakest assignment. Tell you what, Bosch added. Why don't you go out first and see if you can find some boxes? We're going to be taking a lot of files out of here. Chastain left the office without a word. Bosch glanced at Ryder and saw her give him a look that told him he was acting like an asshole. What? Nothing. I'll be in the file room. She left then, leaving just Langweiser and Bosch. Everything okay, detective? Everything's fine. I'm going to get to work now. Do what I can until we hear about your special master. Look, I'm sorry, but you called me out here to advise you, and this is what I advise. I still think it is the right way to go. Yeah, well, we'll see. For most of the next hour, Bosch methodically went through Elias's desk, studying the man's belongings, appointment calendar, and paperwork. Most of his time was spent reading through a series of notebooks in which Elias had kept reminders to himself, lists of things to do, pencil drawings, and general notes from phone calls. Each notebook was dated on the outside cover. It appeared that Elias filled the pages of one book every week or so with his voluminous notations and doodles. Nothing in the books jumped out at Bosch as being pertinent to the investigation. But he also knew that so little about the circumstances of Elias's murder was known that something seeming unimportant in the notebooks at the moment might become important later. Before starting to page through the most recent notebook, Bosch was interrupted by another call from Edgar. Harry, you said there was a message on the phone machine? That's right. They ain't now. Bosch leaned back in Elias's chair and closed his eyes. <sighs> God damn it. Yeah, it's been cleared. I dicked around with it, and it's not a tape. Messages are stored on a microchip. The chip was cleared. Okay, Bosch replied angrily. Continue the search. When you're done, talk to the security people about who's been in and out of that place. See if they've got any video points in the lobby or parking garage. Somebody went in there after I left. What about Chastain? He was with you, wasn't he? I'm not worried about Chastain. He flipped the phone closed and got up and went to the window. He hated the feeling growing inside that he was being worked by the case rather than the other way around. He blew out his breath and went back to the desk and the last notebook that Howard Elias had kept. As he paged through, he came across repeated notes regarding someone referred to as Parker. Bosch did not believe this to be a person's real name, but rather a code name for a person inside Parker Center. The notations were mostly lists of questions Elias apparently intended to ask Parker, as well as what looked like notes on conversations with this person. They were mostly in abbreviated form, or the lawyer's own version of shorthand, and therefore difficult to decipher. But in other instances, the notes were clear to Bosch. 
One notation clearly indicated to Bosch that Elias had a deeply connected source inside Parker Center. Parker. Get all 51s. Unsustained. 1. Sheehan. 2. Koblenz. 3. Rooker. 4. Stanwyck. Bosch recognized the names as belonging to four RHD detectives who were among the defendants in the Black Warrior case. Elias wanted the 51 reports, or citizen complaint files, on the four detectives. More specifically, Elias wanted the unsustained files, meaning he was interested in complaints against the four that had been investigated by the IAD, but not substantiated. Such unsustained complaints were removed from officers' personnel files as a matter of department policy, and were therefore out of reach of a subpoena from a lawyer like Elias. The notation in the notebook told Bosch that Elias somehow knew that there were unsubstantiated prior complaints against the four, and that he had a source in Parker Center who had access to the old files on those complaints. The first assumption was not a major leap. All cops had unsubstantiated complaints. It was part of being a cop. But someone with access to that sort of file was different. If Elias had such a source, it was a well-placed source. One of the last references to Parker in the notebook appeared to be notes of a conversation, which Bosch assumed to have been a phone call to Elias at his desk. It appeared that Elias was losing his source. Parker won't. Jeopardy slash exposure. Force the issue? Parker won't what? Bosch wondered. Turn over the files Elias wanted? Did Parker believe that getting the files to Elias would expose him as a source? There wasn't enough there for him to make a conclusion. There wasn't enough for him to understand what force the issue meant, either. He wasn't sure what any of the notes might have to do with the killing of Howard Elias. Nevertheless, Bosch was intrigued. One of the department's most vocal and successful critics had a mole inside Parker Center. There was a traitor inside the gate and it was important to know this. Bosch put the last notebook into his briefcase and wondered if the discoveries he had made through the notes, particularly about Elias's source inside the department, now placed him in the area Janice Langweiser feared might be an infringement of attorney-client privilege. After mulling it over for a few moments, he decided not to go out into the file room and ask her for an interpretation. He moved on with the search. Bosch turned the chair to a side desk that had a personal computer and laser printer set up on it. The machines were off. There were two small drawers in this desk. The top contained the computer keyboard, while the bottom contained office supplies with a single manila file on top. Bosch took out the file and opened it. It contained a color printout of a photo of a partially nude woman. The printout had two crease marks indicating it had been folded at one time. The photo itself did not have the technical quality of those in skin magazines found on the newsstand. There was an amateurish, badly lit quality to it. The woman in the picture was white and had short, white blonde hair. She wore thigh-high leather boots with three-inch heels and a G-string. Nothing else. She stood with her rear to the camera, one foot up on a chair, her face turned mostly away. There was a tattoo of a ribbon and bow at the center of the small of her back. Bosch also saw at the bottom of the picture a notation that had been printed by hand. HTTP colon slash slash www.girlaworld.com slash Gina. Bosch knew little about computers, but he knew enough to understand he was looking at an Internet address. Here's, he called. Ryder was the resident computer expert on his team. Before coming to Hollywood Homicide, she had worked a fraud unit in Pacific Division. A lot of the work she had done was on computers. She walked in from the file room and he waved her over to the desk. How's it going out there? Well, we're just stacking files. She won't let me look through anything until we hear from the special master. I hope Chastain brings back a lot of boxes because we have a... What is that? She was looking at the open file and the printout of the blonde woman. It was in the drawer. Take a look, it's got an address on it. Ryder came around the desk and looked down at the printout. It's a web page. Right. So how do we get to it and take a look? Let me get in there. Bosch got up and Ryder sat in front of the computer. Bosch stood behind the chair and watched as she turned the computer on and waited for it to boot up. 
Let's see what internet provider he's got, she said. Did you see any letterhead around? What? Letterhead? Stationary? Sometimes people put their email address on it. If we know Elias's email address, we're halfway there. Bosch understood now. He hadn't seen any letterhead during his search. Hold on. He went out to the reception room and asked Chastain, who was sitting behind the secretary's desk, if he'd seen any stationery. Chastain opened a drawer and pointed to an open box of letterhead stationery. Bosch grabbed a page off the top. Ryder had been correct. Elias's email address was printed beneath his postal address on the top center of the page. H. Elias at lawyerlink.net Bosch took the page with him back to Elias's office. When he got there, he saw Ryder had closed the file that contained the printout of the blonde woman. Bosch realized it must have been embarrassing to her. I got it, he said. She looked at the page Bosch placed on the desk next to the computer. Good, that's the username. Now we just need his password. He's got the whole computer password protected. Shit. Well, she said as she began typing, most people choose something pretty easy so even they won't forget. She stopped typing and watched the screen. The cursor had turned into an hourglass as it worked. A message then printed across the screen informing Ryder she had used an improper password. What did you use? Bosch asked. His D.O.B.? You did next to Ken, right? What was his wife's name? Millie. Ryder typed it in and after a few seconds got the same rejection message. What about his son? Bosch asked. His name was Martin. Ryder didn't type anything. What's the matter? A lot of these password gates give you three strikes. If you don't get in on the third one, they go into automatic lockdown. Forever? No, for however long Elias would have it set at. Could be fifteen minutes, or an hour, or even longer. Let's think about this for a... V-S-L-A-P-D. Ryder and Bosch turned. Chastain was in the doorway. What? Bosch asked. That's the password. V-S-L-A-P-D. As in Elias versus the L-A-P-D. How do you know that? The secretary wrote it down on the underside of her blotter. Guess she's got to use the computer, too. Bosch studied Chastain for a moment. Harry? Ryder said. Should I? Give it a shot, Bosch said, still looking at Chastain. He then turned and watched as his partner typed in the password. The hourglass blinked on, and then the screen changed and icon symbols began appearing on a field of blue sky and white clouds. We're in, Ryder said. Bosch glanced back at Chastain. Good one. He then looked back at the screen and watched as Ryder hit keys and maneuvered through the icons, files, and programs, all of it meaning little to Bosch and reminding him that he was an anachronism. You really ought to learn this stuff, Harry, Ryder said, seeming to know his thoughts. It's easier than it looks. Why should I when I've got you? What are you doing, anyway? Just having a look around. We'll have to talk to Janice about this. There are a lot of file names corresponding with cases. I don't know if we should open them before... Don't worry about it for now, Bosch interjected. Can you get on the Internet? Ryder made a few more moves with the mouse and then typed the username and password into blanks on the screen. I'm running LawyerLink, she said. Hopefully the same passwords work and we'll be able to go to that naked lady's web page. What naked lady? Chastain said. Bosch picked the file off the desk and handed it unopened to Chastain. He opened it, glanced at the photo, and smirked. Bosch looked back at the screen. Ryder was on LawyerLink, using Elias's username. What's that address? Chastain read it off to her as she typed. She then hit the Enter key and they waited. What this is is a singular web page address within a larger website, she said. What we'll get here is the Gina page. You mean that's her name, Gina? Looks like it. As she said this, the photo from the printout appeared on the screen. Beneath it was information on what the woman in the photo provided and how to contact her. I am Mistress Regina. I am a lifestyle dominatrix providing elaborate bondage, humiliation, forced feminization, slave training, and golden blessings. Other torments available upon request. Call me now. Below the block of information there was a phone number, a pager number, and an email address. Bosch wrote these down in a notebook he took from his pocket. 
He then looked back at the screen and saw there was also a blue button with the letter A on it. He was about to ask Ryder what the button meant when Chastain made a disdainful sound with his mouth. Bosch turned and looked at him, and the internal affairs man shook his head. The bastard was probably getting his rocks off on his knees with this broad, Chastain said. I wonder if Reverend Tuggins and his pals down at the SCCA knew about that. He was referring to an organization called the South Central Churches Association, a group which Tuggins headed, and which always seemed to be at Elias's beck and call when he needed to show the media an image of South Central outrage in regard to alleged police misconduct. We don't know that he ever even met the woman yet, Chastain, Bosch said. Oh, he met her. Why else did he have this laying around? I'll tell you, Bosch, if Elias was into rough trade like that, there's no telling where that could have led. It's a righteous avenue of investigation, and you know it. Don't worry, we'll be checking everything out. You to him, right? We will. Uh, Ryder said, interrupting. There's an audio button. Bosch looked at the screen. Ryder had the arrow poised over the blue button. What do you mean? he asked. I think we can actually hear Mistress Regina. She clicked the arrow on the button. The computer then downloaded an audio program and started playing it. A dark and heavy voice came from the computer's speaker. This is Mistress Regina. If you come to me, I will find the secret of your soul. Together, we will reveal the true subservience through which you will know your rightful identity and attain the release you can find nowhere else. I will mold you into my own. I will own you. I am waiting. Call me now. They were all silent for a long moment. Bosch looked at Chastain. Does it sound like her? Like who? The woman on tape at the apartment? Chastain suddenly realized the possibility and was silent as he thought about this. What tape? Ryder asked. Can you play it again? Bosch asked. Ryder clicked the audio button again and asked about the tape once more. Bosch waited until the replay was over. A woman left a message on the phone at Elias' apartment. It wasn't his wife, but I don't think it was this voice either. He looked at Chastain once more. I don't know, Chastain said. Could be. We'll be able to do a comparison in the lab if we need to. Bosch hesitated, studying Chastain for any indication that he knew the phone message had been erased. He saw nothing. What? Chastain said, uneasy under Bosch's stare. Nothing. Bosch said. He turned back and looked at the computer screen. You said this was part of a larger website, he said to Ryder. Can we look at that? Ryder didn't answer. She just went to work on the keyboard. In a few moments, the screen changed, and they were looking at a graphic which showed a woman's stocking-clad leg bent at the knee and reaching across the screen. Below this, it said, Welcome to girl a whirl a directory of intimate, sensual, and erotic services in Southern California. Below this was a table of contents by which the user could choose listings of women offering a variety of services, from sensual massage to evening escort to female domination. Ryder clicked the mouse on this last offering, and a new screen was revealed featuring boxes with the names of mistresses, followed by an area code prefix. It's a goddamn internet whorehouse, Chastain said. Bosch and Ryder said nothing. Ryder moved the arrow onto the box marked Mistress Regina. This is your directory, she said. You choose which page you want and click. She clicked the mouse and the Regina page appeared again. He chose her, Ryder said. A white woman, Chastain said. There was glee in his voice. Golden blessings from a white woman. I bet they aren't going to be too pleased about that on the south side either. Ryder turned around and looked sharply at Chastain. She was about to say something when her eyes widened and looked past the IAD detective. Bosch noticed this and turned. Standing in the doorway of the office was Janice Langweiser. Next to her was a woman Bosch recognized from her newspaper photos and television appearances. She was an attractive woman with the smooth, coffee and cream skin of mixed races. Wait a minute, Bosch said to Langweiser. This is a crime investigation. She can't come in here and... Yes, Detective Bosch, she can, Langweiser said. Judge Houghton just appointed her special master on the case. She'll be reviewing the files for us. 
With that, the woman Bosch recognized stepped fully into the room, smiled, but not warmly, and held her hand out to him in order to shake his. Detective Bosch, she said, it's good to meet you. I hope we will be able to work together on this. I'm Carla and Trenkin. She waited a beat, but no one responded. She continued. Now, the first thing I am going to need is for you and all of your people to vacate these premises. Twelve. Outside the front doors of the Bradbury, the detectives walked empty-handed to their cars. Bosch was still angry, but was cooler now. He walked slowly, allowing Chastain and Delacroce to get to their car first. As he watched them drive off on their way back up Bunker Hill to California Plaza, he opened the passenger door of Kiz's slickback, but didn't get in. He bent down and looked in at her as she pulled the seatbelt across her lap. You go on up, Kiz. I'll meet you up there. You going to walk it? Bosch nodded and looked at his watch. It was 8.30. I'll take Angel's flight. It should be running again. When you get up there, you know what to do. Start everybody knocking on doors. Okay, see you up there. You going to go back up and talk to her again? And Trenkin? Yeah, I think so. You still have Elias's keys? Yeah. She dug them out of her purse and handed them to Bosch. Is there something I should know about? Bosch paused for a moment. Not yet. I'll see you up there. Ryder started the car. She looked over at him again before putting it into drive. Harry, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. He nodded. It's just the case. First we got Chastain. Asshole's always been able to get to me. Now we've got Carla, I'm thinking. It's bad enough we knew she'd be watching the case. Now she's a part of it. I don't like politics, kids. I just like putting cases together. I'm not talking about all of that. It's like you've been walking on the sun since we met this morning to pick up the cars in Hollywood. You want to talk about it? He almost nodded. Maybe later, kids, he said instead. We got work to do right now. Whatever. But I'm about to get worried about you, Harry. You need to be straight. If you're distracted, then we're distracted, and we aren't going to get anywhere on this thing. That'd be okay most days, but on this one, you just said it yourself. We're under the glass. Bosch nodded again. Her having picked up on his personal turmoil was a testament to her skill as a detective. Reading people was always more important than reading clues. I hear you, kids. I'll straighten up. I copy that. I see you up there. He slapped the roof of the car and watched her drive off, knowing this would be the time he would normally put a cigarette in his mouth. He didn't. Instead, he looked down at the keys in his hand and thought about his next move and how he had to be very careful. Bosch went back into the Bradbury, and as he rode the slow-moving elevator back up, he tumbled the keys in his hand and thought about Entrenkin's three separate entries into the case. First, as a curious listing in Elias's now-missing phone book, then in her capacity as Inspector General, and now finally a full entrance as a player, the special master who would decide what in Elias's files the investigators would be allowed to see. Bosch didn't like coincidences. He didn't believe in them. He needed to know what Entrenkin was doing. He believed he had a good idea what that was, and intended to confirm it before going any further with the case. After being delivered to the top floor, Bosch pushed the button that would send the elevator back down to the lobby and got off. The door to Elias's offices was locked, and Bosch knocked sharply on the glazed glass just below the lawyer's name. In a few moments, Janice Langweiser opened it. Bosch could see Carla and Trenkin standing a few feet behind her. Forget something, Detective Bosch? Langweiser asked. No. But is that your little foreign job down there in the no-park zone? The red one? It was about to get towed. I badged the guy and told him to give me five minutes, but he'll be back. Oh, shit! She glanced back at Entrenkin as she headed out the door. I'll be right back. As she moved by him, Bosch stepped into the office and closed the door behind him. He then locked it and turned back to Entrenkin. Why did you lock that? she asked. Please leave it open. I just thought it might be better if I said what I want to say without anybody interrupting us. And Trenkin folded her arms across her chest as if bracing for an attack. He studied her face and got the same vibe he had gotten before, when she had told them all they had to leave. There was a certain stoicism there, propping her up despite some clear pain beneath. She reminded Bosch of another woman he knew only from TV. 
the Oklahoma law school teacher who was brutalized in Washington by the politicians a few years before, during the confirmation of the Supreme Court justice. Look, Detective Bosch, I really don't see any other way around this. We have to be careful. We have to think about the case as well as the community. The people have to be reassured that everything possible is being done, that this won't be swept under in the manner they have seen so many times before. I want bullshit. Excuse me? You shouldn't be on this case, and we both know it. That's what is bullshit. I have the trust of this community. You think they will believe anything you say about this case? Or Irving or the police chief? But you don't have the trust of the cops. And you've got one big conflict of interest, don't you, Inspector General? What are you saying? I think it was rather wise of Judge Houghton to choose me to act as special master. As Inspector General, I already have a degree of civilian oversight on the case. This just streamlines things instead of adding another person to the mix. He called me. I didn't call him. I'm not talking about that, and you know it. I'm talking about a conflict of interest, a reason you shouldn't be anywhere near this case. And Trenkin shook her head in an I-don't-understand gesture, but her face clearly showed she feared what Bosch knew. You know what I'm saying, Bosch said. You and him, Elias. I was in his apartment. Must have been just before you got there. Too bad we missed each other. We could have settled all of this then. I don't know what you're talking about, but I was just led to believe by Miss Langweiser that you people waited on warrants before entering his apartment and the office. Are you telling me that is not true? Bosch hesitated, realizing he had made a mistake. She could now turn his move away or back on him. We had to make sure no one was hurt or in need of help in the apartment, he said. Sure, right. Just like the cops who jumped the fence at O.J. Simpson's house, just wanting to make sure everybody was okay. She shook her head again. The continued arrogance of this department amazes me. From what I had heard about you, Detective Bosch, I expected more. You want to talk about arrogance? You were the one who went in there and removed evidence. The Inspector General of the Department, the one who polices the police. Now you want to... Evidence of what? I, I did no such thing. You cleared your message off the phone machine and you took the phone book with your name and numbers in it. I'm betting you had your own key and garage pass. You came in through the garage and nobody saw you. Right after Irving called to tell you Elias was dead. Only Irving didn't know that you and Elias had something going on. That's a nice story. I'd like to see you try to prove any of it. Bosch held his hand up. On his palm were Elias's keys. Elias's keys, he said. There's a couple on there that don't fit his house or his apartment or his office or his cars. I was thinking of maybe pulling your address from DMV and seeing if they fit your door, Inspector. And Trenkin's eyes moved quickly away from the keys. She turned and walked back into Elias's office. Bosch followed and watched as she slowly walked around the desk and sat down. She looked as if she might cry. Bosch knew he had broken her with the keys. Did you love him? he asked. What? Did you love... How dare you ask me that? It's my job. There's been a murder. You're involved. She turned away from him and looked to her right. She was staring through the window at the painting of Anthony Quinn. Again, the tears appeared to be barely holding back. Look, Inspector, can we try to remember one thing? Howard Elias is dead. And believe it or not, I want to get the person who did it. Okay? She nodded tentatively. He continued, talking slowly and calmly. In order to get this person, I'm going to need to know everything I can about Elias. Not just what I know from television and newspapers and other cops. Not just from what's in his files. I've got to know... Out in the reception area, someone tried the locked door and then knocked sharply on the glass. And Trenkin got up and went to the door. Bosch waited in Elias's office. He listened as Trenkin answered the door and spoke to Langweiser. Give us a few minutes, please. She closed the door without waiting for a response, locked it again, and came back to Elias's office where she took the seat behind the desk. Bosch spoke to her in a voice low enough not to be heard outside of the office. I've got to know it all, he said. We both know you are in a position to help. So can't we come to some sort of truce here? The first tear fell down in Trenkin's cheek, soon followed by another on the other side. 
She leaned forward and began opening drawers in the desk. Bottom left, Bosch said, from memory of his inventory of the desk. She opened the drawer and removed the box of tissue. She placed it on her lap, took one tissue and dabbed at her cheeks and eyes. She began to speak. <sighs> it's funny how things change so quickly. A long silence went by. I knew how it superficially for a number of years, when I was practicing law. It was strictly professional, mostly how are yous in the hallways of the federal building. Then when I was appointed inspector general, I knew it was important that I knew the critics of the police department as well as I knew the department. I arranged to meet Howard. We met right here, him sitting right here. It went from there. Yes, I loved him. This confession brought more tears, and she pulled out several tissues to take care of them. How long were you two together? Bosch asked. <sighs> About six months. But he loved his wife. He wasn't going to leave her. Her face was dry now. She returned the tissue box to its drawer, and it seemed as though the clouds that had crossed her face moments before were gone. Bosch could see she had changed. She leaned forward and looked at him. She was all business. I'll make a deal with you, Detective Bosch, but only with you. Despite everything, I think if you give me your word, then I can trust you. Thank you. What is your deal? I will only talk to you. In return, I want you to protect me. And by that, I mean keep the source of your information confidential. You don't have to worry. Nothing I tell you would be admitted in court anyway. You can keep everything I tell you in background. It may help you. It may not. Bosch thought about this for a moment. I should be treating you as a suspect, not a source. But you know in your gut that it wasn't me. He nodded. It wasn't a woman's murder, he said. It's got mail written all over it. It's got cop written on it, too, doesn't it? Maybe. That's what I'm going to find out. If I could just get to the case and not have to worry about the community and Parker Center politics and everything else. Then do we have an agreement? Before making any agreement like that, I have to know something first. Elias had a source inside Parker, somebody with high access, somebody who could get him unsustained IAD files. I need... It wasn't me. Believe me, I may have crossed a line when I began a relationship with him. That was my heart, not my head. But I didn't cross the line you are talking about, never in a hundred years. Contrary to what most of your fellow officers think, my goal is to save and improve the department, not destroy it. Bosch looked at her blankly. She took it as disbelief. How would I get him files? I am public enemy number one in that department. If I went in to get files or even just made a request for them, the word would spread around that building and out into the ranks faster than an earthquake wave. Bosch studied her defiant face. He knew she was right. She wouldn't make much of a deep cover source. He nodded. Can we have an agreement? she asked. Yes, with one asterisk. And what is that? If you lie one time to me and I find out about it, all bets are off. That is more than acceptable to me. But we can't talk now. I want to finish the files so that you and your people can pursue all leads. Now you know why I want this case solved, not only for the sake of the city, but for myself. What do you say we meet later when the files are done? Fine with me. As Bosch crossed Broadway fifteen minutes later, he could see the garage doors of the Grand Central Market had been rolled up. It was years since he had been in the market, maybe decades. He decided to cut through it to Hill Street and the Angel's Flight Terminus. The market was a huge conglomeration of food booths, produce stalls, and butcher shops. Vendors sold cheap trinkets and candy from Mexico. And though the doors had just opened and there were more sellers readying for the day than buyers inside, the overwhelming smell of oil and fried food already hung heavy in the air. As he made his way through, Bosch picked up pieces of conversations delivered in staccato snippets of Spanish. He saw a butcher carefully placing the skinned heads of goats on ice in his refrigerated display case next to the neat rows of sliced oxtail. At the far end, old men sat at picnic tables, nursing their cups of thick, dark coffee and eating Mexican pastries. 
Bosch remembered his promise to Edgar to bring donuts before they began the canvas. He looked around and found no donuts, but bought a bag of churros, the crisp fried dough sticks with cinnamon sugar that were the Mexican alternative. As he came out on the Hill Street side of the market, he glanced to his right and saw a man standing in the spot where Baker and Chastain had found the cigarette butt hours earlier. The man had a blood-stained apron wrapped around his waist. He wore a hairnet. He snaked his hand in underneath the apron and came out with a pack of smokes. Got that right, Bosch said out loud. He crossed the street to the Angel's Flight Arch and waited behind two Asian tourists. The train cars were passing each other at the midpoint on the tracks. He checked the names painted above the doors of each car. Sinai was going up, and Olivet was coming down. A minute later, Bosch followed the tourists as they stepped onto Olivet. He watched as they unknowingly sat on the same bench where Catalina Perez had died about ten hours earlier. The blood had been cleaned away, the wood too dark and old to reveal any stain. He didn't bother telling them the recent history of their spot. He doubted they understood his language anyway. Bosch took the spot where he had sat before. He yawned again the moment the weight was off his feet. The car jerked and started its ascent. The Asians started taking photos. Eventually, they got around to using sign language to ask Bosch to take one of their cameras and take photos of them. He obliged, doing his part for the tourist trade. They then quickly took the camera back and moved to the other end of the car. He wondered if they had sensed something about him, a danger or maybe a sickness in him. He knew that some people had that power, that they could tell these things. With him, it would not be difficult. It was twenty-four hours since he had slept. He rubbed a hand across his face, and it felt like damp stucco. He leaned forward, elbows on his knees, and felt the old pain that he had hoped would never be in his life again. It had been a long time since he had felt so alone, since he had felt like such an outsider in his own city. There was a tightness in his throat and chest now, a feeling of claustrophobia like a shroud about him, even in the open air. Once more he got the phone out. He checked the battery display and found it almost dead. Enough juice for one more call, if he was lucky. He punched in the number for home and waited. There was one new message. Fearing the battery wouldn't hold, he quickly punched in the playback code and held the phone back up to his ear. But the voice he heard was not Eleanor's. It was the sound of a voice distorted by cellophane wrapped around the receiver and then perforated with a fork. Let this one go, Bosch. Any man who stands against cops is nothing but a dog and deserves to die like a dog. You do the right thing. You let it go, Bosch. You let it go. 13. Bosch got to Parker Center 25 minutes before he was to meet with Deputy Chief Irving to update him on the investigation. He was alone having left the other six members of the Elias team to conclude the canvas of the apartment building next to Angel's flight and then to pursue their next assignments. Stopping at the front counter, he showed his badge to the uniformed officer, and he told the man that he was expecting some information to be called in anonymously to the front desk within the next half hour. He asked the officer to relay the information to him immediately in Chief Irving's private conference room. Bosch then took an elevator up to the third floor rather than the sixth where Irving's office was located. He went down the hall to the Robbery Homicide Division squad room and found it empty except for four detectives he had called earlier. They were Bates, O'Toole, Angersall, and Rooker, the four detectives who had originally handled the call out to the Angel's Flight murder scene. They looked suitably bleary-eyed, having been up half the night before the case was turned over to Bosch and his squad. Bosch had rousted them from sleep at nine and given them a half hour to meet him at Parker Center. It had been easy enough to get them in so quickly. Bosch had told them their careers depended on it. I don't have a lot of time, Bosch began as he walked down the main aisle between the rows of desks, locking eyes with the four. Three of the detectives were standing around Rooker, who was seated at his desk. This was a clear giveaway. Whatever decisions had been made out at the scene, when it was only the four of them, Bosch was sure were made by Rooker. He was leader of the pack. Bosch stayed standing stopping just outside the informal grouping of the other four. He started telling the story, using his hands in an informal manner, almost like a television news reporter, as if to underline that it was simply a story he was telling, not the threat that he was actually delivering. The four of you get the call out, he said. 
You get out there, push the uniforms back, and make a perimeter. Somebody checks the stiffs, and lo and behold, the DL says one of them is Howard Elias. You then put, There was no driver's license, Bosch, Rooker said, interrupting. Didn't the cap tell you that? Yeah, he told me. But now I'm telling the story. So listen up, Rooker, and shut up. I'm trying to save your ass here, and I don't have a lot of time to do it. He waited to see if anybody wanted to say anything more. So like I said, he began again, looking directly at Rooker, the DL identifies one of the stiffs as Elias. So you four bright guys put your heads together and figure there's a good chance that it was a cop who did this. You figure Elias got what he had coming, and more power to the badge who had the guts to put him down. That's when you get stupid. You decided to help out this shooter, this murderer, by staging the robbery. You took off. Bosh, you are full. I said shut up, Rooker. I don't have the time to hear a bunch of bullshit when you know it went down just like I said. You took off the guy's watch and his wallet, only you fucked up, Rooker. You scratched the guy's wrist with the watch. Post-mortem wound. It's going to come up on the autopsy, and that means you four are going to go down the toilet unless it gets contained. He paused waiting to see if Rooker had anything to say now. He didn't. Okay. Sounds like I have your attention. Anybody want to tell me where the watch and wallet are? Another pause while Bosch looked at his watch. It was a quarter to ten. The four RHD men said nothing. I didn't think so, Bosch said, looking from face to face. So this is what we're going to do. I meet with Irving in fifteen minutes to give him the overview. He then holds the press conference. If the front desk downstairs doesn't get a call with information as to the location of the gutter or trash can or whatever place this stuff was stashed, then I tell Irving the robbery was staged by people at the crime scene and it goes from there. Good luck to you guys then. He scanned their faces again. They showed nothing but anger and defiance. Bosch expected nothing less. Personally, I wouldn't mind it going that way, seeing you people get what you got coming. But it will fuck the case put hair on the cake, taint it beyond repair. So I'm being selfish about it and giving you a chance it makes me sick to give. Bosch looked at his watch. You've got fourteen minutes now. With that, he turned and started heading back out through the squad room. Rooker called after him. Who are you to judge, Bosch? The guy was a dog. He deserved to die like a dog, and who gives a shit? You should do the right thing, Bosch. Let it go. As if it was his intention all along, Bosch casually turned behind an empty desk and came back up a smaller aisle toward the foursome. He had recognized the phrasing of the words Rooker had used. His demeanor disguised his growing rage. When he got back to the group, he broke their informal circle and leaned over Rooker's desk, his palms down flat on it. Listen to me, Rooker. You call my home again, whether it's to warn me off or just tell me the weather, and I'll come looking for you. You don't want that. Rooker blinked, but then raised his hands in surrender. Hey, man, I don't know what the fuck you're talk. Save it for somebody you can convince. At least you could have been a man and skipped the cellophane. That's coward shit, boy. Bosch had hoped that when he got to Irving's conference room, there would be at least a few minutes for him to look at his notes and put his thoughts together. But Irving was already seated at the round table, his elbows on the polished surface, and the fingertips of both hands touching and forming a steeple in front of his chin. Detective, have a seat, he said as Bosch opened the door. Where are the others? Uh, Bosch said, putting his briefcase down flat on the table. They're still in the field. Chief, I was just going to drop my case off, then run down to get a cup of coffee. Can I get you something? No, and you do not have time for coffee. The media calls are starting. They know it was Elias. Somebody leaked. Probably in the coroner's office. So it's about to get crazy. I want to hear what is happening starting right now. I have to brief the police chief who will lead a press conference that has been scheduled for 11. Sit down. Bosch took a seat opposite Irving. He had worked a case out of the conference room once before. That seemed like a long time ago. But he remembered it as the time he had earned Irving's respect and probably as much trust as the deputy chief was willing to give to anyone else who carried a badge. His eyes moved across the surface of the table, and he saw the old cigarette scar that he had left during the investigation of the concrete blonde case. That had been a difficult case, but it seemed almost routine beside the investigation he was involved in now. When are they coming in? Irving asked. He still had his fingers together like a steeple. 
Bosch had read in an interrogation manual that such body language denoted a feeling of superiority. Who? The members of your team, detective. I told you I wanted them here for the briefing and then the press conference. Well, they're not coming in. They are continuing the investigation. I thought that it didn't make sense that all seven of us should just drop things to come in here when one of us could easily tell you the status of things. Bosch watched angry flares of red explode high on Irving's cheeks. Once again, we seem to have either a communication problem or the chain of command remains unclear to you. I specifically told you to have your people here. I must have misunderstood, Chief, Bosch lied. I thought the important thing was the investigation. I remembered that you wanted to be brought up to date, not that you wanted everybody here. In fact, I doubt if there is enough room in here for everybody. I, the point is I wanted them here. Do your partners have phones? Edgar and Ryder. Who else? They have phones, but they're dead. We've been running all night. Mine's dead. Then page them. Get them in here. Bosch slowly got up and headed to the phone, which was on top of the storage cabinet that ran along one wall of the room. He called Ryder and Edgar's pagers, but when he punched in the return number, he added an extra seven at the end. This was a long-standing code they used. The extra seven, as in Code 7, the radio call for out of service, meant they should take their time in returning the pages if they returned them at all. Okay, Chief, Bosch said. Hopefully they'll call in. What about Chastain and his people? Never mind them. I want your team back here by 11 for the press conference. Bosch moved back to his seat. How come? he asked, though he knew exactly why. I thought you said the police chief was going... The chief will lead it, but we want to have a show of force. We want the public to know we have top-notch investigators on this case. You mean top-notch black investigators, don't you? Bosch and Irving held hard stares for a moment. Your job, detective, is to solve this case and solve it as quickly as you can. You are not to concern yourself with other matters. Well, that's kind of hard to do, chief, when you are pulling my people out of the field. Can't solve anything quickly if they've got to be here for every dog and pony show you people cook up. That is enough, detective. They are top-notch investigators, and that's what I want to use them for, not as cannon fodder for the department's race relations. They don't want to be used that way either. That in itself is ra Enough, I said. I do not have time to debate racism, institutional or otherwise, with you, Detective Bosch. We are talking about public perceptions. Suffice it to say that if we mishandled this case or its perceptions from the outside, this city could be burning again by midnight. Irving paused to look at his watch. I meet the police chief in twenty minutes. Could you please begin to enlighten me with the accomplishments of the investigation up to this point? Bosch reached over and opened his briefcase. Before he could reach for his notebook, the phone on the cabinet rang. He got up and went to it. Remember, Irving said, I want them here by eleven. Bosch nodded and picked up the phone. It wasn't Edgar or Ryder, and he had not expected that it would be. This is Cormier downstairs in the lobby. This Bosch? Yeah. You just got a message here. Guy wouldn't give a name. He just said to tell you that what you need is in a trash can in the Metrolink station, first in Hill. It's in a manila envelope. That's it. Okay, thanks. He hung up and looked at Irving. It was something else. Bosch sat back down and took his notebook out of his briefcase, along with the clipboard with the crime scene reports, sketches, and evidence receipts attached to it. He didn't need any of it to summarize the case, but he thought it might be reassuring to Irving to see the accumulation of paper the case was engendering. I'm waiting, detective, the deputy chief said by way of prompting him. Bosch looked up from the paperwork. Where we are is pretty much point zero. We have a good idea what we have. We don't have much of a handle on the who and why. Then what have we got, detective? We're going with Elias being the primary target in what looks like an outright assassination. Irving brought his head down so that his clasped hands hid his face. I know that's not what you want to hear, Chief, but if you want the facts, that's what the facts point to. We have... The last thing Captain Garwood told me was that it looked like a robbery. The man was wearing a thousand-dollar suit, walking through downtown at eleven o'clock at night. His watch and wallet are missing. How can you discount the possibility of a robbery? Bosch leaned back and waited. He knew Irving was venting steam. 
The news Bosch was giving him was guaranteed to put ulcers on his ulcers once the media picked it up and ran. The watch and wallet had been located. They weren't stolen. Where? Bosch hesitated, though he had already anticipated the question. He hesitated because he was about to lie to a superior on the behalf of four men who did not deserve the benefit of the risk he was taking. In his desk drawer at his office, he must have forgotten them when he closed up and headed to his apartment, or maybe he left them on purpose in case he got robbed. Bosch realized he would still need to come up with an explanation in his reports when the autopsy on Elias revealed the post-mortem scratches on his wrist. He would have to write it off to having occurred while the body was being manipulated or moved by the investigators. Then perhaps it was an armed robber who shot Elias when he did not turn over a wallet, Irving said, oblivious to Bosch's internal discomfort. Perhaps it was a robber who shot first and searched for valuables second. The sequence and manner of the shot suggests otherwise. The sequence suggests a personal tie, rage transmitted from one person to Elias. Whoever did this knew Elias. Irving put his hands down on the table and leaned a few inches toward its center. He seemed impatient when he spoke. All I am saying is that you cannot completely eliminate these other possible scenarios. That might be true, but we're not pursuing those scenarios. I believe it would be a waste of time and I don't have the manpower. I told you I wanted a thorough investigation. I want no stone unturned. Well, we'll get to those stones later. Look, Chief, if you are focusing on this so you can tell the media it might be a robbery, then fine. Say it might be. I don't care about what you tell the media. I'm just trying to tell you where we stand and where we're going to be looking. Fine. Proceed. He waved a hand in a dismissive gesture. We need to look at the man's files and draw up lists of potential suspects. The cops who Elias really nailed in court or vilified in the media over the years, or both, the grudges, and the cops he would have tried to nail beginning Monday. Irving showed no reaction at all. It seemed to Bosch he was already thinking about the next hour, when he and the police chief would go out on a cliff and address the media about such a dangerous case. We are being handicapped, Bosch continued. Carla and Trenkin has been appointed by the warrants judge as a special master to oversee the protection of Elias's clients. He's in his office right now and won't let us in. I thought you said you found the man's wallet and watch in the office. I did. That was before Carla showed up and kicked us out. How did she get appointed? She says the judge called her, thought she'd be perfect. She and a deputy from the DA are there. I'm hoping to get the first batch of files this afternoon. Okay. What else? There's something you should know. Before Carla made us leave, we came across a couple things of interest. The first is some notes Elias kept at his desk. I read through them, and there were indications that he had a source in here. Parker Center, I mean. A good source. Somebody who apparently knew how to find and get access to old files. Unsubstantiated IAD investigations. And there were indications of a dispute. The source either couldn't or wouldn't provide something Elias wanted on the Black Warrior thing. Irving went quiet for a second, staring at Bosch, processing. When he spoke again, his voice was more distant still. Is this source identified? Not in what I saw, which wasn't a lot. It was coded. What was it that Elias wanted? Could it be related to the killings? I don't know. If you want me to pursue it as a priority, I will. I was thinking that other things would be the priority. The cops he dragged into court in the past, the ones he was going to pull in starting Monday. Also, there was a <clears throat> second thing we found in the office before we got kicked out. What was that? It actually branches into two more avenues of investigation. He quickly told Irving about the photo printout of Mistress Regina and the indication that Elias might have been involved in what Chastain had called rough trade. The deputy chief seemed to take a keen interest in this aspect of the investigation and asked Bosch what his plans were in regard to pursuing it. I'm planning on attempting to locate and interview the woman, see if Elias ever actually had any contact with her. After that, we see where it goes. And the other branch of investigation this leads to? The family. Whether it was this Regina woman or not, it looks like Elias was a philanderer. There are enough indications in his downtown apartment to suggest this. So if the wife knew about all of this, then we have a motivation right there. Of course, I'm just talking right here. 
At the moment, we have nothing that indicates she even knew, let alone arranged or carried out the kill. It also flies in the face of the psychological read on the killings. Which is what? It doesn't look like the dispassionate work of a hired killer. There is a lot of rage in the killing method. It looks to me like the killer knew Elias and hated him, at least at the moment of the shooting. I would also say it looks like it was a man. How so? The shot up the ass. It was vindictive, like a rape. Men rape, women don't. So my gut instinct tells me this clears the widow. But my instincts have been wrong. It's still something we have to follow up on. There's the son, too. Like I told you before, he reacted pretty hot when we gave him the news. But we really don't know what his relationship with his father was like. We do know that the kid has been around weapons. We saw a picture in the house. Irving pointed a finger of warning at Bosch. You be careful with the family, he said. Very careful. That has to be handled with a lot of finesse. It will be. I do not want that blowing up in our faces. It won't. Irving checked his watch once more. Why have your people not answered the pages? I don't know, Chief. I was just thinking the same thing. Well, page them again. I need to meet with the Chief. At eleven, I want you and your team in the press conference room. I'd rather get back to work on the case. I've got... That is a direct order, Detective, Irving said as he stood. No debate. You won't have to answer questions, but I want your people on hand. Bosch picked up the clipboard and threw it back into his open briefcase. I'll be there, he said, though Irving was already through the door. Bosch sat for a few minutes thinking. He knew Irving would now repackage the information he had given him and deliver it to the police chief. They would put their heads together and then reshape it once more before delivering it to the media. He looked at his watch. He had a half hour until the press conference. He wondered if that was time enough to get over to the Metrolink station, find Elias's wallet and watch, and get back in time. He had to make sure he recovered the dead lawyer's property, particularly because he had already told Irving it was in his possession. Finally, he decided that there wasn't enough time to do it. He decided to use the time to get coffee and to make a phone call. He walked to the cabinet once more and called his house. Once more, the machine picked up. Bosch hung up after hearing his own voice saying, no one was home. 14. Bosch decided he would be too nervous waiting until after the press conference and drove over to the Metrolink station at First and Hill. It was only three minutes away, and he was pretty sure he could make it back to Parker Center for the start of the press conference. He parked illegally at the curb in front of the entrance to the subway platform. It was one of the few good things about driving a slickback. There was no need to worry about parking tickets. As he got out, he removed the baton from the sleeve in the car's door. He trotted down the escalator and spotted the first trash can next to the automatic doors at the entrance to the station. The way he figured it, Rooker and his partner had left the Angels' flight crime scene with the stolen property and stopped at the first spot they knew they would find a trash can. One waited up top with the car, while the other ran down the stairs to get rid of the wallet and watch. So Bosch was confident this first trash can would be the one. It was a large white rectangular receptacle with the Metrolink symbol painted on its sides. A blue hood on top housed the push door. Bosch quickly lifted it off and looked down. The receptacle was full, but there was no manila envelope visible in the debris at the top. Bosch put the hood on the ground and used the baton to stir through the detritus of discarded newspapers, fast food wrappers, and garbage. The can smelled as though it had not been emptied in days, cleaned in months. He came across an empty purse and one old shoe. As he used the baton like an oar to dig deeper, he began to worry that one of the homeless men who populated downtown had beaten him to the can and found the watch and wallet first. Near the bottom, just before he gave up to try one of the cans further into the station, he saw an envelope smeared with catsup and fished it out with two fingers. He tore it open, careful to take most of the catsup with the discarded end, and looked inside at a brown leather wallet and a gold Cartier watch. Bosch used the escalator on the way up, but this time was content to just ride as he looked in the envelope. The watch band was also gold, or gold-plated, and was the accordion style that slipped over the wrist and hand. Bosch bounced the envelope a bit in his hand in order to move the watch without touching it. He was looking for any fragments of skin that might be caught in the band. He saw nothing. Once he was back inside the slickback, he put on gloves, took the wallet and watch out of the torn envelope, and threw the envelope over the seat and to the floor in the back. He then opened the wallet and looked through its partitions. 
Elias had carried six credit cards in addition to identification and insurance cards. There were small studio-posed photos of his wife and son. In the billfold section, there were three credit card receipts and a blank personal check. There was no currency. Bosch's briefcase was on the seat next to him. He opened it and took out the clipboard, then flipped through it until he found the victim's property report. It detailed everything taken from each victim. Only a quarter had been found in Elias's pockets at the time they were searched by a coroner's assistant. You pricks, Bosch said out loud, as he realized that whoever took the wallet had decided to keep whatever cash had been in it. It was unlikely that Elias had been walking to his apartment with only the quarter it would cost him to ride Angel's flight. Once more he wondered why he was sticking his neck out for people who didn't deserve it. He tried to dismiss the thought, knowing that it was too late to do anything about it, but he couldn't. He was a co-conspirator now. Bosch shook his head in disgust with himself and put the watch and wallet into separate plastic evidence bags after labeling each one with a white sticker on which he wrote the case number, the date, and a time of 6.45 a.m. He then wrote a brief description of each item and the drawer of Elias's desk in which it was found, initialed the corner of each sticker, and put the bags into his briefcase. Bosch looked at his watch before starting the car. He had ten minutes to make it to the press conference room. No sweat. There were so many members of the media attending the press conference that several were standing outside the door to the police chief's press room, unable to find space inside. Bosch pushed and excused and squeezed his way through them. Inside, he saw the backstage was lined wall to wall with television cameras on tripods, their operators standing behind them. He quickly counted twelve cameras and knew that the story would soon go national. There were eight television stations carrying local news in Los Angeles, including the Spanish language channel. Every cop knew that if you saw more than eight camera crews at a scene or a press conference, then you were talking network attention. You were working something huge, something dangerous. In the middle of the room, every folding chair was taken by a reporter. There were close to forty, with the TV people clearly identifiable in their nice suits and makeup, and the print and radio people just as recognizable as the ones wearing jeans and with ties pulled loose at the neck. Bosch looked to the front stage and saw a flurry of activity around the podium, which had the LAPD chief's badge affixed. Sound men were taping their equipment to the ever-widening tree of microphones on the podium. One of them was standing directly behind the podium and giving a voice check. Behind and to the side of the podium stood Irving, conferring in whispers with two men in uniform, both wearing lieutenant's stripes. Bosch recognized one of them as Tom O'Rourke, who worked in the media relations unit. The other Bosch did not recognize, but assumed he was Irving's adjutant, Michael Tulin, whose call had awakened Bosch just hours earlier. A fourth man stood on the other side of the podium by himself. He wore a gray suit, and Bosch had no idea who he was. There was no sign of the police chief. Not yet. The police chief did not wait for the media to get ready. The media waited for him. Irving spotted Bosch and signaled him to the front stage. Bosch walked up the three steps, and Irving put a hand on his shoulder to usher him into a private huddle out of earshot of the others. Where are your people? I haven't heard back from them. That is not acceptable, detective. I told you to get them in here. All I can say, chief, is that they must be in the middle of a sensitive interview. Didn't want to break the momentum of the situation to call back on my pages. They're re-interviewing Elias' wife and his son. It takes a lot of finesse, especially in a case like, I am not interested in that. I wanted them here, period. At the next press conference, you have them here, or I will split your team up and send you to three divisions so far apart you will have to take a vacation day to have lunch together. Bosch studied Irving's face for a moment. I understand, Chief. Good. Remember it. Now we are about to get started here. O'Rourke is going now to get the chief and escort him in. You will not be answering any questions. You do not have to worry about that. Then why am I here? Can I go? Irving looked as though he was finally about to curse for the first time in his career, maybe his life. His face was turning red and the muscles of his powerful jaw were at full flex. You are here to answer any questions from me or the chief of police. You can leave when I dismiss you. Bosch raised his arms in a hands-off fashion and took a step back against the wall to wait for the show to begin. Irving stepped away and conferred briefly with his adjutant and then walked over to the man in the suit. Bosch looked out into the audience. 
It was hard to see because the overhead TV lights were on, but past the glare he managed to pick out a few faces he knew either personally or from TV. When his eyes finally came to Keisha Russell's, he attempted to look away before the Times reporter saw him, but was too late. Their eyes briefly caught and held, then she nodded once, almost unnoticeably. Vosh did not nod back. He didn't know who might pick up on it. It was never good to acknowledge a reporter in public, so he just held her gaze for a few moments longer and then looked away. The door to the side of the stage opened, and O'Rourke came through and turned so that he could then hold the door open for the chief of police, who entered the room wearing a charcoal gray suit and with a somber look on his face. O'Rourke stepped to the podium and leaned down to the microphone tree. He was much taller than the police chief, for whom the microphones had been set. Everybody ready? Though a couple of cameramen from the back called out, No! and Not yet! O'Rourke ignored them. The chief has a brief statement about today's events, and then he'll field a few questions. But only general details of the case will be released at this time because of the ongoing investigation. Deputy Chief Irving is also here to field questions. Let's maintain some order and we'll get through this quickly and smoothly and everybody will get what they need. Chief? O'Rourke stepped aside and the Chief of Police stepped to the podium. He was an impressive man. Tall, black, and handsome. He had spent thirty years on the job in the city and was a skilled media man. He was, however, new to the Chief's post, chosen for the job just the summer before after his predecessor, an overweight outsider with no feel for the department and little feel for the community, was dumped in favor of the insider who was striking enough to play himself in a Hollywood movie. The chief gazed out silently at the faces in the room for a moment. The vibe Bosch picked up was that this case and how he handled it would be the chief's first true test in the job. He was sure the chief had picked up the vibe as well. Good morning, the chief finally said. I have disturbing news to report today. The lives of two citizens were taken late last night here in downtown. Catalina Perez and Howard Elias were riding separately on the Angels Flight Railroad when they were each shot and killed shortly before 11 o'clock. Most people in this city know of Howard Elias. Revered or not, he was a man who nevertheless was a part of our city, who helped mold our culture. On the other hand, Catalina Perez, like so many of us, was not a famous person or a celebrity. She was just struggling to make a living so that she and her family, a husband and two young children, could live and prosper. She worked as a housekeeper. She worked long days and nights. She was going home to her family when she was slain. I am simply here this morning to assure our citizens that these two murders will not go unanswered or forgotten. You can be assured that we will be working tirelessly on this investigation until we achieve justice for Catalina Perez and Howard Elias. Bosch had to admire what the chief was doing. He was packaging both victims as a set, making it seem implausible that Elias was the sole target and Perez just an unlucky traveler in the crossfire. He was slickly attempting to portray them as equal victims of the senseless and often random violence that was the city's cancer. At this point we can't go into too many details because of the investigation, but it can be said that there are leads being followed and we have every belief and hope that the killer or killers will be identified and brought to justice. In the meantime, we ask that the good citizens of Los Angeles remain calm and allow us to do our job. What we need to guard against at this time is jumping to conclusions. We don't want anyone to get hurt. The department, either through me or Deputy Chief Irving or the Media Relations Office, will be providing regular updates on the progress of the case. Information will be provided when it can be released without being detrimental to the investigation or eventual prosecution of suspects. The chief took a half step back from the podium to look at O'Rourke, a signal that he was finished. O'Rourke made a move toward the podium, but before he had raised a foot there was a loud chorus from the audience of reporters yelling, Chief! And above this din came the deeply resonant voice of one reporter, 
a voice recognizable to Bosch and everyone else with a television as belonging to Channel 4's Harvey Button. Did a cop kill Howard Elias? The question caused a momentary pause, then the chorus continued. The chief stepped back to the podium and raised his hands as if trying to calm a pack of dogs. Okay, hold on a second. I don't want everybody yelling at me. One at a, did a cop do this, chief? Can you answer that or not? It was Button again. This time the other reporters remained silent, and in doing so fell in behind him, their silence demanding that the chief address the question. It was, after all, the key question. The entire press conference boiled down to one question and one answer. At this time, I cannot answer that. The case is under investigation. Of course, we all know how it Elias's record with this department. It would not be good police work if we did not look at ourselves, and we will do that. We are in the process of doing that. But at this point, we... Sir, how can the department investigate itself and still have credibility with the community? Button again. That's a good point, Mr. Button. First off, the community can be assured that this investigation will reach its fruition no matter where it leads. The chips will fall where they may. If a police officer is responsible, then he or she will be brought to justice. I guarantee it. Secondly, the department is being aided in this investigation by Inspector General Carla Entrenkin, who, as you all know, is a civilian observer who reports directly to the police commission, the city council, and mayor. The chief raised his hand to cut off another question from Button. I'm not finished, Mr. Button. As I said, lastly, I would like at this time to introduce Assistant Special Agent in Charge Gilbert Spencer from the Los Angeles Field Office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I have discussed this crime and this investigation with Mr. Spencer at length, and he has agreed to bring the Bureau in to help us. Beginning tomorrow, FBI agents will be working side-by-side side with LAPD detectives in a group effort to bring this investigation to a swift and successful conclusion. Bosch tried to show no response as he listened to the chief announce the FBI involvement. He was not shocked by it. He realized it was a good move by the chief and might buy some time in the community. They might even get the case solved, though that was probably a secondary condition in the chief's decision-making. He was primarily trying to put out fires before they started. The Bureau was a pretty good hose with which to do that. But Bosch was annoyed that he had been left out of the loop and was finding out about the Bureau's entry into his case at the same time as Harvey Button and everybody else. He glanced over at Irving, who picked it up on his radar and looked back. They traded glares until Irving looked away to the podium as Spencer took a position behind the microphones. I don't have much to say yet, the bureau man said. We will be assigning a team to the investigation. These agents will work with the LAPD detectives, and it is our belief that together we will break this case quickly. Will you be investigating the officers in the Black Warrior case? A reporter called out. <clears throat> we will be taking a look at everything, but we are not going to be sharing our investigative strategy at this time. From this point, all media inquiries and releases will be handled through the LAPD. The Bureau will... Under what authority is the FBI entering the case? Button asked. Under civil rights codes, the Bureau has the authority to open an investigation to determine if an individual's rights have been violated under color of law. The color of law? by an officer of the law. I'm going to turn this over to... Spencer stepped back from the podium without finishing. He clearly didn't enjoy being in the glare of the media's headlights. The police chief stepped back into place and introduced Irving, who then moved behind the podium and began reading a press release which contained more details of the crime and the investigation. It was still just the basics, nothing anybody could do much with. The statement also mentioned Bosch by name as the detective in charge of the investigation. It also explained why potential conflict of interest with the RHD and scheduling problems with Central Division detectives required a team from Hollywood Division to run the case. Irving then said he could field a few questions, reminding the reporters once again that he would not compromise the investigation by revealing vital information. Can you talk more about the focus of the investigation? A reporter called out ahead of the others. The focus is wide-ranging. We are looking at everything from police officers who might have held a grudge against Howard Elias 
to the possibility of the killings being part of a robbery. We... A follow-up, another reporter barked, knowing that you had to get your question in before the subject finished the last one, or you'd never be heard in the ensuing cacophony. Was there anything at the crime scene to indicate a robbery? We are not going to discuss details of the crime scene. My information is that there was no watch or wallet on the body. Bosch looked at the reporter. He was not a TV man. Bosch could tell that by his rumpled suit. And it did not appear that he was from the Times, because Keisha Russell was already in the room. Bosch didn't know who he was, but he had obviously been leaked the information on the watch and wallet. Irving paused as if deciding on how much to reveal. Your information is correct but incomplete. Mr. Elias apparently left his watch and wallet in his desk when he left his office last night. The property was found there today. Of course, that does not preclude attempted robbery as a motive for this crime, but it is too early in the investigation and we know too little to make such an assumption at this time. Keisha Russell, ever the cool one, had not joined the shouting for attention. She sat calmly with her hand raised, waiting for the others to run out of things to ask and for Irving to call on her. After Irving fielded a few more repetitive questions from the TV people, he finally called on her. You said Mr. Elias's property was found in his office today. Have you searched his office, and, if so, what, if anything, is being done to safeguard the attorney-client privilege that Mr. Elias shared with his clients, all of whom are suing the agency that conducted the search of the office? Good question. We have not conducted a full search of the victim's office for the very reason you just mentioned. That is where Inspector General Entrenkin comes into play. She is reviewing files in the victim's office and will turn them over to investigators after she has vetted them for any sort of sensitive information that could possibly fall under attorney-client privilege. This review process was ordered earlier today by the judge who issued search warrants for Howard Elias's office. My understanding is that the watch and wallet were found in or on the victim's desk, very much as if he had simply forgotten them last night when he left work. Now, I think that will wrap things up here. We have an investigation to focus on. When there are any further updates, we will... One last one, Russell called out. Why has the department gone to 12 and 12s? Irving was about to answer, but then looked back at the chief of police, who nodded and stepped back to the podium. We want to be ready for any eventuality. Going to 12-hour shifts puts more officers on the street at any given time. We believe the citizens of this city will remain calm and give us time to conduct our investigation, but as a safety precaution I have instituted a readiness plan that includes all officers working 12 hours on and 12 hours off until further notice. Is this the civil disorder response plan that was drawn up after the last riots? Russell asked. When the department was caught flat-footed because it had no plan? It is the plan drawn in 1992, yes. He was about to step away from the podium when Russell tossed another curveball. Then you are expecting violence. It was said as a statement, not a question. The chief returned to the microphones. No, Miss uh, Russell, I am not expecting that. As I said, this is merely precautionary. I am expecting the citizens of this community to act in a calm and responsible manner. Hopefully, the media will act in the same way. He waited for one more response from Russell, but this time got none. O'Rourke moved forward and leaned in front of the chief to get to the microphones. Okay, that's it. There will be copies of Chief Irving's statement down in media relations in about 15 minutes. As the reporters slowly filed out of the room, Bosch kept his eyes on the man who had asked the question about the wallet and watch. He was curious to know who he was and what news outlet he worked for. At the log jam at the door, the confluence of people brought the man side by side with Button, and they started talking. Bosch thought this was odd, because he had never seen a print reporter give a TV reporter the time of day. Detective? Bosch turned. The chief of police was standing to his side with his hand out. Bosch instinctively shook it. He had spent nearly twenty-five years in the department to the chief's thirty, yet they had never crossed paths close enough to speak to each other, let alone shake hands. Chief, good to meet you. I want you to know how much we are counting on you and your team. If you need anything, don't hesitate to contact my office or to go through Deputy Chief Irving. Anything. Well, at the moment I think we're okay. 
I appreciate the heads up on the bureau, though. The chief hesitated, but only for a moment, apparently discarding Bosch's gripe as unimportant. That couldn't be helped. I wasn't sure the Bureau was going to become involved until shortly before we started the press conference. The chief turned and looked for the FBI man. Spencer was talking with Irving. The chief signaled them over and introduced Bosch to Spencer. Bosch thought he caught a glimmer of disdain on Spencer's face. Bosch did not have a positive record over the years in his dealings with the FBI. He had never dealt directly with Spencer, but if he was assistant special agent in charge of the L.A. field office, then he had probably heard of Bosch. How are we going to work this, gentlemen? The chief asked. I'll have my people assembled in here at eight tomorrow morning, if you like, Spencer said. Excellent. Chief Irving? Yes, that will be fine. We will be working out of the conference room next to my office. I'll have our team there at eight. We can go over what we've got and take it from there. Everybody nodded except for Bosch. He knew he had no say in the matter. They broke up and headed toward the door the chief had come through. Bosch found himself next to O'Rourke. He asked him if he knew who the reporter was who asked about the watch and wallet. Tom Cheney. It almost rang a bell with Bosch, but not quite. He's a reporter? Not really. He was with the Times a lot of years ago, but now he's TV. He's Harvey Button's producer. He's not pretty enough to go on camera, so they pay him a ton of money to get scoops for Harvey and to tell him what to say and ask, to make him look good. Harvey's got the face and that voice. Cheney's got the brains. Why do you ask? Is there something I can do for you? No, I was just wondering. You mean the question about the wallet and the watch? Well, like I said, Cheney's been around. He's got sources. More than most. They moved through the doorway, and Bosch turned left to head back to Irving's conference room. He wanted to leave the building, but didn't want to wait for an elevator with all of the reporters. Irving was waiting for him in the conference room. He was sitting in the same spot he had taken before. Sorry about the bureau deal, he said. I did not know about it until right before. It was the chief's idea. So I heard. It's probably the smart play. He was quiet for a moment, waiting for Irving to make the next move. So what I want you to do is have your team finish up the interviews they are involved in now, then everybody gets a good night's sleep, because tomorrow it all starts again. Bosch had to stop himself from shaking his head no. You mean just shelve everything until the Bureau shows up? Chief, this is a homicide. A double homicide. We can't just shut it down and start over tomorrow. I am not talking about shutting anything down. I said finish up what you have going at the moment. Tomorrow we will retrench and regroup and create a new battle plan. I want your people fresh and ready to run. Fine, whatever. But Bosch had no intention of waiting for the Bureau. His intention was to continue the investigation, drive it forward, and then follow where it led. It didn't matter what Irving said. Can I get a key to this room? Bosch asked. We should get the first batch of files from Entrenkin in a little while. We need a secure place for them. Irving shifted his weight and reached into his pocket. He removed a key that was unattached to a ring and slid it across the table. Bosch picked it up and started working it onto his own key ring. So how many people have a copy of this, he said. Just so I know. You don't have to worry, detective. No one will be going into this room who is not a member of the team or does not have my permission. Bosch nodded even though Irving had not answered his question. 15. As Bosch stepped through the glass doors of Parker Center, he saw the beginning of the manufacturing and packaging of a media event. Spread out across the front plaza were a half-dozen television crews and reporters ready to transmit stand-up reports as lead-in on the footage from the press conference. Out at the curb was the microwave forest, a line of TV trucks with their microwave transmitters raised high and ready. It was a Saturday, normally the slowest news day of the week, but the murder of Howard Elias was big, the guaranteed lead story and then some, a Saturday morning assignment editor's dream come true. The local stations were going to go live at noon, and then it would begin. The news of Elias's murder would blow through the city like the hottest Santa Ana wind, setting nerves on edge and possibly turning silent frustrations into loud and malevolent actions. The department and the city, for that matter, was relying on how these young and beautiful people interpreted and delivered the information they had been given. The hope was that their reports would not fan the already smoldering tensions in the community. The hope was that they would show restraint and integrity and common sense. 
that they would simply report the known facts without any speculation or editorial twisting of the knife. But Bosch knew those hopes had about as much chance as Elias had when he stepped onto Angel's flight little more than twelve hours before. Bosch took an immediate left and headed to the employee parking lot, careful not to walk into view of any of the cameras. He didn't want to be on the news on those absolutely necessary. He successfully avoided detection and got to his car. Ten minutes later, he parked illegally in front of the Bradbury, pulling in behind yet another TV truck. He looked around as he got out, but didn't see the news crew. He guessed that they had walked over to the Angels' flight terminus to tape footage for the story. After taking the old elevator up to the top floor, Bosch pulled back the gate and stepped out onto the landing, only to be met by Harvey Button, his producer, and a cameraman. There was an uneasy silence as he tried to move around them. Then the producer spoke. Uh, Detective Bosch, I'm Tom Chaney from Channel 4. Good for you. I was wondering if we could talk for a few moments about the... No, we can't talk. Have a nice day. Bosch managed to get around them and started toward Elias' office. Chaney spoke to his back. You sure? We're picking up a lot of information, and it would probably do us both a lot of good if we could get it confirmed. We don't want to cause you any problems. It would be better if we could work as a team, you know. Bosch stopped and looked back at him. No, I don't know, he said. If you want to put unconfirmed information on the air, that's your choice. But I'm not confirming anything, and I already have a team. He turned without waiting for a reply and headed toward the door with Howard Elias's name on it. He heard nothing else from Cheney or Button. When he walked into the office, he found Janice Langweiser sitting behind the secretary's desk, looking through a file. Next to the desk, there were three cardboard boxes full of files that weren't there before. Langweiser looked up. Detective Bosch? Hey, these boxes for me? She nodded. The first batch, and hey, that wasn't very nice what you did before. What? Telling me my car was being towed? That was a lie, wasn't it? Bosch had completely forgotten. Uh, no, not really, he said. You were in a towaway zone, they would have gotten you. He smiled when he knew she knew it was a bullshit cover-up. His face started turning red. Look, <clears throat> I had to talk to Inspector Entrenkin alone. I'm sorry. Before she could say anything, Carla Entrenkin looked in from the room next door. She, too, was holding a file in her hand. Bosch pointed to the three boxes on the floor. Looks like you're making some progress. I hope so. Can I talk to you for a moment in here? Sure, but first, did Channel 4 come in here and try to talk to you too? They did, Langweiser said, and Channel 9 was here before them. Did you talk to them? Langweiser's eyes darted momentarily toward Entrinken and then down at the floor. She said nothing. I gave a brief statement, Entrinken said. Something innocuous, just explaining my role. Can we talk in here? She stepped back from the doorway, and Bosch entered the file room. There was another cardboard box on the desk that was half full of files, and Trenkin closed the door after Bosch entered. She then threw the file she was holding on the clerk's desk, folded her arms, and put a stern expression on her face. What is it? Bosch asked. Tom Cheney just told me that it was announced at the press conference that how... Mr. Elias had left his wallet and watch in his office, in his desk. And I thought that when you people were asked to leave this morning, it was clear that... I'm sorry, I forgot. Bosch put his briefcase down on the desk and opened it. He lifted out the evidence bags containing the wallet and watch. I had already bagged them and put them in my case before you came in this morning. I forgot about it and left with them. You want me to put it all back where I found it? No. I just wanted an explanation. And I'm not sure I believe the one you just offered. There was a long silence while they stared at each other. Was that all you wanted to talk to me about? Bosch finally asked. She turned back to the desk and the file she had been looking through. I thought our relationship would be better than this. Look, Bosch said as he closed the briefcase, you've got your secrets. You've got to give me mine. The bottom line is Howard Elias wasn't robbed, so we move on from there, okay? If you are telling me that there were people involved in this investigation who were attempting to tamper with evidence, then I'm not telling you anything. He saw anger flare in her eyes. They shouldn't be a part of this department. You know that. That's another battle for another day. I've got more important... You know there are some people who might think there is nothing more important than a police department in which there is no question about the integrity of its members. 
Sounds like you're giving a press conference, Inspector. I'm going to take those files now. I'll be back for the next batch later. He started to turn back to the front room. I just thought you were different, that's all, she said. He turned back to her. You don't know if I'm different because you don't know the first thing about me. I'll talk to you later. There's something else missing. Bosch stopped and looked back at her. What? Howard Elias was a consummate note-taker. He kept a spiral notebook on his desk or with him all the time. His last notebook is missing. You know where that is? Bosch came back to the desk and reopened his briefcase. He took the notebook out and tossed it down. You won't believe me, but I had already put that in my briefcase when you came in and kicked us out. Matter of fact, I do believe you. Did you read it? Parts of it. Also, before you showed up. She looked at him for a long moment. I'll look through it, and if it is okay, you will have it back later today. Thank you for returning it. You're welcome. By the time Bosch got to Philippe's, the original, the others were already there and eating. They had one of the long tables in the back room and were by themselves. He decided to take care of business before waiting in one of the lines at the counter to order. How'd it go? Ryder asked as he stepped over the bench and sat next to her. Well, I think I definitely was a little too pale for Irving's liking. Well, fuck him, Edgar said. I didn't sign up for this shit. Me too, Ryder said. What are you talking about? Chastain asked. Race relations, Ryder said. Typical, you can't figure that out. Hey, I... Never mind, Bosch interjected. Let's talk about the case, okay? You first, Chastain. Did you finish the apartment building? Yeah, we finished. Nothing. Except we found out about the woman, Fuentes said. Oh, yeah, right. What woman? The other victim, Catalina Perez. It... Yeah, hold on a second. Chastain reached down to the bench next to him and came up with a legal tablet. He flipped to the second page and looked at the notes. Uh, apartment 909, Perez was the cleaning woman. Came every Friday night, so that's where she was coming from. But she was going up, Bosch said. She didn't work till 11? No, this is the deal. She works 6 to 10.30, then takes Angel's flight down to the bus stop, catches the bus and goes home. Only on the way down, she must have looked in her purse and noticed her notebook, where she keeps her schedule and phone numbers, is missing. She took it out in the apartment last night because her employer, a Mr. D. H. Riley, changed his phone number and gave her the new one. Only she left the notebook on his kitchen table. She had to go back for it so she'd know her schedule. This lady... He reached to the bench again and pulled up the notebook. It was in a plastic evidence bag. I mean, I looked at the schedule. She worked her tail off. She's got gigs every day and a lot of nights. This Riley guy said Friday nights was the only regular night he could get her for. She did a good job. So she was going back up to get her book when she got popped, Edgar said. Looks that way. The old I.O.I.A., Ryder said in a sing-song way that was not mirthful in any way. What's that? Chastain asked. Nothing. They were all silent for a long moment. Bosch was thinking about how leaving that notebook behind had cost Catalina Perez her life. He knew that what Ryder had said referred to the iniquities of it all, a phrase she began using after a year on the homicide squad to sum up the bad breaks, coincidences, and twists of fate that often left people dead. Okay, good, Bosch finally said. We now know what everybody was doing on that train. The rest of the building was clean. Nobody heard a thing, nobody saw a thing, Chastain said. You get everybody? No response at four apartments, but they were all on the other side, away from Angel's flight. All right, let those go for now. Kiz, you talk to the wife and son again? Ryder was chewing her last bite of French dip sandwich and held her finger up until she swallowed. Uh, yeah, separately and together. Nothing pulled my trigger. They're both pretty much convinced the cop did it. I didn't... Of course they are, Chastain interjected. Let her talk, Bosch said. I didn't pick up any feel that they knew much about his cases or possible threats. He didn't even keep a home office. I touched on Eliza's fidelity, and Millie said she believed he was faithful. She said it like that. She believed. Something about it sounds wrong. I think if there was no doubt, she would say he was faithful, not that she believed he was faithful. Know what I mean? So you think she knew? Maybe. But I also think that if she knew, then she was the type that would put up with it. 
There was a lot of social standing in being Howard Elias's wife. Lots of wives in that position make choices. They look the other way on some things to keep the image intact, to keep the life they have intact. What about the son? I think he believed his father was a god. He's hurting. Bosch nodded. He respected Ryder's interviewing skills. He had seen her in action and knew she was empathic. He also knew he had used her in a way not so dissimilar to the way Irving had wanted to use her during the press conference. He had sent her to do the follow-up interviews because he knew she would be good at it, but also because she was black. You asked them the A question? Yeah, they were both at home last night. Neither went out. They're each other's alibi. <laughs> Great, Chastain said. Okay, kids, Bosch said. Anybody else got something they want to bring up? Bosch leaned forward on the table so he could look down his side and see every face. No one said anything. He noticed everybody had finished eating their sandwiches. Well, I don't know if you've heard anything about the press conference, but the chief called in the cavalry. Tomorrow morning, the bureau enters the case. We have a meet at eight in Irving's conference room. Shit, Chastain said. What the hell are they going to do that we can't? Edgar asked. Probably nothing, Bosch said. But his announcing it at the press conference will probably go a long way toward keeping the peace, at least for now. Anyway, let's worry about that tomorrow and we see how things shake out. We still have the rest of today. Irving gave me an unofficial cease and desist until the agents show up, but that's bullshit. I say we keep working. Yeah, we don't want the shark to drown, do we? Chastain said. That's right, Chastain. Now, I know nobody's had much sleep. My thinking is that some of us keep working and knock off early. Some of us go home, take a nap, and come back in fresh tonight. Any problem with that? Again, no one said anything. All right, this is how we break it up. I've got three boxes of files from Elias's office in my trunk. I want you IAD guys to take them and go back to Irving's conference room. You take the files, pull out names of cops and anybody else to be checked out. I want a chart made up. When we get legit alibis, we scratch the names off the chart and move on. I want this ready by the time the Bureau arrives tomorrow. When you have it done, then you guys can knock off for the night. And what are you going to be doing? Chastain asked. We're going to run down Elias' secretary and his clerk. Then, after that, I'm going home to take a nap. Hopefully. Then tonight, we're going to talk to Harris and chase down that Internet thing. I want to know what that's all about before the Bureau comes in. You better be careful with Harris. We will. That's one reason we're waiting until tonight. We play it right and the media doesn't even find out we talked to the guy. Chastain nodded. What about these files you've given us, the old or new? They're old ones, and Chenkin started on the closed cases. When are we going to see the Black Warrior file? That's the one. The rest of this is bullshit. Hopefully I'll be picking that up later today. But the rest isn't bullshit. We have to look at every damn file in that office because the one we skip is likely to be the one some lawyer shoves up our ass in trial. You understand that? Don't skip anything. I got it. Besides, what do you care so much about the Black Warrior file for? You cleared those guys on it, right? Yeah, so? So what are you going to find in the file other than what you already know? You think you missed something, Chastain? No, but... But what? It's the case at the moment. I think there's got to be something there. Well, we'll see. All in good time. For now, stick to the old files and don't skip anything. I told you we won't. It's just a pain in the ass to know you're wasting time. Welcome to homicide. Yeah, yeah. Bosch reached into his pocket and pulled out a small brown bag. It contained several copies of the key Irving had given him that he had had made in Chinatown on his way to the restaurant. He turned the bag over on the center of the table and keys clattered onto the table. Everybody take a key. They'll open the door to Irving's conference room. Once the files are in there, I want the room locked at all times. Everybody reached to the center of the table and took a key, except Bosch. He had already put the original on his key ring. He stood up and looked at Chastain. Let's go get those files out of my car. 16. The interviews with the secretary and the clerk were so uneventful that Bosch wished the detectives could have spent the time in their beds sleeping. Tyler Quimby, the secretary, had been out with the flu and holed up in her home in the Crenshaw district for the last week. She had no knowledge of Howard Elias' activities during the days before his death. Aside from exposing Bosch, Edgar, and Ryder to the flu, she gave the detectives very little. 
She explained that Elias kept his case strategies and other aspects of his work largely to himself. Her role was primarily opening mail, answering phones, handling walk-in visitors and clients, and paying the office expenses through a small operating account Elias put money into each month. As far as the phone traffic went, she said Elias had a direct, private phone line in his office that over the years had become widely known among friends and associates, as well as some reporters and even enemies. So she was of little use as far as helping them determine whether Elias had been specifically threatened in the weeks before his murder. The investigators thanked her and left her home, hoping they would not fall victim to her illness. The clerk, John Babineau, was in equal disappointment. He was able to confirm that it had been he and Michael Harris who had worked until late Friday with Elias, but Babineau said that Harris and Elias had been behind closed doors most of the evening. Babineau, as it turned out, had graduated from the USC Law School three months before and was studying for the bar exam at night while clerking for Elias by day. He did his studying in Elias's offices at night because it allowed him access to the law books he needed for memorizing case law and penal codes. It obviously was a better study environment than the crowded apartment near USC he shared with two other law students. Shortly before 11, he had walked out with Elias and Harris because he had felt he had done enough studying for one night. He said he and Harris walked to their cars in a nearby pay lot while Elias walked up 3rd Street alone toward Hill Street and Angel's Flight. Like Quimby, Babineau described Elias as secretive about his cases and preparation for trial. The clerk said that his responsibility in the last week of work had largely been preparing the transcripts of the many pre-trial depositions taken in the Black Warrior case. His job was to download the transcripts and related material onto a laptop computer, which would then be taken to court and accessed by Elias when he needed specific references to evidence and testimony during trial. Babineau could give the detectives no information about specific threats to Elias, at least none that the attorney was taking seriously. He described Elias as extremely upbeat in recent days. He said Elias wholeheartedly believed that he was going to win the Black Warrior case. He said it was a slam dunk, Babineau told the three detectives. As Bosch drove up Woodrow Wilson Drive toward home, he thought about the two interviews and wondered why Elias had been so secretive about the case he was bringing to trial. This didn't fit with his past history of press leaks and sometimes full-scale press conferences as a primary strategy. Elias was being uncharacteristically quiet, yet he was confident in his case, enough to call it a slam dunk. Bosch hoped the explanation of this would be revealed when he got the Black Warrior file from Entrinken, hopefully in a few hours. He decided to put thoughts of it aside until then. Immediately, Eleanor came to mind. He thought about the closet in the bedroom. He purposely hadn't checked it before, not sure how he would react if he found she had taken her clothes. He decided he needed to do that now, to get it over with. It would be a good time to do it. He was too tired now to do anything other than crash down onto his bed, regardless of what he found. But as he came around the last curve, he saw Eleanor's car, the beat-up Taurus, parked at the curb in front of their house. She had left the carport open for him. He felt the muscles in his neck and shoulders begin to relax. The tightness in his chest began to ease. She was home. The house was quiet when he entered. He put his briefcase down on one of the dining room chairs and started stripping off his tie as he moved into the living room. He then moved down the short hallway and looked into the bedroom. The curtains were drawn and the room was dark except for the outline of exterior light around the window. He saw Eleanor's still form under the covers on the bed. Her brown hair was splayed over the pillow. He moved into the bedroom and quietly took off his clothes, draping them over a chair. He then went back down the hallway to the guest bathroom to take a shower without waking her up. Ten minutes later, he slid into the bed next to her. He was on his back, looking through the darkness to the ceiling. He listened to her breathing. He didn't hear the slow, measured breaths of her sleeping that he was used to. You awake? he whispered. Mm-hmm. He waited a long moment. Where were you, Eleanor? Hollywood Park. Bosch didn't say anything. He didn't want to accuse her of lying. Maybe Jardine, the security guy, had simply missed her during his survey of the video screens. He stared at the ceiling, wondering what to say next. I know that you called there looking for me, Eleanor said. I knew Tom Jardine in Las Vegas. He used to work at the Flamingo. 
He lied when you called. He came to me first. Bosch closed his eyes and remained silent. I'm sorry, Harry. I just didn't want to have to deal with you then. Deal with me. You know what I mean. Not really, Eleanor. How come you didn't answer my message when you got home? What message? Bosch realized he had played the message back himself earlier. There wouldn't have been a flashing light on the machine. She would not have heard the message. Never mind. When did you get home? She lifted her head off the pillow to look at the glowing numbers on the bedside clock. A couple hours ago. How'd you do? He didn't really care. He just wanted her to keep talking to him. All right. Came out a little ahead, but I messed up. I missed a big one. What happened? I went with a long shot when I should have stuck with a sure thing. What do you mean? I was dealt a pair of aces, but I also had four clubs. Ace, three, four, five... So on the draw, I broke the pair of aces. I discarded the ace of hearts and went for the deuce, the two of clubs, to make the straight flush. They keep a progressive bonus pot going for a straight flush. It was up to about $3,000. That's what I was going for. So what happened? I didn't get the deuce. I didn't even get a club to make a flush. What I got was the ace of spades. Damn. Yeah. I threw down an ace only to get an ace. I stayed in with that but didn't come close. Three tens won it. The pot was about three hundred. So if I had kept the ace of hearts, I would have ended up with three aces and been the winner. I blew it. That's when I left. Bosch didn't say anything. He thought about the story and wondered if she was trying to say something else. Tossing the ace of hearts, aiming for the bigger pot, failing. After a few minutes of silence, Eleanor spoke again. Were you out on a case? You hadn't been in the bed, I could tell. Yeah, I got a call out. I thought you weren't up on rotation. It's a long story, and I don't feel like talking about it. I want to talk about us. Tell me what's going on, Eleanor. We can't... This isn't right. Some nights I don't even know where you are, or if you are all right. Something's wrong or missing, and I, I don't know what it is. She turned and moved under the covers until she was next to him. She put her head down on his chest and brought her hand up to caress the scar on his shoulder. Harry. He waited, but she didn't say anything. She moved over on top of him then and started a gentle rocking motion with her hips. Eleanor, we need to talk about this. He felt her finger glide across his lips, telling him not to speak. They made love slowly, Bosch's mind a jumble of conflicting thoughts. He loved her more than he had ever loved anyone. He knew she loved him in some way. Having her in his life had made him feel whole. But at some point he could tell that Eleanor had realized she did not have that feeling. For her there was something missing, and the realization that they were on separate planes brought Bosch down as low as he had ever felt. The feeling of doom had fallen upon the marriage then. During the summer he had caught a series of time-consuming investigations, including a case requiring him to make a week-long trip to New York. While he was gone she went to the poker room at Hollywood Park for the first time. It was out of the boredom of being left alone and the frustration at her lack of success in finding an acceptable job in Los Angeles. She had returned to the cards, doing what she had done when Bosch had found her, and it was at those blue felt tables that she found the thing that was missing. Eleanor, he said, when they were finished making love, his arms wrapped around her neck. I love you. I don't want to lose you. She smothered his mouth with a long kiss and then whispered, Go to sleep, darling. Go to sleep. Stay with me, he said. Don't move away until I'm asleep. I won't. She held him tighter, and he tried for the moment to let everything go. Just for a while, he decided. He would take it all up later. But for now, he would sleep. In a few minutes, he was gone, deep into a dream in which he was riding Angel's flight up the tracks to the top of the hill. As the other car came down and passed, he looked in through the windows and saw Eleanor sitting alone. She wasn't looking back at him. Bosch awoke in a little over an hour. The room was darker as the light from outside was no longer directly on the windows. He looked around and saw Eleanor was gone from the bed. He sat up and called her name, his voice reminding him of how he had answered the phone that morning. I'm here, she called from the living room. Bosch pulled on his clothes and left the bedroom. 
Eleanor was sitting on the couch, wearing the bathrobe he had bought for her at the hotel in Hawaii, where they had gone after getting married in Las Vegas. Hey, he said. I thought, nah, I don't know. You were talking in your sleep. I came out here. What did I say? My name, a few other things that didn't make sense. Something about a fight, angels fighting. He smiled and nodded and sat down in the chair on the other side of the coffee table. Flight, not fight. You ever been on Angel's Flight in downtown? No. It's two train cars. When one goes up the hill, the other goes down. They pass in the middle. I dreamed I was going up and you were in the car going down. We passed in the middle, but you wouldn't look at me. What do you think it means? That we're going different ways? She smiled sadly. I guess it means you're the angel. You were going up. He didn't smile. I have to go back in, he said. This one's going to take up my life for a while, I think. Do you want to talk about it? Why were you called out? He ran the case down for her in about ten minutes. He always liked telling her about his cases. He knew it was a form of ego gratification, but sometimes she made a suggestion that helped, or a comment that let him see something he had missed. It was many years since she had been an FBI agent. It was a part of her life that was a distant memory, but he still respected her investigative logic and skills. Oh, Harry, she said when he was done telling the story. Why is it always you? It's not always me. Seems like it is. What are you going to do? Same as I always do. I'm going to work the case. All of us are. There's a lot there to work with. They just have to give us the time with it. It's not going to be a quick turn. I know you. They'll throw every roadblock they can think of in front of you. It does no one any good to hook somebody up and bring them in on this, but you'll be the one to do it. You'll bring somebody in, no matter if it makes every cop in every division despise you. Every case counts, Eleanor. Every person. I despise people like Elias. He was a sucker fish, making his life off bullshit cases against cops just trying to do their jobs. For the most part, at least. Every now and then he had a legitimate case, I guess. But the, the point is, nobody should get away with what they did. Even if it's a cop who did it, it's not right. I know, Harry. She looked away from him, out through the glass doors and past the deck. The sky was turning red. The lights of the city were coming on. What's your cigarette count? He asked, just to be saying something. I had a couple. You? Still at zero. He had smelled the smoke in her hair earlier. He was glad she hadn't lied. What happened over at Stocks and Bonds? He'd been hesitant about asking. He knew that whatever had happened during the interview had been what sent her to the poker room. Same as the others. They'll call if something comes up. I'll go over and talk to Charlie next time I'm at the station. Stocks and Bonds was a storefront bail bond agency across from the Hollywood station on Wilcox. Wash had heard they were looking for a skip tracer preferably female, because a good portion of the bail jumpers out of Hollywood Station were prostitutes, and a female tracer stood a better chance of running them down. He had gone over and talked to the owner, Charlie Scott, about it, and he had agreed to consider Eleanor for the job. Bosch was honest about her background, both good and bad. Former FBI agent on the plus side, convicted felon being the minus. Scott said he didn't believe the criminal record would be a problem. The position did not require a state private investigator's license, which Eleanor could not qualify for with a record. The problem was that he liked his tracers to be armed, especially a woman, when they went looking for bail jumpers. Bosch didn't share the concern. He knew that most skip tracers were unlicensed to carry weapons, but did so anyway. The true art of the craft, though, was never to get close enough to your quarry to make having or not having a weapon a question. The best tracers located their quarry from a safe distance, and then called the cops in to make the pickup. Don't talk to him, Harry. I think he was just trying to do you a favor, but reality hit him between when he told you to send me in and when I arrived. Just let it go. But you'd be good at that. <laughs> That's beside the point. Bosch stood up. I've got to get ready. He went into the bedroom and stripped off his clothes, took another shower, and then dressed in a fresh suit. Eleanor was in the same position on the couch when he came back out to the living room. I don't know when I'll be back, he said, not looking at her. We've got a lot to do. Plus, the Bureau's coming in tomorrow. The Bureau? Civil rights. The chief made the call. 
He thinks it will keep things calm down south. He hopes. Do you have a name of who's coming over? Not really. There was an assistant sack at the press conference today. What was his name? Gilbert Spencer, but I doubt he'll be involved anymore. Eleanor shook her head. He's after my time. He probably just came for the show. Yeah, he's supposed to send a team over tomorrow morning. Good luck. He looked at her and nodded. I don't have the number yet. If you need me, just use the pager. Okay, Harry. He stood there for a few moments before finally asking her what he wanted to ask all along. Are you going to go back? She looked back out through the doors. I don't know. Maybe. Eleanor, Harry, you have your addiction. I have mine. What's that mean? You know that feeling you get when you pull up on a new case? That little thrill you get when you're back in the hunt? You know what I'm talking about. Well, I don't have that anymore. And the closest thing I've found to it is when I pick those five cards up off the felt and see what I've got. It is hard to explain and even harder to understand, but I feel like I'm alive again then, Harry. We're all junkies. It's just different drugs. I wish I had yours, but I don't. Bush just stared at her a moment. He wasn't sure he could say anything without his voice betraying him. He moved to the door, looking back at her once he had it open. He moved through it, but then stepped back. You break my heart, Eleanor. I always hoped that I could make you feel alive again. Eleanor closed her eyes. She looked as though she might cry. I'm so sorry, Harry, she whispered. I should never have said that. Bosch stepped silently through the door and closed it behind him. Seventeen. Bosch was still feeling emotionally bruised when he got to Howard Elias's office a half hour later. The door was locked, and he knocked. He was about to use the keys to open it when he saw movement behind the glazed glass. Carla and Trenkin opened the door and allowed him in. He could tell by the way she appraised him that she noticed he was wearing a different suit. I got to take a little break, he said. I think we'll be working a good part of the night. Where's Miss Langweiser? We finished and I sent her home. I said I would wait for you. It's only been a few minutes. She led him back to Elias's office and took the seat behind the huge desk. Bosch could see Anthony Quinn through the window, though it was getting dark out. He also saw that there were six file cartons on the floor in front of the desk. Sorry you were waiting, he said. I thought you were going to page me when you were done. I was about to. I was just sitting here thinking. Bosch looked at the boxes. This is the rest? That's it. Those six are more closed cases. These back here are current cases. She rolled her chair back and pointed to the floor behind the desk. Bosch stepped over and looked down. There were two more full boxes. This is mostly Michael Harris stuff. Most of it is the police file and depot transcripts. There are also files on lawsuits that haven't proceeded past the initial claims, and there's a file containing general threats and crank mail. I mean, unrelated specifically to the Harris case. Mostly just anonymous stuff from racist cowards. Okay. What are you not giving me? I'm holding back only one file. It was his working file. It contains notes on strategy in the Harris case. I don't think you should have that. I believe it goes directly to attorney-client privilege. Strategy? Basically, it's a trial map. How I'd like to chart his trials. He once told me he was like a football coach who designs the plays and what order he will call them in before the game even starts. How it always knew exactly where he wanted to go during trial. The trial map showed his strategy, what witness came when, when each piece of evidence was to be introduced, things like that. He had the first few questions for every one of his witnesses already written, and he also had his opening statement outlined and in the file. Okay. I can't give it to you. It was the heart of his case, and I think whoever the attorney is who inherits the case will want to follow the map. It was a brilliant plan. Therefore, the LAPD shouldn't have it. You think he was going to win? Definitely. I take it you don't? Bosch sat down in one of the chairs in front of the desk. Despite having taken the nap, he was still tired and feeling it. I don't know the particulars of the case, he said. All I know is Frankie Sheehan. Harris accused him of some of that stuff, you know, with the plastic bag. And I know that's not Frankie. How can you be sure? I can't, I guess. But we go back. 
Sheehan and I were partners one time. It was a long time ago, but you still know people. I know him. I can't see him doing these things. I can't see him letting anybody else do it either. People change, Bosch nodded. They do, but usually not at the core. The core? Let me tell you a story. One time Frankie and I brought this kid in, a carjacker. His deal was that first he'd steal a car, any shit can off the street. Then he'd go out driving and looking for something nice, something he could take to a chop shop and get a decent amount of bread for. When he saw what he wanted, he'd come up behind and at a stoplight he'd hit the back end. You know, like a little fender bender, not enough to do much damage. Then the owner of the Mercedes or the Porsche or whatever it was would get out the check. The jacker would get out and just jump into the target car and take off. The owner and the stolen shit can were left behind. I remember when carjacking was the big fad. Yeah, some fad. This guy had been doing this about three months and making a good amount of money at it. And one time he hits the back of a Jaguar XJ6 too hard. The little old lady was driving wasn't wearing her seatbelt. She weighs about 90 pounds, and she's thrown into the steering wheel, hits it hard. No airbag. It crushes one lung and sends a rib through the other. She's sitting there, filling up with blood and dying, when this kid comes up, opens the door, and just yanks her out of the car. He leaves her lying on the street and drives off with the Jag. I remember that case. What was that, ten years ago? The media went nuts on it. Yeah, carjack homicide, one of the first ones. And that's where me and Frankie came in. It was a hot case, and we were under pressure. We finally got a line on the kid through a chop shop that burglary auto theft took down in the valley. This kid lived over in Venice, and when we went to pick him up, he saw us coming. Fired a three fifty seven through the front door after Frankie knocked, missed him by an inch. Frankie had longer hair back then. The bullet actually went through his hair. The kid went through the back door, and we chased him through the neighborhood, calling for backup on our handhelds as we ran. The radio calls brought the media out. Helicopters, reporters, everything. You got him, right? I remember. We chased him almost all the way through Oakwood. We finally got him in an abandoned house, a shooting gallery. The hypes went scattering, and he stayed inside. We knew he had the gun, and he'd already taken a shot at us. We could have gone in there and blown his shit away, and there wouldn't have been a question. But Frankie went in first and talked the kid out. It was just him and me and the kid in there. Nobody would have known or questioned what had happened, but Frankie, he, he didn't think like that. He told the kid he knew the lady in the jag was an accident, that he didn't mean to kill anybody. He told him he still had a chance at life. Fifteen minutes earlier, the kid tried to kill Frankie. Now Frankie was trying to save the kid's life. Bosch stopped for a moment, remembering the moments in the abandoned house. The kid finally stepped out of a closet, holding his hands up. He still had the gun in his hand. It would have been so easy and so right. But it was Frankie's call. He was the one who almost took the bullet. But he just went over and took the gun from the kid and cuffed him. End of story. And Trinken considered the story for a long moment before responding. So what you are saying is that because he spared one black man that he could have easily gotten away with killing, then he would not have tried to suffocate another black man nearly a decade later. Bosch shook his head and frowned. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that that was just one of the times I saw Frank Sheehan's core. It was when I knew what he was made of. And that's why I know the harassing is bullshit. He would never have planted evidence on the guy. He would never have pulled a bag over his head. He waited for her to say something, but she didn't. And I never said anything about the carjacker being black. That has nothing to do with it. That's just something you bring to the story yourself. I think it was an obvious part that you left out. Maybe if it had been a white boy in that abandoned house, you would never even have thought about what you could have gotten away with. Bosch stared at her a long moment. No, I don't think so. Well, it's not worth arguing about. You left something else out of the story, didn't you? But A few years later, your buddy Sheehan did use his gun, and he put a bunch of bullets into a black man named Wilbert Dobbs. I remember that case, too. That was a different story in a righteous shoot. Dobbs was a murderer who drew down on Sheehan. He was cleared by the department, the DA, everybody, but not a jury of his peers. That was one of Howard's cases. He sued your friend and he won. It was bullshit. The case went to trial a few months after the Rodney King thing. There was no way a white cop who had shot a black man was going to get a clean verdict in this town back then. Be careful, detective. You're revealing too much of yourself. 
Look, what I said was the truth. Deep down, you know it was the truth. How come the moment the truth might be uncomfortable, people raise the race card? Let's just drop this, Detective Bosch. You have your belief in your friend, and I admire that. I guess we'll see what happens when the lawyer who inherits this case from Howard brings it to trial. Bosch nodded and was thankful for the truce. The accusatory discussion had made him feel uncomfortable. What else have you held back, he asked, to try to move on. That's pretty much it. Spent all day in here to basically hold one file back. She blew her breath out and suddenly seemed very tired. You doing okay? he asked. Fine. I think it was good for me to stay busy. I haven't had much time to think about what has happened. I'm sure I will tonight. Bosch nodded. Any more reporters come around? A couple. I gave them a sound bite and they went on their merry way. They all think the city's going to cut loose over this. What do you think? I think if a cop did this, there's no telling what's going to happen. And if a cop didn't do it, there will be people who just won't believe it. But you already know that. Bosch nodded. One thing you should know about the trial map. What's that? Despite what you said about Frank Sheehan a moment ago, Howard was out to prove Harris innocent. Bosch hiked his shoulders. I thought he already was, in the criminal trial. No, he was found not guilty. There's a difference. Howard was going to prove his innocence by proving who did it. Bosch stared at her a long moment, wondering how he should proceed. Does it say in that trial map who that was? No. Like I said, there was just an outline of the opener. But it's in there. He was going to tell the jury that he would deliver the murderer to them. Those were his words. Deliver the murderer to you. He just didn't write who that was. It would have been a bad opener if he did. It would give it away to the defense and make for an anticlimactic moment later in trial when he revealed who this person was. Bosch was silent as he thought about this. He didn't know how much weight to give what she had told him. Elias was a showman, in and out of court. Revealing a killer in court was Perry Mason stuff. It almost never happened. I'm sorry, but I probably shouldn't have told you that, she said. Why did you? Because if others knew this was his strategy, it could have been a motive. You mean the real killer of that little girl came back to kill Elias? That's a possibility. Bosch nodded. Did you read the depots? he asked. No, not enough time. I'm giving all depositions to you because the defense, in this case the city attorney's office, would have been furnished copies, so I'm not giving you something you wouldn't already have access to. What about the computer? I looked through it very quickly. It appears to be depositions and other information out of the public file, nothing privileged. Okay. Bosch started to get up. He was thinking about how many trips down to the car it would take him to move the files. Oh, uh, one other thing. She reached down to the box on the floor and came up with a manila file. She opened it on the desk, revealing two envelopes. Bosch leaned over the desk to see. This was in the Harris stuff. I don't know what it means. Both envelopes were addressed to Elias at his office. No return addresses. Both were postmarked Hollywood, one mailed five weeks earlier and the other three weeks earlier. There's a single page with a line in each. Nothing that makes sense to me. She started opening one of the envelopes. Uh, Bosch began. She stopped, holding the envelope in her hand. What? I don't know. I was thinking about Prince. <sighs> I already handled these. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, I guess. She finished opening the envelope, unfolded the page on the desk, and turned it so Bosch could read it. There was one typed line at the top of the page. Dot the I, Humbert, Humbert. Humbert, Humbert, Bosch said. It's the name of a character from literature, or what some people consider literature, and Trinkin said. Lolita by Nabokov? Right. Bosch noticed that a notation had been written in pencil at the bottom of the page. Number two, hyphen, three, slash, twelve. That was probably Howard's marking, and Trinkin said. Or someone in his office. She opened the next envelope, the more recently mailed of the two, and unfolded the letter. Bosch leaned over again. Looks to me like they're obviously from the same person, and Trinkin said. Also, notice that innocence is spelled wrong? Right. There was also a pencil notation at the bottom of the page. Number three, hyphen, four slash five. Bosch pulled his briefcase up onto his lap and opened it. 
He took out the evidence envelope that contained the letter Elias had been carrying in his inside suit pocket when gunned down. Elias was carrying this when he... when he got on Angel's flight. I forgot that the crime scene people gave it to me. It might be good if you're here observing when I open it. It's got the same postmark as those two. It was mailed to him Wednesday. This one I want to preserve for prints. He took a pair of rubber gloves out of the cardboard dispenser in his case and put them on. He then carefully removed the letter and opened it. He unfolded a piece of paper similar to the first two. Again, there was one line typed on the page. He knows you know. As Bosch stared at the page, he felt the slight flutter in his heart that he knew came with the surge of adrenaline. Detective Bosch, what does this mean? I don't know, but I sure wish I had opened it sooner. There was no pencil notation on the bottom of the third page. Elias hadn't gotten around to it, apparently. It looks like we're missing one, Bosch said. These are Mark II and three, and this one came after. This one would be four. I know, but I haven't found anything that would be number one. Nothing in the files. Maybe he threw it out, not realizing it meant something until the second one came. Maybe. He thought about the letters for a moment. He was mostly going on instinct and premonition, but he felt the charge sustaining in his blood. He felt he had found his focus. This exhilarated him, but at the same time he also felt a bit foolish at having unknowingly carried such a potentially key piece of the case around in his briefcase now for about twelve hours. Did Howard ever talk to you about this case? he asked. No, we never talked about each other's work, Entrinkin said. We had a rule. You see, we knew that what we were doing was something that wouldn't be understood. The inspector general with one of the department's most vocal and well-known critics. Not to mention him being married and all. Her face turned hard. Look, what is wrong with you? One minute we're getting along fine, and maybe making some progress on this, and the next you just want to antagonize me. What's wrong is that I wish you would say that we knew it was wrong, Sermon, for somebody else. I find it hard to believe you two didn't talk about the LAPD when you were alone up in that apartment. Bosch saw pure fire in her eyes. Well, I don't give a good goddamn what you find hard to believe, detective. Look, we made our deal. I'm not going to tell anyone. If I make trouble for you, you can make trouble for me. If I did tell even my partners, you know what they'd say? They'd say, I was crazy for not treating you as a suspect. That's what I should be doing, but I'm not. I'm flying on pure instinct, and that can be scary. So to make up for it, I'm looking for any edge or piece of luck or help I can get. She was silent a moment before responding. I appreciate what you are doing for me, detective, but I am not lying to you. Howard and I never spoke in detail about his cases or my work with the department. Never in detail. The one thing I remember him saying about the Harris case is so vague as to defy interpretation. But if you must know what it was, I will tell you. He told me to brace myself because he was going to blow the department and a few of the city's big shots out of the water on this one. I didn't ask him what he meant. And why was that? That was Tuesday night. Thank you, Inspector. Bosch got up and walked around a bit. He found himself at the window, staring out at Anthony Quinn in shadows. He looked at his watch and saw it was almost six. He was supposed to rendezvous with Edgar and Ryder at seven at the Hollywood station. You know what this means, don't you? he asked, without turning back to Entrinken. What does it mean? He turned to her. That if Elias was onto something and got close to identifying the killer, the real killer, then it wasn't a cop who put him down. She thought a moment and said, You're only looking at it from one side. What's the other? Say he was about to go to trial and pull the real killer out of his hat, conclusively. That would put the lie to the police evidence, wouldn't it? So proving Harris innocent would at the same time prove the cops framed him. If the real killer knew Howard was on to him, yes, he could have come after him. But say a cop knew that Howard was going to prove that that cop framed Harris, he could have come at him too. Bosch shook his head. It's always the cops with you. Maybe the frame was in place before the cops even showed up. He shook his head again, more emphatically, as if warding off a thought. I don't know what I'm saying. There was no frame. It's too far-fetched. And Trinkin watched him for a long moment. Whatever you say, detective, just never say I didn't warn you. 
Bosch ignored her statement. He looked at the boxes on the floor. For the first time, he noticed a two-wheeled trolley leaning against the wall near the door, and Trenkin followed his eyes to it. I called the security guy and told him we needed to move some boxes. He brought it up. Bosch nodded. I guess I'd better get this stuff to my car. You still have the search warrant, or did Miss Langweiser take it? I need to fill out the receipt. I have it, and I've already cataloged the files. You just need to sign it. Bosch nodded and walked over to the trolley. He remembered something and turned back to her. What about the file we were looking at when you came in this morning, with the photo in it? What about it? It's in the box there. Well, I mean, um, what do you think? I don't know what to think about it. If you're asking me if I believe Howard Elias was involved with that woman, I would say no. We asked his wife today if it was possible he was having an affair, and she said, no, it was not possible. I get your point, but I still think it's impossible. Howard was a well-known man in this city. First of all, he would hardly have to pay for sex. And secondly, he was smart enough to know that he would be vulnerable to extortion from these people if they recognized him. And what was the file doing in his desk? Like I said, I don't know. It had to be part of the case, but I don't know which one. I looked at every file in the office today and didn't find anything that connects to it. Bosch just nodded. His mind was already off the file and back on the mystery letters, the last one in particular. His take on it was that it was a warning to Elias. Someone had discovered that the lawyer was in possession of a dangerous piece of information. Bosch was feeling more certain that the investigation... The true investigation should stem from that note. Do you mind if I put on the television now? And Trenkin said, It's six. I want to watch the news. Bosch came out of his reverie. Sure, turn it on. She moved to a large oak cabinet against the wall opposite the desk and opened the doors. Inside the cabinet were two shelves, each containing a television. Elias apparently liked to watch more than one TV at a time. Probably, Bosch guessed, so he had a better chance of catching all his appearances on newscasts. And Trenkin hit the power on both sets. As the picture came into focus on the top set, Bosch saw a reporter standing in front of a strip shopping center in which three or four stores were ablaze. Several yards behind the reporter, firefighters worked to contain the blaze, but it looked to Bosch as though the buildings were beyond being saved. They were already gutted. What's happening, he said. Not again, and Trenkin said, her voice a scared plea. Eighteen. Bosch turned on KFWB on the car radio while driving into Hollywood. The radio reports were more conservative than the TV news at six. This was because the radio report contained only words, not images. The bottom line news was that there was a fire in a strip mall on Normandy, just a few blocks from the intersection of Florence the intersection that was the flashpoint of the 1992 riots. At that moment, it was the only fire burning in South L.A., and there was not yet any confirmation that the fire was an arson linked to protest or anger over the murder of Howard Elias. But every news channel that Bosch and Trenkin had checked in the office was broadcasting from the mall. Flames filled the screens, and the image projected was clear. Los Angeles was burning once again. Fucking TV, he said. Excuse my language. What about TV? It was Carla and Trenkin. She had talked her way into being taken along for the interview with Harris. Bosch hadn't put up much of a protest. He knew she might help put Harris at ease, if he knew who she was. Bosch knew it was important that Harris be willing to talk to them. He might be the only one to whom Howard Elias had confided the identity of Stacy Kincaid's murderer. Overreacting as usual, Bosch said. One fire, and they're all there showing the flames. You know what that does? That's like throwing gasoline on it. It will spread now. People will see that in their living rooms and go outside to see what is happening. Groups will form, things will be said, and people won't be able to back down from their anger. One thing will lead to another, and we'll have our media-manufactured riot. I give the people a little more credit than that, and Trenkin responded. They know not to trust the TV. Civil unrest occurs when the feelings of overwhelming powerlessness hit critical mass. It has nothing to do with television. It has to do with society not addressing the essential needs of overlooked people. Bosch noted that she called it civil unrest instead of rioting.
He wondered if calling a riot a riot had become politically incorrect. It's about hope, detective, she continued. Most of the people in the minority communities of Los Angeles have no power, have no money, have no voice. They subsist on hope for these things. And Howard Elias was hope for many of them. A symbol of hope for a day when things will be equal, when their voice will be heard. Of a day when they need not fear the police officers in their community. When you take hope away, it leaves a void. Some people fill that up with anger and with violence. To simply blame it on the media is wrong. It's much deeper than that. Bosch nodded. I understand, he said. At least I think I do. But all I'm saying is the media don't help any by exaggerating things. And Trenkin now nodded to his point. Somebody once called the media the merchants of chaos. Yeah, well, they got that right. It was Spiro Agnew, right before he resigned. Bosch had no answer for that and decided to drop the conversation. He got his cell phone out of the charger on the floor between the seats and called his home. There was no answer except for the machine, and he left a message asking Eleanor to call him. He tried not to show outwardly that he was upset. He called information and got the number for the Hollywood Park poker room again. He called the number, asked for Jardine, the security man, and he was transferred through. This is Jardine. This is Detective Bosch from last night. I... She never showed up, pal. At least not on my wa... You can save it, pal. She told me that you and she go back to the Flamingo. I understand what you did, and it's cool. But I know she's back there now, and I want you to give her a message. Tell her to call me on my cell phone as soon as she takes a break. Tell her it's an emergency. You got that, Mr. Jardine? Bosch stressed the word, Mr., so that maybe Jardine would realize he was making a mistake screwing with the LAPD. Yeah, I got it. Good. Bosch clicked off. You know what I remember most about 92? And Trinken said, one image, a photo that was in the Times. The caption was something like, Father and Son Looters. And the picture showed a man leading his four- or five-year-old son out of the smashed-in door of a Kmart or something. And you know what each one was carrying, what they had looted? What? Each one had taken one of those thigh-master things. You know, that ridiculous exercise contraption that some television star from the 80s sold late at night on TV? Boss shook his head at the inanity of her image. They saw it on TV, and so they thought it was valuable, he said. Like Howard Elias. She didn't respond, and he realized he had been out of line, even if he believed there was something valid in what he had said. <sighs> Sorry. They drove in silence for a few minutes before Bosch spoke again. You know what my image is of 92? What? I was assigned to Hollywood Boulevard. And as you know, we weren't really supposed to do anything unless we saw people in danger of physical harm. Essentially, this meant that if the looters were orderly about it, we basically weren't going to stop them. It made no... F anyway, I was on the boulevard, and I remember a lot of weird things. The Scientologists surrounding their building, standing practically shoulder to shoulder and carrying broomsticks, ready to make a stand if needed. The guy who ran the Army surplus store near Highland was in full combat infantry dress and carrying a sniper rifle over his shoulder. He was marching back and forth in front of a store like he was at the gate at Benning. People get crazy. The good and the bad. It's Day of the Locusts. Well, aren't you the well-read detective, Detective Bosch? Not really. I once lived with a woman who taught junior lit at Grant High in the Valley. It was one of the books she taught. I read it then. Anyway, the image that sticks with me from 92 is Fredericks of Hollywood. The lingerie place? Bosch nodded. I pulled up there, and the place was swarming. Multiracial, multi-age, people who had just lost it. They cleaned that place out in about 15 minutes. I mean, everything. When they were done, I walked in there, and there was nothing left. They even sold the mannequins. Absolutely nothing but the hangers left on the floor and the chrome display racks. And the thing is, all it had been was underwear. Four cops get off for beating the shit out of Rodney King on video, and people respond by going nuts and stealing underwear. It was so surreal that that's what comes into my head when people bring up the riots. 
I remember walking around in that empty store. It didn't matter what they took. They were acting out frustrations. It's like the thigh masters. That father and son didn't care what they took. The important thing was that they took something, that in some way they made a statement. They had no use for those things, but by taking them, they were showing the man. That's the lesson the father taught his son. It still doesn't make... Bosch's phone rang, and he opened it. It was Eleanor. You winning? he asked. He said it with a happy inflection, and then immediately realized he had said it in such a way so that his passenger might not surmise what was really going on with his marriage. At once he felt embarrassed and guilty that he would even let what in Trinken thought or interpreted enter into his relationship with Eleanor. Not yet. I just got here. Eleanor, I want you to go home. Harry, we're not going to talk about this now. I... No, I'm not talking about all of that. I think the city... Have you watched the news? No, I've been coming here. Well, it doesn't look good. The media's lighting the match, Eleanor. And if something happens and the city goes, you're not in a good place to be. Bosch took a furtive glance at Entrenken. He knew he was acting out white paranoia in front of her. Hollywood Park was in Inglewood, a primarily black community. He wanted Eleanor back at their home in the hills, where it was safe. Harry, I think you're being paranoid. I'll be fine. Eleanor, why take the... Harry, I have to go. They're holding my chair. I'll call you later. She hung up then, and Bosch said goodbye to a dead line. He dropped the phone onto his lap. For what it's worth, and Trinken said, I think you're being paranoid. That's what she said. I'll tell you right now, there are as many blacks as whites, maybe even more, who don't want to see it happen again. Give them the benefit of the doubt, detective. I guess I don't have a choice. The Hollywood station seemed deserted when Bosch and Entrenken arrived. There were no patrol cars in the rear lot, and when they came through the back door, the rear hallway, usually abuzz with activity, was empty. Bosch stuck his head through the open door of the watch office and saw a lone sergeant at a desk. A television mounted on the wall was on. There were no flames on the screen. It showed a news anchor in a studio. The graphic hanging over his shoulder was a photo of Howard Elias. The volume was too low for Bosch to hear what was being said. How we doing? Bosch said to the sergeant. Hanging in for now. Bosch knocked twice on the door and headed down the hallway to the detective bureau and Trenkin following. Ryder and Edgar were already there. They had rolled the television out of the lieutenant's office and were watching the same news report. They saw Bosch and Entrenken, and the surprise registered on their faces. Bosch introduced Entrenken to Edgar, who had not been in Elias's office that morning. He then asked what the latest news was. The city's holding tight, it looks like, Edgar said. A couple of fires and that's it. Meantime, they're pretty much making Elias into St. Howard. Not much said about what an opportunistic asshole he was. Bosch glanced at Entrenken. She showed nothing. Well, let's turn it off, he said. We have to talk. Bosch brought his partners up to date and showed them the three anonymous notes that had been mailed to Elias. He explained Entrenken's presence and said he wanted to try to get Harris's cooperation and at the same time eliminate him as a potential suspect in the killings. Do we even know where Harris is? Edgar asked. He hasn't shown up on TV that I've seen. Maybe he doesn't even know about Elias. Well, we'll find out. His current address and phone were in Elias's files. Looks like Elias was putting him up, probably trying to keep him out of trouble before the trial. He's close by, if he's home. Bosch got out his notebook and got the phone number. He went to his desk and called it. A man answered. Can I speak to Harry? Bosch said good-naturedly. No, Harry, here, man. The phone was hung up. Well, somebody's home, Bosch said to the others. Let's go. They drove in one car. Harris currently lived in an apartment on Beverly Boulevard near the CBS complex. Elias had put him into a large complex that wasn't luxurious, but was more than nice. And downtown was a straight shot down Beverly. There was a security door, but Harris's name was not on the list of occupants next to the door phone. Bosch had the apartment number, but this did not mean anything. The phone codes following occupants' names did not correspond with apartment numbers for security reasons. Bosch called the code number for the building's manager, but got no answer. 
Look at this, Ryder said. She pointed to a listing for E. Howard. Boss shook his shoulders as if to say it was worth a try and punched in the number. A male voice answered, and Bosch thought it was the same voice that had answered his earlier call from the station. Michael Harris? Who is it? LAPD. We need to ask you some questions. I... No fucking way. Not without my lawyer here, you don't. He hung up. Bosch immediately called back. What the fuck you want? In case you don't know it yet, your lawyer is dead. That's why we are here. Now listen and don't hang up. I have Inspector General Carla and Trenkin here with me. You know who she is? She's going to make sure you are treated well. We just need to... She the watchdog lady? Supposed to tell when the LAPD is running roughshod? That's her. Hold on. Boss stepped to the side and handed the phone to Trenkin. Tell him he's safe. She took the phone, giving Bosch a look that said she now realized why he allowed her to come along. She spoke into the phone while looking at him. Michael... This is Carla and Trenkin. You don't have to worry. No one is here to harm you. We need to ask you about Howard Elias, that is all. If Harris said anything to her, Bosch didn't hear it. The door lock buzzed, and Edgar pulled it open, and Trenkin hung up the phone and they all went in. The guy's a mutt, Edgar said. I don't know why we're treating him like a saint. And Trenkin gave Edgar her look then. Yes, you do, Detective Edgar. Edgar was sufficiently cowed by her tone. When Harris opened the door of his fourth-floor apartment, he was holding a gun at his side. All right, this is my home, he announced. I don't mean to be threatening anybody, but I need this for my personal comfort and protection. Otherwise, you ain't coming in the place, know what I mean? Bosch looked at the others, got no read, and looked back at Harris. He tried to contain his fury. Despite what Entrenkin had told him earlier, he still had little doubt that Harris was the murderer of a child. But he knew that what was important at the moment was the current investigation. He had to put his enmity for the man aside in order to extract whatever information he had. All right, he said, but you keep that weapon low and at your side. He you pointed at one of us, and we're going to have a big problem. We understand each other? Oh, we understand. Harris backed away from the door and let them in by pointing the weapon toward the living room. Remember, keep that thing down, Bosch said sternly. Harris dropped the gun to his side and they all entered. The apartment was furnished with rental stuff. Puffy couch and matching chairs in light blue, cheap full wood tables and shelves. Pastoral prints were on the walls. There was a cabinet with a television in it. The news was on. Have a seat, ladies and gentlemen. Harris took one of the big chairs, slumping in it so that the back rose above his head, giving him the appearance of sitting on a throne. Bosch stepped over and turned the television off, then introduced everybody and showed his badge. Huh. It figured a white man in charge, Harris said. Bosch ignored it. I take it you know that Howard Elias was murdered last night, he asked. Course I know, been sitting here watching it all goddamn day. Then why'd you say you wouldn't talk to us without your lawyer, if you knew your lawyer was dead? I got more than one lawyer, dumb shit. I also got a criminal lawyer, and I got an entertainment lawyer. I got lawyers, don't worry. And I'll get another to take Howie's place. I'm gonna need a man, especially after they start cutting up in South Central. I'm gonna have my own riot, like Rodney. That'll put me on top. Bosch could barely follow Harris's line of thought but he understood enough to know Harris was on a power trip at his own community's expense. Well, let's talk about your late lawyer, Howard Elias. When was the last time you saw him? Last night. But you already know that, right, chap? Till when? Till we walked out the motherfucking door. Are you throwing down on me, man? What? You interrogating me, man? I'm trying to find out who killed Elias. <sighs> you did that. You people got him. Well, that's a possibility. That's what we're trying to find out. Harris laughed as if what Bosch had said was absurd. Yeah, you know that thing they say about the kettle in a pot? That's what that is. We'll see. When did you two part company? You and Howard Elias. When he went to his apartment and I went home. Which was when? I don't know, Chet. Quarter to eleven. Eleven o'clock. I don't wear a watch. People tell me the time when I want to know it. They say on the news he got his ass shot at eleven, so we left quarter of. Had he mentioned any threats? Was he afraid of anyone? He wasn't afraid of shit. 
but he knew he was a dead man. What do you mean? You people is what I mean. He knew you would come gunning for him someday. Somebody finally did. Probably come for me, too, one day. That's why as soon as I get my money, I'm splitting this place. All you cops can have it. And that's all I got to say, Chet. Why do you call me that? Because that's what you are. You're a Chet. Chet. Harris's smile was a challenge. Bosch held his gaze for a moment, then turned to Entrenkin and nodded. She took it from there. Michael, do you know who I am? Sure, I've seen you on the TV. Just like Mr. Elias, I know you. Then you know I am not a police officer. My job is to make sure the police officers in this city are honest and do their jobs the way they should be done. Harris snickered. <laughs> you got a lot of work ahead, you lady. I know that, Michael. But the reason I am here is to tell you that I think these three detectives want to do what is right. They want to find the person who killed Howard Elias, whether it is a cop or not, and I want to help them. You should want to help as well. You owe Howard that much. So will you please answer a few more questions? Harris looked around the room and at the gun in his hand. It was a Smith & Wesson 9mm with a satin finish. Bosch wondered if Harris would have brandished it in front of them if he knew the murder weapon was a 9. Harris shoved the weapon into the crack between the seat cushion and the arm of the big chair. Okay, I guess. But not Chet. I don't talk to white cops or tomboys. You ask me. And Trenkin looked back at Bosch and then back to Harris. Michael, I want the detectives to ask the questions. They are better at it than me. But I think it's okay for you to answer. Harris shook his head. You don't understand, lady. Why should I help these fuckers? These people torture me for no fucking reason. I ain't got 40% of my hearing because of the LAPD. I ain't copperating. Now, if you got a question, then you ask it. Okay, Michael, that's fine, Carla said. Tell me about last night. What did you and Howard work on? We worked on my testimony. Only, you know how the cops call it test lying on account they never tell the damn truth when it comes to the brothers? Well, I call it my testimony, because the LAPD is going to pay my ass for framing me and then fucking with me. Damn right. Bosch picked up the questioning as though Harris had never said he wouldn't speak to him. Did Howard tell you that? Sure did, Mr. Chet. Did he say he could prove it was a frame? Yeah, because he knew who really done the murder of that little white girl and then put her in a lot near my place, and it wasn't me. He was going to court Monday to start to exonerate me completely and get my money, my man Howard. Bosch waited a beat. The next question and answer would be crucial. Who? Who what? Who really did the murder, did he tell you? <laughs> nope. He said I didn't need to know, said it was dangerous to know that shit. But I bet it's there in his files. He ain't gonna get away again. Bosch glanced at Entrenkin. Michael, I spent all day with the files. Yes, there are indications that Howard knew who killed Stacy Kincaid, but no name was recorded anywhere. Are you sure he never told you a name or gave you any indication of who this person was? Harris was momentarily nonplussed. He evidently realized that if Elias went down with the murderer's name kept to himself, his case might have gone down a few notches as well. He would always carry the stigma of being a murderer who got off because a slick defense lawyer knew how to play a jury. God damn, he said. Bosch came over and sat on the corner of the coffee table so that he could be close to Harris. Think hard, he said. You spend a lot of time with him. Who would it be? I don't know. Harris said defensively. Why don't you ask Pelfrey about it, man? Who is Pelfrey? Pelfrey's his leg man, his investigator. You know his whole name? <sighs> I think it's something like Jenks or something. Jenks. Yeah, Jenks, that's what Howard called him. Bosch felt a finger poke his shoulder, and he turned to see and Trenkin give him a look. She knew who Pelfrey was. He could let it go. Bosch stood up and looked down at Harris. You came back here last night after you left Elias? Yeah, sure. Why? Anybody with you? You call anybody? What the fuck is this? You throwing down on me, man. It's routine. Relax. We ask everybody where they've been. Where were you? I was here, man. I was beat. I came home and got in my bed. Ain't nobody with me. Okay. 
Mind if I have a look at your pistola for a second? <laughs> Jesus Christ. I should have known you people weren't on the level. God damn. He pulled a gun out from the side of the chair cushion and handed it to Bosch. Bosch kept his eyes on Harris's until the gun was safely in his hand. He then studied the weapon and smelled the barrel. He smelled no oil or burned gunpowder. He ejected the cartridge and thumbed out the top bullet. It was a Federal, full metal jacket, a very popular brand and make of ammunition, Bosch knew, and possibly the same brand used in the Angels' flight murders. They wouldn't know until the autopsies. He looked back down at Harris. You're a convicted felon, Mr. Harris. You realize it is a crime for you to have this weapon? Not in my house, man. I need protection. Anywhere, I'm afraid. This could send you back to prison. Harris smiled at him. Bosch could see one of his incisors was gold with a star etched on the front. Then take me away, man. He raised his arms, offering his wrist for the handcuffs. Take me away and watch this motherfucking place burn, baby, burn. No. Actually, I was thinking of cutting you a break, seeing how you've been so helpful tonight. But I'm going to have to keep the weapon. I'd be committing a crime if I left it here with you. Be my guest, Chet. I can always get what I need from my car, know what I mean? He said Chet, the way some white people say the word nigger. Sure, I know what you mean. They waited for the elevator in silence. Once they were inside and descending, and Trenkin spoke. Does that gun match? It's the same kind. Ammo might be the same. We'll have the lab check it, but I sort of doubt he would have kept it around if he killed Elias with it. He's not that stupid. What about his car? He said he could get anything from his car. He didn't mean his car car, he meant his crew, his people. Together they're a car, driving somewhere together. It's a saying that comes from county lockup, eight people to a cell. They call them cars. What about Pelfrey, you know him? Jenkins Pelfrey. He's a P.I., an independent. I think he's got an office over in the Union Law Center in downtown. A lot of the civil rights lawyers use him. Howard was using him on this. We have to talk to him, then. Thanks for telling us. There was annoyance in Bosch's voice. He looked at his watch. He figured it was too late to try to run down Pelfrey. Look, it's in the files I gave you, and Trenkin protested. You didn't ask me about it. How was I to know to tell you? You're right. You didn't know. If you want, I could put a call. No, that's okay. We've got it from here, Inspector. Thanks for your help with Harris. We probably wouldn't have gotten up there to see him without you along. You think he had anything to do with the murders? I'm not thinking anything yet. I seriously doubt he's involved. Bosch just looked at her, hoping his eyes conveyed that he believed she was treading into areas where she had neither expertise nor a mandate to be. We'll give you a ride back, he said. You car the Bradbury? She nodded. They were crossing the lobby to the doors. Detective, I want to be kept apprised of the case and any significant developments. Fine. I'll talk to Chief Irving in the morning and see how he wants to do that. He might prefer to keep you informed himself. I don't want the whitewashed version. I want to hear it from you. Whitewashed? You think that whatever I tell you won't be whitewashed? I'm flattered, Inspector. A poor choice of words. But my point being, I would rather hear it from you than after it has been processed by the department's management. Bosch looked at her as he held the door. I remember that. Nineteen. His rider had run the telephone number from the Mistress Regina webpage through the crisscross directory contained on a CD-ROM in the squad room computer. The phone was assigned to an address on North Kings Road in West Hollywood. This did not mean that the address would be where they found the woman, however. Most prostitutes, late-night masseuses, and so-called exotic entertainers used elaborate call-forwarding systems to make it hard for law enforcement agencies to find them. Bosch... Ryder and Edgar pulled to the curb at the intersection of Melrose and King's, and Bosch used his phone to call the number. A woman answered after four rings. Bosch went into his act. Mistress Regina? Yes, who is this? My name is Harry. I was wondering if you were available tonight? Have we had a session before? No. I saw your web page and thought... Thought what? I thought I might want to try a session. How advanced are you? I don't under... What are you into? 
I'm not sure yet. I'd like to try it out. You know there is no sex, right? No physical contact. I play mind games with people. Nothing illegal. I understand. Do you have a secure phone number that I can call you back at? What do you mean, secure? I mean no pay phones. You have to give me a real number. Bosch gave her his cell phone number. Okay, I'll call you back in one minute. Be there. I will. I will ask for three six seven. That is you. You are not a person to me. You do not have a name. You are simply a number. Three six seven. I understand. He closed the phone and looked at his partners. We'll know if it worked in about a minute. You sounded nice and subservient, Harry. Brighter said. Thank you. I try my best. You sounded like a cop to me, Edgar said. We'll see. Bosch turned the car on just to be doing something. Ryder yawned, and then he had to. Then Edgar joined in. The phone rang. It was Mistress Regina. She asked for him by number. You can come to me in one hour. I require a donation of two hundred dollars for a one-hour session, cash only and in advance. Is that understood? Yes. Yes. What? Yes, Mistress Regina. That's very good. Bosch looked over at Ryder, who was in the front passenger seat, and winked. She smiled back at him. Regina gave the address and apartment number. Bosch turned the overhead light on and looked over at Ryder's notes. The address he had just been given was the same one Ryder had, but the apartment number was different. He told Regina he would be there, and they ended the call. It's a go, but not for an hour. She uses a different apartment in the same building. We gonna wait? Edgar asked. Nope, I wanna get home and get some sleep. Bosch turned the car onto King's Road and cruised a half block up until they found the address. It was a small apartment building made of wood and stucco. There was no parking anywhere, so he pulled into a red zone in front of a fire plug and they got out. He didn't really care if Regina had a front apartment and saw the slick pack. They weren't coming to make an arrest. All they wanted was information. Apartments six and seven were in the back of the building anyway. Their doors were side by side. Bosch guessed the woman who called herself Mistress Regina lived in one apartment and worked in the other. They knocked on the work door, and got no answer. Edgar hit the door again, harder, and this time kicked it a couple times as well. Finally, a voice was heard from the other side. What is it? Open up, police. Nothing. Come on, Regina. We need to ask you some questions. That's all. Open the door, or we'll have to break the lock. Then what are you going to do? It was a baseless threat. Bosch knew he had no legal power to do anything if she didn't want to open her door. Finally, Bosch heard the locks turning, and the door opened to reveal the angry face of the woman Bosch recognized from the photo print he had found in Howard Elias's office. What do you want? Let me see some ID. Bosch badged her. Can we come in? Your LAPD. This is West Hollywood, Mister. You're off your turf. She pushed the door closed, but Edgar reached a strong arm up and stopped it. He pushed it all the way back open and stepped in. A mean look on his face. Don't you be closing the door on my face, Mistress Regina. Edgar said her name in a tone that indicated that he was subservient to no one. Regina stepped back to allow him space to enter. Bosch and Ryder followed him in. They stepped into a dimly lit landing with stairs going up and down from it. Bosch looked down the stairs to his left and saw they retreated into complete darkness. The stairs going up led to a lighted room. He moved to them and started up. "Hey, you can't just barge in here like this," Regina said. But the protest was leaving her voice. "You need a warrant." "We don't need anything, Mistress Regina. You invited us in." "I'm Harry. Uh, make that three six seven. We just talked on the phone. Remember?" She followed them up the stairs. Bosch turned and got his first full look at her. She was wearing a sheer black robe over a leather corset and black silk underwear. She wore black stockings and spike-heeled shoes. Her makeup consisted of dark eyeliner and glaring red lipstick. It was a sad caricature of a depressing male fantasy. Been a long time since Halloween, Bosch said. Where are you supposed to be? Regina ignored the question. What are you doing here? We have questions. Sit down. I want to show you a picture. Bosch pointed to a black leather couch, and the woman reluctantly went to it and sat down. 
He put his briefcase down on the coffee table and opened it. He nodded slightly to Edgar and started looking for the photo of Elias. Hey, where's he going? Regina cried. Edgar had moved to another set of stairs that led up to a loft. He's ensuring our safety by making sure you don't have anybody hiding in the closet, Barr said. Now take a look at this picture, please. He slid the photo across the table and she looked at it without touching it. Recognize him? What is this? Do you recognize him? Of course. He a client? Look, I don't have to tell you a fucking thing about... Is he a client? Bosch yelled, silencing her. Edgar came down from the loft and moved across the living room. He glanced into the alcove kitchen, saw nothing that interested him, and went down the stairs to the landing. Bosch then heard his steps on the lower staircase as he descended into the darkness below. No, he isn't a client, okay? Now, will you please leave? If he isn't a client, then how do you recognize him? What are you talking about? Haven't you been watching TV today? Who is he? He's that guy, the, the one that got killed on... Harry? It was Edgar from below. What? I think you ought to come down here a sec. Bosch turned to Ryder and nodded. Take over, Kiss. Talk to her. Bosch went down the steps and made the turn in the landing. There was now a glowing red light emanating from the room below. As he came down, Bosch saw Edgar was wide-eyed. What is it? Check this out. As they crossed the room, Bosch saw that it was a bedroom. One wall was completely mirrored. Against the opposite wall was a raised hospital-style bed with what looked like plastic sheets and restraints buckled across it. Next to it was a chair and a floor lamp with a red bulb in it. Edgar led him into a walk-in closet. Another red bulb glowed from the ceiling. There was nothing hanging on the clothes rods running down either side of the closet, but a naked man stood spread-eagled on one side of the closet, his arms up and wrists handcuffed to the clothing rod. The cuffs were gold-plated and had ornate designs on them. The man was blindfolded and had a red ball gag in his mouth. There were red welts caused by fingernail scratches running down his chest, and between his legs a full liter bottle of coke dangled at the end of a leather strap that was tied in a slipknot around the head of his penis. Jesus, Bosch whispered. I asked him if he needed help and he shook his head no. I think he's her customer. Take the gag out. Bosch pulled the blindfold up on the man's forehead while Edgar pulled out the gag. The man immediately jerked his face to the right and tried to turn away. He moved his arm and tried to use it to block the view of his face, but his cuffed wrist prevented him from hiding. The man was in his mid-thirties, with a good build. It seemed as though he could certainly defend himself against the woman upstairs, if he wanted to. Please, he said in a desperate voice. Leave me alone. I'm fine. Just leave me alone. With the police, Bosch said. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. You think if I needed help, I wouldn't ask for it? I don't need you here. This is completely consensual and non-sexual. Just leave us alone. Harry, Edgar said, I think we ought to just step the fuck back out of here and forget we ever saw this guy. Bosch nodded, and they stepped out of the closet. He looked around the room and saw that the chair had clothes draped over it. He went to them and checked the pockets of the pants. He pulled out the wallet and walked to the floor lamp where he opened it and studied the driver's license in the red glow. He felt Edgar come up behind him and look over his shoulder. Recognize the name? No. Do you? Bosch shook his head and closed the wallet. He walked back and returned it to the pocket of the pants. Ryder and Regina were silent as they came back up the steps. Bosch studied Regina and thought he saw a look of pride and a slight smile on her face. She knew that what they had seen down there had shocked them. He glanced at Ryder and saw that she, too, had registered the looks on their faces. Everything okay? she asked. Everything's fine, he said. What is it? Bosch ignored the question and looked at the other woman. Where are the keys? She put a little pout on her face and reached into her bra. Her hand came out with the tiny cuff key and she held it out to him. Bosch took it and handed it to Edgar. Go down and cut him loose. If he wants to stay after that, that's his business. Harry, he said he... I don't care what he said. I said cut him loose. We aren't going to leave you with some guy in shackles down there. Edgar went down the stairs while Bosch stared at Regina. That's what you get $200 an hour for? Believe me, they get their money's worth. And 
You know, they all come back from war. Hmm. I wonder what it is about men. Maybe you should try me sometime, detective. Might be kind of fun. Bosch stared a long time before breaking away and looking at Ryder. What have you got, kids? Her real name is Virginia Lampley. She says she knows Elias from TV, not as a client. But she says Elias' investigator was here a few weeks ago, asking questions just like us. Pelfrey? What did he ask? A bunch of bullshit, Regina said before Ryder could answer. He wanted to know if I knew anything about that little girl that was murdered last year, the daughter of the Karzar from TV. I told him I didn't know why the hell he was asking me about that. What would I know about it? He tried to get rough, but I got rough right back. I don't let men fuck with me. He left. I think somebody put you on the same wild goose chase he was on. Maybe, Bosch said. There was silence for a moment. Bosch was distracted by what he had seen in the closet. He couldn't think of what else to ask. He's staying. It was Edgar. He came up the stairs and handed the cuff key back to Regina. She took it and made a big production out of returning it to her bra, looking at Bosch all the while. All right, let's go, Bosch said. Are you sure you don't want to stay for a Coke, detective? Virginia Lampley asked, a clever smile on her face. We're going, Bosch said. They went silently down the steps to the door, Bosch the last in line. On the landing, he looked down into the dark room. The glow of the red light was still there, and Bosch could see the faint outline of the man sitting on the chair in the corner of the room. His face was in darkness, but Bosch could tell the man was looking up at him. Don't worry, detective, Regina said from behind him. I'll take good care of him. Bosch turned and looked at her from the door. That smile of hers was back.